to your battle stations. Again. All right, uh, city clerk, let's do roll call. Council member Soria. Council member Carbasi. Council member Arias. Council member Maxwell. Present. Council member Bradfield. Here. Council vice president Esparza. Present. And council president Chavez. Here. We have our invocation today by Pastor DJ Kreiner of St. Rhett's uh, Baptist Church. I think uh, Pastor Kreiner is online, correct? We correct. could queue him up. Pastor, if everybody could please rise. To our council, to our uh, council president, uh, to our mayor, and to our great city, uh, let us look to God in prayer as we start our, our council chamber uh, meeting today. Well, Father, it is another day's journey, and we are glad about it. We are glad to be in the land of the living, which means, Father, that to each of our leaders, that means there's still work for us to do. Uh, in this city that we call Fresno, that you call your city. Our prayer, Father, is that you would give us proper wisdom today. Uh, let those that sit on this diocese, let our mayor, let everyone that's presenting today, not just understand and realize their responsibilities, but to accept them, give them wise counsel, let them exercise good judgment, and allow us to work together and not against each other for the sake of uniting and continuing to unite that vision that you gave to us a long time ago when you established this city that we are one people, that we serve one God, we have one Lord, we have one faith, and we have one work to do, and that is to complete that which was needed to be started. So Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray you're covering over this session today. I pray that at the end of the day, we look back on it, and we are proud of the work that was done with our leaders, but in heaven, you look down on us, and you say, well done, our good and faithful servants. It's in Jesus' name we pray and we lift this up to you now. Amen. Thank you for that, Pastor Kreiner. Thank you, Councilmember Bredefeld. All right, let's go on to approving the agenda. There are a couple of changes. Uh, city clerk, uh, which items have been requested to be removed from the agenda? I have a few changes. I'd like to first announce that for the public, we do have Spanish, Hmong, and Punjabi translators available. I'd also like to make an announcement that the November 18th and December 16th regular city council meeting has been canceled, and the December 9th regular council meeting has been added. The following items have uh, our changes to the agenda. Item 1W, approve the appointments of Crystal Vasquez to the Tower District Specific Plan, should actually be appointed to the District 3 Project Review Committee. The following items are being requested to be pulled from the agenda with no return date. Item 1G, the eighth amendment to the AAR to appropriate four million of health and human services was removed, was requested to be removed from the agenda indefinitely by council member Maxwell. Item 1L, as in Larry, approve the appointment of Lucy to the tower district specific plan is being requested to move to a future date by council member Arias. The following items are being requested to be pulled from the consent calendar and moved to contested consent for further discussion. Item 1B, as in boy, actions relating to emission redu uh, reduction credits is being requested to be pulled from the agenda to contested consent by Council Member Maxwell. Item 1N, as in Nancy, actions pertaining to the 2020 Memorial Justice Assistance Grant Program is being requested to be pulled to the contested consent for further discussion by Council Member Maxwell. And item 1Z, a resolution to approve uh, the amendment to the development code concerning subdivision improvement is being requested to be pulled to the contested consent by Council Member Carbasi. Those are all the changes that I have. All right, uh, Council, do we have any other? Council Member do you have any items? Yes, um, I would like to 
full item one I, mm -hmm. one Y, and one AA. And that's uh, on contested uh, consent, correct? Yes. Okay. All right, I got one I, one Y, and one double A. Council Member Carbasi, did you have any items? Um, I no longer wish to pull item one Z. I think it was a Z as in zebra? Yes, sir. I think it was already pulled by. I, I pulled it. You pulled it. Okay. But, so I no longer wish to pull it. Oh, okay. So we'll put that back on the <laughs> agenda. Thank you. All right. Any more of those? Or they want to put them back on the agenda? All right. Seeing none. Any other items? Council right. President? Yes. Want, for Come the on record, on. I haven't pulled any items. So I think I deserve an award. No, thank you very much. You we, did, we actually. We really appreciate that. You did. So. Good job today, Council Member <laughs> All right, um, is there a motion to approve the agenda as amended? So moved. All right, motion made by Second. Council Member Maxwell, seconded by Council Member Vice President Sparsa. Any opposition? Seeing none, motion carries. All right, let's go on to ceremonial presentations. The first one is a proclamation for Heinz Hospice Week, and the sponsor is Council Member Carbasi. Council Member Carbasi. Thank you, Mr. President. And as the public knows, uh, the chamber is not open to the public, so we are going to be doing this through Zoom. I believe the CEO, Eric Climes, is on the, uh, ah, there he is. I am. <laughs> right. Well, uh, thank you so much for being here today. For 40 years, Heinz Hospice has been really um, a, a jewel for so many families that have had loved ones that unfortunately face a very difficult time and allowing them to have that transition to the next uh, part of their spiritual journey. So if you'd like to tell us a little bit about your background okay. and the organization, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Councilman Kabasi. I, for, um, first of all, appreciate um, your leadership as well as the, um, the City of Fresno's council, um, um, City Council. Um, we've been around now 40 years and um, our organization was began by Nancy and in her home because she was attempting to make a difference for the people that were, uh, that was a need that needed to be served and it wasn't being served. And Nancy's vision um, as a result is, is um, come to fruition and we continue to serve um, the most vulnerable in um, Fresno. So my background is I've been doing this for about 20 years. Um, you know, um, I was impacted by the loss of my grandmother because uh, the services were not available. So um, on the behalf of our board of directors, our founder Nancy, who couldn't be with us today, as well as our staff, uh, we are so honored to receive this proclamation. Again, we serve approximately 400 patients per day. Um, on about pro over 300 are, are in um, Fresno proper. So um, our mission has been to uphold the dignity and ease the suffering of the terminally ill while supporting their loved ones and those who are grieving. And we uh, were committed then and we're committed now to providing those services regardless of anyone's ability to pay. So to that end, we thank the community for their um, continued support. So we're here to make a difference. Um, we'll continue to make a difference. We are looking at every uh, opportunity to expand our services so we can meet the needs of our neighbors. So thank you very much for this proclamation. Thank you, and I wanted to also mention um, that uh, it's also the 20th anniversary of the uh, Angel Babies program, which provides support for the, the babies and families of, uh, that have life-limiting li conditions uh, for preterm and infants diagnosed with those conditions. So um, thank you to Na Nancy Hines. I don't know, is she here today? They're, I think they said that yeah, unfortunately, she could not be here. So, okay. uh, again, I, um, and I wish she could because without her vision, none of this would uh, have ever come to fruition. It's just amazing how one person can make a big difference. Thank you so much for what you do. And if there's anything we can do to continue to help your mission, we're here. No, thank you. Clerk, Appreciate it. Uh, City Clerk, would you please read the proclamation? Yes. Whereas in 40, whereas we recognize in this 40th anniversary year of Heinz Hospice that the vision of Heinz Hospice and Nancy Heinz has led to the advancement of the hospice care field and the idea that medical professionals can provide high quality end of life care 
and support to patients living in a home environment. And whereas the innovation of he Nancy Hines is providing in providing a first of its kind in-home hospice care center with skilled nursing for terminally ill patients in 1981 in Fresno, California and the significant contributions of Heinz Hospice and Nancy Heinz in passing into law California AB 3535, the Congregate Living Health Facility License. The effort not only allowed Heinz Hospice to operate its hospice care home, but also opened the way for other care services throughout the state. And whereas we recognize 2021 as the 20th anniversary of Angel Babies of Heinz Hospice Program, which provides services and support to preterm babies and infants diagnosed with life-limiting con uh, conditions and provides support for grieving families, not only in Merced County, but also throughout Central San Joaquin Valley. And whereas the members of Heinz Hospice Team and Nancy Heinz has been actively leading and educating medical professionals and its patient-centered approach to end-of-life care throughout the state the nation and the inter inter international medical community. Now therefore be it resolved that Mayor Jerry Dyer and the Fresno City Council members do hereby recognize the week of September 6th to be Heinz Hospice Week. Congratulations and please make sure to give our regards and gratitude to Nancy Heinz. Thank you very much. Again, we're so honored. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Member uh, Carbasi. Uh, next up is a proclamation for Mr. Luis Ramentas. Uh, Council Member Arias. Thank you, Council President. You know, we all love our uh, Channel 30 ABC PSAs that support Valley Children's and also um, the blood center causes that we have in our community. And somebody has to produce and edit those PSAs. And today we're going to celebrate Luis's life. Luis is retiring almost after almost 30 years and working in a local Channel 30 ABC station. And although he began in his broadcast career in 1977, you know, managing and screening the calls at Kaino Hotline, he's ending his career on one of the top stations in the Valley in ABC 30. So we want to spend some time recognizing Mr. Luis uh, for his efforts and his tenure and thanking him for the life of work um, in supporting our community in, at ABC 30. Um, with that, Council President, I'd like to turn it over to Luis for a few words before we read his proclamation. Sure. Do we have Mr. Ramentas queued up? Standing by. Uh, hello. Well, this is an amazing honor, and uh, I can't thank uh, the city of Fresno for, for, for doing this for me. I know it was originated by uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Aurora Diaz, and I don't know who else had a hand it. I see Michael Carr, our general manager there, and uh, I know uh, my uh, uh, immediate supervisor, Brandon Ridge, is, may have had something to do with it too. But anyway, I just want to thank everybody for uh, for coming through with this. Oh, oh my, sorry, my phone is ringing. There we go. Sorry. And uh, and it's been fun. I mean, as uh, I told some of my colleagues a, a few days ago at a lunch that. Um, uh, many people know that uh, I have been involved in local theater for a long time, uh, doing many, many plays over the years. And uh, uh, I just wanted to, I, I mentioned to them that my biggest role has been acting like I'm working all these years. Because, uh, I've always told everyone that uh, asks me about what it's like to work in TV. I always say, well, it's really like playing, you know, because... You know, you have the opportunity to create something and and uh, put it together and and see the reaction of people when it when they like it or even when they don't like it, but still you 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 have that opportunity to to create and uh, use your imagination and you got fun toys to play with as well. So uh, it's been fun. It's been like I say, it's been like playing, and uh, I'm glad that. Uh, People really thought I was working all those years. Uh, I, guess, I guess that's my biggest role. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Luis. And we'll hand it off to Mr. Carr if you want to say a few words. Sure. Thank you, Council Member Arias. And thank you to the entire council and Mayor Dyer for taking a few moments to honor uh, Luis for a really remarkable 26-year uh, career. Um, Luis has had a tremendous impact not only here at ABC 30, but throughout the Central Valley. Uh, along with uh, producing, which uh, for those who don't know, really writing, shooting, editing, and, and oftentimes voicing promotional campaigns uh, for local nonprofits uh, and for some of the biggest public service campaigns that have taken place uh, at here at ABC 30, including our Children First 
specials which really um, look to uh, identify some of the biggest issues and challenges facing children uh, in Fresno and across Central California, and then really looking for solutions uh, to, to those issues. Um, Lewis has also been responsible for producing hundreds of the commercials that uh, promote and support uh, local businesses, which as we all know, uh, are critical to building and maintaining a strong economy uh, here in Fresno and across Central California. So um, I'm glad it was easy for Lewis, but it's been some really, really important work that he has uh, done for, for the community uh, over 26 years. And he, he, like he said, he's done it with a smile on his face. He's always been a great employee here at the station, uh, lifts spirits, always has kind of the right thing to say whenever you run into him. So we really are going to miss Lewis. Um, so Lewis, on behalf of everyone here at ABC 30, we just wanna thank you for your dedication and your commitment uh, to our station for 26 years. Thank you very much, Michael. And I, I just want to add something, too, that uh, having been born in Fresno and raised here and, and lived here all my life, which some people may not say that's a positive thing, but I think it is. Uh, this is an amazing honor to be uh, recognized by the city council. And thank you very much. Thank you, Louis. And I'll let you in a little secret. Um, the mayor and the council members are also very good at acting like we're working, but we're actually having fun. So <laughs> it is something that we can appreciate. With that, city clerk, would you read the proclamation? Whereas Luis Ramentez has dig diligently served the broadcast industry since 1977, he began his career screening calls to the Kaino Hotline and a Sunday evening radio show. And whereas Luis joined the KFSN TV team and, and as an ace editor in March 1995, his work has involved shooting, audio work, editing, directing, and producing, all of which have earned him numerous awards, including an Emmy. And whereas Luis has directed and produced various shows such as the 360 Magazine Show, the Idea Factory Show, and the KFSN's award-winning Children's First Program. And whereas Luis spent many years le leaving his impact on Fresno community, his work shines through the, his editing of countless PSAs highlighting the work of Central Valley nonprofits, including Valley Children's Hospital, United Cerebral Palsy Center, uh, Central California, and the Central California Blood Center. And whereas Luis, after devoting many years in the broadcast industry, is retiring from ABC 30 after 26 years of service and uh, as an announcer and director. And whereas we applaud Luis's dedication and wish him well on this occasion of his well-earned retirement. Now therefore, we do hereby recognize September 2021 to be Luis Ramentez Day. All right, congratulations, uh, Mr. Ramentez. You have probably one of the best first names ever. <laughs> so do you. <laughs> Thank you uh, for that and uh, congratulations and enjoy your retirement. All right, Thank next you. up will be our uh, Hunger Action Month and uh, that is sponsored by myself and uh, Mayor and the City Manager. Um, just a few words before we speak to Ms. Capel, I believe she will be speaking on behalf of our organizations. Um, you know, this past year with the pandemic, I think it was all that more evident of just the food insecurity that we have here in the city of Fresno and the Central Valley as a whole. Um, and we really saw all our partners and the city work together to ensure that we had um, food distribution uh, sites located across uh, the areas that, that really were in need. Uh, and one of the most uh, stark visuals that I had last year was when we had our, one of the first food distribution sites in uh, Fresno, Southeast Fresno, we uh, saw cars and vehicles that traditionally do not um, are seen in, in, in food lines. And, and that was something very uh, memorable and it just underlined the need to ensure that we're working with our partnering organizations, all the nonprofits that stepped up um, last year to ensure that our families did not go hungry during the pandemic. Um, the folks that really were supplying them uh, and uh, I know that, you know, Council Member uh, Soria, you were at the forefront of a lot of the food distributions we worked on, Councilmember Arias, and last year when we were on the COVID subcommittee, that was one of the most important and, and priorities that we had in the initial uh, part of the pandemic, just ensuring that our most vulnerable populations were fed, um, uh, children that were not going to school, that were not receiving meals on a daily basis, uh, senior citizens, that we had to put a, a pause 
on the senior hot meal programs. Um, we also made sure that they had a meal uh, to have uh, on a daily basis. And so, you know, one of our biggest partners was the Central California Food Bank that did a really great job. They do an amazing job at leveraging a lot of the dollars that they receive. I think their multiplier uh, effect is for every dollar they receive, it's either, uh, it's either four or, or seven dollars that they can actually uh, secure in, in, in food uh, products. I had an opportunity, I think it was myself, and uh, I think Councilmember Carbasi, you also went out there and toured the new facility that they have. So they've expanded uh, to increase the capacity, obviously to accommodate the need, but I just wanted to thank them and uh, for their partnership. And Mayor, did you want to say a few words uh, on our partners? Just a, uh, just a brief comment, uh, Council President. Uh, I, I do want to thank uh, you know, all of our partners that uh, assisted us during the pandemic, um, and especially um, our uh, Central California Food Bank, uh, for all that they did. Um, you know, that we had people that were standing in food lines for the first time in their life, people who were very, very uh, embarrassed about that, people who had lost work or been laid off. And so uh, being able to, to see that in action uh, was incredible. And being able to partner with them, I want to thank the council for uh, last year for doing um, so quickly what you did to meet that need in our community and utilizing our community-based organizations as uh, well as a food bank to, to meet that need. So I want to thank you, um, Nally, for everything that you guys have done uh, for us. And uh, we do appreciate you. And a small thing that we can do is just to uh, recognize you for for your efforts. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you, Mayor, uh, for that. We do have Ms. Uh, Capos, I believe, uh, online. Uh, City Clerk, we could queue her up. She'd like to say a few words. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, your volume's a little bit low, but we can, we can hear you. Apologies. There we go. Uh, great, okay, so first just want to extend um, the food bank's sincerest thanks in uh, in honoring us this month, uh, which is Hunger Action Month. Hunger Action Month uh, is a campaign that's designed to inspire action and raise awareness of hunger issues in our community. And as um, Council President and, and Mayor Dyer just mentioned, our community has uh, our community has suffered and continues to suffer. And the food bank still sees elevated need um, through many of our member partner sites and our direct distributions. And unfortunately, families are still making impossible choices. They're making impossible choices between purchasing food or paying an emergency medical bill, purchasing food or paying for childcare, or even simple uh, decisions that you and I take for granted, like putting gas in our car to uh, get to work or get to an interview or putting food on their family's table. Um, so we're so, so thankful um, for both council and, and, and Mayor Dyer for uh, using your collective voices to raise awareness on uh, the challenges that uh, our communities face and our hungry families continue to face. Um, food should not be an impossible choice. And unfortunately, it just is for far too many. So thank you again uh, for the proclamation and uh, for using your, your voice and your platform um, and, and your partnership continuing to work with Central California Food Bank so we can um, meet the needs of hungry neighbors uh, in our community. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Caples, and thank you for the work that you guys do. I know not just in, in Fresno, but the Central Valley as a whole, we really appreciate that. And you know, last year was very um, a very stark reminder of how important those uh, that work and those organizations are. So thank you uh, once again. City Clerk, could you read the proclamation? Yes. Whereas hunger and poverty are issues of vital concern in Central California, where one in four struggle people struggle with hunger and one in every three children do not know where their next meal will come from. And whereas the city of Fresno is committed to working with the Central California Food Bank, a member of the Feeding America nationwide network of food banks, in educating people about the role and importance of food banks in addressing hunger and raising awareness of the needs to devote more resources and attention to hunger issues. And whereas more than 350,000 individuals in our community rely on food provided by partnering feeding sites of Central California Food Bank. Now, therefore, we do hereby recognize September 2021 to be Hunger Action Month. 
Thank you, City Clerk, and again, thank you to the organizations that uh, do that great work on a daily basis. With that, let's go on to our next uh, proclamation of Mr. John Lawson Day. Uh, Mayor, I know you had um, some words. Thank you, uh, Council, very, very much. It uh, is my honor uh, today to be able to um, recognize uh, a legend in our community, somebody that's left behind quite a legacy, uh, and that is John Lawson. And uh, he's, uh, I know his family is on the Zoom call today, his wife Gina, and, and we'll ask her to say a few words shortly. Um, but this is an individual that um, was self-made, literally. Uh, someone who dropped out of school at the age of 13 uh, ultimately borrowed a lawnmower, went out and mowed lawns in order to, um, to make a living. Uh, he later went into the United States Army and served our country, uh, came back and began to drive truck, uh, working night and day, uh, saving 30% uh, of every dollar he earned, set it aside so that he could go out and buy his first truck. Well, that first truck led to hundreds of trucks that John Lawson ultimately purchased and um, he became the largest trucking company for crude and oil uh, in the entire state of California, uh, which is quite an accomplishment for an individual who dropped out of school at the age of 13. Uh, I know he later went back. They received an honorary degree from Roosevelt High School, I believe, uh, from Fresno Unified. I know Council uh, Member Arias was, uh, was a part of that, along with Carol Mills, who recently passed away. Um, I was there too, Mayor. And I'm sorry, <laughs> Council President Chavez. Um, but you know, uh, John Lawson uh, is a more than a person who bought hundreds of trucks. Uh, he was an incredible family man. Uh, he was someone who gave um, quietly in this community. And, and I know that to be true uh, because I heard story after story of John Lawson calling someone aside and uh, after hearing about a need that they had and uh, writing a check for $50,000 or $100,000 um, without anyone ever knowing, without any fanfare. And that, uh, that was John Lawson. Um, John uh, ultimately fell ill um, and passed away on August 24th. He spent uh, a long period of time at uh, Community Hospital and they took care of him very, very well. I had the opportunity to go visit with them um, several times, and I got to see the soft side of John Lawson, uh, to be able to read scripture with him, pray with him, to lead him to the Lord. Um, and uh, as, I, as I know, uh, Supervisor Nathan Maxick uh, spent many, many hours with them at the hospital as well. And I got to see the soft side of John Lawson. And so um, John Lawson is uh, going to be uh, deeply missed. Uh, he'll never be forgotten in our community. And, um, and it's my honor, uh, along with this council, to be able to declare today John Robert Lawson Day in the city of Fresno. And um, with that, I know uh, Councilmember Carbasi would like to say a few words as well, and then we'll have uh, um, Gina say a few words, and then we'll have a proclamation, or any other council members would like to speak. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. That was a very perfect uh, tribute to Mr. Lawson. So John Lawson uh, was a business owner in District 2, as well as a resident. and. I had the pleasure of meeting him walking door to door. And when I say pleasure, I think Gina will remember this experience. <laughs> he, uh, what I learned uh, meeting him is he has a very tough exterior, but he has a big heart. I, it's one of those experiences, the, one of the top 10 experiences walking door to door I remember because he gave me the time to actually speak to me. He just came home from work. And if, if you know Mr. Lawson, his, his uh, SUV is always full of dirt because he's working all the time out there. And um, it's one of those where he'll keep you on your toes and he'll keep you accountable and he asks tough questions. And that's, that's actually what, what people in elected office need the most. But I've also heard so many stories. I was just talking to um, someone the other day. He was a big supporter, uh, as well as Gina, of Operation Gobble, for example, which fed so many folks and so many more that the mayor has mentioned. So Gina, uh, you know, I, I offer you my condolences. Um, if there's anything you need, of course, the mayor and I are here as, as your council member and mayor. And um, thank you so much for taking care of him and everything you did. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councilmember Carbasi, and um, I'll, I'll, I just want to express my condolences to the Lawson family. Um, I, I was actually the board president when we granted Mr. Lawson that honorary um, high school diploma, and I remember meeting him out in the lobby, and, and, and you're right, Mayor, he did a lot of philanthropic uh, work very quietly uh, for kids, for families, and our community. And, and I remember the story behind how that came about, and I'm gonna probably out, oust him, but um, that's okay. That, that came about with my former colleague, um, uh, former trustee, uh, Brooke Ashton, that approached uh, myself and the board about doing that, and he talked about how he, you know, his, everything you described, Mayor, his, his own you know, work ethic and what he brought to this city and what he instilled in others that he mentored. And if you ever went out to his warehouse and saw what he collected, um, that was actually quite a sight to see um, out there. And, and so, you know, that was a, a very uh, a powerful moment uh, because you saw the, the community come out and support him. I don't think I've ever seen uh, that many uh, folks come out for an honorary um, high school diploma. Uh, and, and we were very uh, lucky to have him in, in our city, and he was not shy about telling you what he thought about certain things, whether it was politics or, or business. Uh, the conversations I had with him, I was, I was reminded of that, um, uh, but he always did it in a very uh, tactful way, and, and you know where he was, where he was coming from. Um, and so with that, Mayor, did you want the family to, to say a few words? Yeah, I uh, was just notified that uh, Gina was not online, unfortunately, couldn't uh, get on, but we are definitely going to get a video of this and make sure that the family receives it. So um, with that, uh, Clerk, if you'd read the proclamation. Okay. Whereas local business owner, entrepreneur, car collector, and rags to riches success story, John Robert Lawson passed away August 24, 2021 at the age of 81. And whereas Lawson dropped out of school mowing lawns, delivering newspapers, and pumping gas before serving and being honorably discharged from the U.S. Army, only to decades later earn an honorary high school diploma from Fresno Unified and become a career technical educational proponent. And whereas through hard work and dedication, Lawson eventually brought his own commercial truck and grew that into Lawson's Rock and Oil, Inc and a Fresno-based trucking empire with hundreds of trucks and employees that evolved into California's largest hauler. And whereas Lawson served the state of California as a commissioner of the California Transportation Commission and the County of Fresno on the County of Fresno Planning Commission. And whereas Lawson was a man of his word and to whom a handshake was, a bind was as binding as any contract ever written and who dealt with people fairly and honestly. And whereas while working hard to run his company, Lawson found time to collect cars as well as rebuilding the, a 1932 Ford hot rod, which he exhibited at car shows around the country. And whereas Lawson's dedicated his life to his family, friends, county, and God. Now therefore be it resolved that we, Mayor Jerry Dyer and members of the Fresno City Council do hereby proclaim Thursday, September 2nd to be John Robert Lawson's day. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Council. Mayor, uh, for that. Uh, thank you, City Clerk. We will now go on to Council Member reports and comments. Uh, and we'll start like we always start, numerically ordered. Council, oh, Council Member Carbasi? I'm sorry, this may have been mentioned. Can we adjourn in memory today for Mr. Lawson? Sure, absolutely. City thank you. Clerk, can we enter that into the record, please? All right, with that, uh, Council Member Soria, you're up first. Thank you, Council President. Um, just a couple short comments. Um, one, I just want to thank folks who came out to the Echo Weldon Crosswalk Art um, event this past Saturday. Um, our office partnered again with Fresno Arts Council to repaint the crosswalk art. Um, if you haven't had a chance to visit the Fresno High neighborhood in that corner, I'd encourage you guys to go check it out. Uh, it looks great. So I want to thank all our volunteers um, and the local artists for coming out and beautifying that Fresno High neighborhood. Um, then I just want to say kudos and, um, sh um, and thanks to city staff for helping us um, finally get to turn on the traffic signal at Shields and Harrison. Um, I know that um, Daly Elementary's uh, principal and the staff there and the parents had been requesting for this to happen for many years. So I think since like 2015 or 2016, the request. So it's taken about five years. I just want to 
remind folks how long some of these projects take to make happen, but we are very grateful and we know that it is gonna increase safety in that neighborhood as um, children are being dropped off or picked up, picked up after school. So thank you again um, for the work to make sure that that happened and then also for the council support on getting that done. Thank you. All right, does that conclude your comments? All right, thank you Council Member Soria. Council Member Carbasi. Briefly, I just wanted to thank uh, Public Works. We have city crews out there in District 2 right now um, installing some sidewalks in an area that's highly in need, um, replacing gravel with actual concrete sidewalks. Thank you for that. Um, also, I want to share some good news. I just got a text from Deputy Chief Reed, and we have our chief here today. Thank you again for continuing to be very active against the illegal racing, the, the excessive speeding. There is a popular video on Facebook about someone at a major intersection in Fresno doing donuts, uh, and this is recent, and this is during the day, and they have found that person. And it's really difficult to do that from a video, but the fact that I can go to you and say I have this problem and there's follow through and I can go to the residents and say, oh, they actually follow through, that's the kind of service that I'm used to with your department that you always deliver, and I think that's what wins the hearts of the people of the city. Thank you so much for your service. Thank you, Council Member Carbasi. Uh, Council Member Arias, perfect timing. Thank you, Council Member. Just a couple of thank yous to the Mayor's Office and Manager for helping us finally get some of those Motel Drive billboards down. Now that those billboards, those motels are no longer going to be, you know, motels, there's no need to advertise them from the freeway, and that's going to allow us to maybe put up a digital billboard someday and generate revenue for some of those organizations that help our homeless community. Um, thank you also for the meeting with staff on the garbage compactors. One day before I leave, we'll have a commercial compactor somewhere so we can demonstrate that we can act like a big city and not have garbage, you know, taken out after we put it back in. Um, also, thank you for the work on the West Fresno Park. Just got notice that we officially got the final documents to close escrow. So we're moving forward with that 10-acre park in West Fresno. And um, a quick update for the community. We did meet with uh, some of the um, partners on the West Creek Village project. Um, they indicate that they're looking for winter of 22 to start with the single family construction, commercial and retail in that area. It also happens to align with the time that will be in the construction phase of that West Fresno Park. So there's some progress being made. And lastly, on the West Fresno items, appreciate the mayor and everybody's time the last couple of days on trying to, you know, get to some mutual agreement that works for everyone. I think we're all clear. We want to make sure we reduce emissions, reduce intensification and use of some of these industrial operations that um, have been placed in South Fresno, while also making sure that the community is involved and that those jobs that are represented there continue to operate, um, especially as we all try to transition to electrification and a cleaner burning, um, a cleaner footprint for the community. And then lastly, Council, just want to point out a couple of things. Um, sorry, we have an item on the agenda today uh, for closed session, um, and we have been meeting as a COVID committee every Monday to try and get ahead of the latest spike in infections. Um, but a couple of things that I've uh, been reflecting on. One, since last year's peak of infections, we as a city have been asked to rely on self-responsibility, that people are going to be careful that they're going to get vaccinated and we've been asked to keep the economy open and you know rely on people being um, responsible after that experiment for several months now we've had record COVID cases ambulance have stopped taking to the hospital we're transporting ICU patients to LA and we just stopped selective surgeries in Fresno in short counsel that's rationing of the healthcare system. The one thing that the critics of Obamacare were so worried about is now taking place in Fresno. And we're rationing healthcare services because we broke the healthcare system. Relying on people's uh, better judgment and volunteerism to uh, follow basic healthcare uh, has not worked. And primarily because the variant is much more different than what led to the peak infections last year. This variant spreads faster, 
is more damaging, and it's a lot of younger people in the healthcare system. You know, recently my son had a, a bee sting. He's allergic. In a normal you know, time, that would be a hospital visit. This time is get home and see if an EpiPen works. And it led to being him, him being home for a few days because the infection, it, it re resulted in an infection. It's these kind of decisions that we are now seeing folks who haven't done what they're supposed to take up beds that would otherwise be needed by somebody in a car accident or somebody with you know, allergic reaction that they don't have any control over. So far as a city, in this peak infection, we responded with a plea for people to be vaccinated with mandatory testing for those who choose not to get vaccinated and by limiting the public access to council meetings, which all of which continues to put our essential workers at risk. It's time for us to pursue mandating vaccines to all our employees. If not, we're gonna have to consider other alternatives that might be just as uncomfortable. The city is taking on millions of dollars of liability for COVID healthcare cost of employees. I'm sure a lot of those are folks who chose not to be vaccinated. While we're in the process of negotiating potential raises for all our employees, this city will have to make a decision. Do we have enough for raises given the escalating cost of healthcare with the pandemic or do we not? And Mayor, I know this is not an easy conversation for us to have. I know we've all were hoping that people would willingly do the right thing, that we could all control the spread, that mandating testing and making it inconvenient not to be vaccinated would be sufficient. But we collectively have broken the healthcare system already and it hasn't worked. And if we don't have a serious conversation about mandating vaccines for essential workers, there's only so much money that we have and we're gonna have to evaluate how we address the financial liability to taxpayers from these escalating COVID healthcare costs that the city is absorbing on a daily basis. So it's, I'm being fully transparent up front that I'm willing to have that conversation. I'm willing to bring an item for the council to vote on it. But I'm also very, being very thoughtful that the mayor and the committee meet every week to evaluate every single option. Uh, but I think that the time for discussion and debate is over. Um, and unless we want to see the permanent, you know, uh, the complete destruction of the healthcare system, we need to do something. And it's not political, it's just practical. Uh, when we got to a point of transporting ICU patients to LA, that should have been sufficient for most people in this city to say that we got to do something. I don't think anybody wants to relocate to LA for a couple weeks if a, a loved one is in a car accident. That shouldn't be where we're at, but unfortunately we are. We know that we have limited healthcare staff. We know that they're exhausted. We know that the federal government is not gonna come in and save us like they did last time with hundreds of new healthcare workers. That option isn't there. And we see the escalating cases every day. So um, we'll continue to have these conversations um, with the administration. Uh, but I do want it to be very upfront with our employees and with the public that the time for discussion and debate is coming to an end and we need to make decisions because simply relying on people's um, willingness to do what we think is practical and reasonable, which is to get vaccinated, um, ha hasn't worked so far and the healthcare system is collapsing um, right under our noses. Thank you all. Thank you, Councilmember Arias. Councilmember Maxwell. Thank you, Council President. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'll keep my remarks brief. Um, wanted to extend my gratitude again to the administration and Mayor Dyer for uh, working with our office to do a cleanup around the Fresno State area. I believe we picked up 112 bags of trash, which came out to about 800, 800 pounds of trash total. So we know that's a neighborhood that's prone to a lot of dumping and littering, and so we appreciate your willingness to work with our office, Mayor, to, to clean that neighborhood up. And, and speaking of Fresno State, I do want to give a huge congratulations and shout out to our Fresno State Bulldogs. 
I'll be the first to admit I don't know anything about football, but I know a 45-0 win is a hell of a success and a hell of an opening game. So congratulations to our Bulldogs. I also want to just lastly announce today my office is going to be launching our council member for a day contest. Um, this will be available for all elementary school students in District 4 to have the opportunity opportunity to be the District 4 council member for a day. I realize one of the things I lack is a District 4 flag, so I'm going to have the kids design a District 4 flag, and the winner of that will have the opportunity to come to City Hall, talk to folks, sit on the dais, and have lunch with the District 4 team. So we'll be launching that information later on, but really excited to get the kids involved in that project as they get back to school. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Maxwell. Councilmember Bredefeld. Yes, uh, um, I didn't have anything in particular, but uh, I do want to respond to Councilmember Morris. First of all, I, I appreciate Councilmember Morris because you say what you believe, and, and I appreciate that. But uh, what I heard you say is, is quite concerning to me. Uh, basically, I've heard you say that the time for discussion and debate has come to an end. Uh, we relied on people's judgment uh, and that has not worked, meaning they haven't done what we wanted them to do. People, and you said, people haven't done what they're supposed to do. We wanted them to do the right thing. They didn't do it. So uh, what we're talking about is mandated vaccines or pursue other options. I don't know what those other options are, but it sounds pretty ominous. Uh, we have gone from you know no mass to mass to two mass. To get a vaccine, you don't need a mask. To get a vaccine, you need a mask. To vaccines, you're fully protected. To vaccines, you're not fully protected and you can spread the disease. We've gone from lockdowns uh, for 14 days to stop the spread to lockdowns for six, seven, eight months to kicking kids out of school, to watching kids' uh, suicide rates spike, to kids who are being abused not being detected because they're not in school, to them falling back behind uh, in school to their emotional and social development uh, stopping because they're not in school with, with their peers, uh, to finally them being put in school, to wearing masks, to some scientists saying and proving that the masks don't really prevent the spread. Um, so that's government. Government and their infinite judgment and brilliance. And so now what I'm hearing being said is, you know, we've given you time to do what we wanted you to do. We tried to bribe you with lotteries and uh, money. You haven't done what we told you to do. So government is going to come in and tell you exactly what you're going to do, and you're going to do it the way we tell you to do it. Well, I could tell you for me, government isn't going to tell me what to do, and your judgment for me is not going to determine my own better judgment. Same for other people who have made decisions about their children and whether or not they want to be vaxxed or not vaxxed. Now, if you say that, people say you're an anti-vaxxer. I'm not an anti-vaxxer. I got the vaccine. I made my personal decision to get it. But I don't think people should ever be forced to take vaccines or not take vaccines. It's a personal decision. And I can tell you, it feels very threatening hearing those words that we have given you the time to do what we wanted you to do, and you didn't do it. So now we're going to come after you. Well, bring it on, because you're not going to do it to me. And I know for my constituents who feel this way, you're not going to do it to them. And I hope we're not going to go back to the days of stupidity where we locked down businesses, attempted to close churches unconstitutionally as we knew, and now they've won lawsuits, or throw kids out of school. And my fear uh, is that as a result of the fact that there's a potential recall election, we're not back into the stupid four-color coded tier system that we all had to adhere to before because we would be in the purple tier system now, which means restaurants would be shut down, businesses would be shut down, kids would be out of school. And the only reason why Newsom isn't doing that because there's a threat of a recall, which shows that the four colored coded tier system was all about politics. So I want people to hear what you just heard. It was said calmly, it was said very rationally, but what was said, you haven't done what we told you to do. And if you don't do what we tell you to do, we're going to come after you, and you're going to do what we tell you to do. And I would just say, you're not going to tell me what to do, and you're not going to tell my constituents what to do, uh, no matter how nice you say it. Uh, but a threat is a threat. And that was a threat, and I think people need to hear it for what it is. And 16 months ago, this council locked people out of work, threw them out of work, 
happened to Club One. We'll talk about that later, 300 employees. And we're not going back to that. At least I'm going to fight against that. And I would hope people on this council will have learned from their prior mistakes about supporting lockdowns and how they don't work and see throughout the country how they don't work and not go down that road again. Thank you. Vice President uh, Sparza. Yeah, I don't have too much uh, this morning. Uh, I did want to uh, congratulate our District 7 resident, uh, Mary Haskin. Uh, she was our Woman of the Year uh, early on in, in the year uh, and is now heading up the uh, citywide Neighborhood Watch Association. So uh, looking forward to uh, the association under her leadership and her working with uh, PD. Um, and just very proud to have someone from District 7 uh, heading up uh, that association. All right, thank you, Vice President Esparza. Um, I'll, I'll keep my remarks uh, short, and, and I just want to, you know, commend my, both my colleagues, Councilmember Bedefield and Councilmember Arias. Um, we're 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 getting to that point where we do have to have that conversation, and I have right here in front of me the case breakdown month by month from when this pandemic started in March 2020 to now. Um, from a low number of March 2020, where we started with 68 cases, April 2024, 96, progress up to a peak of that god awful time period during this past winter, where we peaked at 26,832 for the month of December, 23,000 uh, approximately for the month of January, and then climbed down. The numbers, this is the data, and what the data shows us, August of this, uh, of this year, uh, last month, the summary is 11,228 cases in Fresno County. And so I, I give that number to paint the picture of, obviously the cases are surging. I personally believe that we are going to um, really uh, see some more, um, whether you want to describe it as rationing healthcare or limiting, um, I think that is very real. Um, but I just want to be fully transparent with our employees too. Um, I, I, I personally don't believe we're there yet where we need to mandate uh, vaccines. Um, I think we do need to let the data speak for itself. Um, we do have a plan in place. Um, there was a joint statement made by, uh, and this was the first time that that happened, by the county, the city, the hospitals, uh, the business community, and really trying to get an area where we do have consensus. Uh, we know we do have consensus in certain areas. Um, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We went through this last year, very difficult uh, moment in the city's history, but we do have now templates that we are going to be implementing. Businesses are ready to go. They know what the safeguards will be, uh, whether it's you know plexiglass, hand sanitizer, mask, um, the capacity uh, of their uh, facilities, which by the way, um, businesses are already operating at a reduced capacity because they can't find enough employees. Number ranges anywhere from 60% to 70%. So they're already uh, in that space um, of, of really implementing these safeguards uh, be, for other uh, reasons. Uh, but I just want the community to know that, you know, one of the things we don't want to uh, cause is, is a panic. We want to make sure that they know that the city of Fresno, the county of Fresno has a plan. Uh, it might not be 100% of what Council Member Bredefeld wants or what Council Member Arias wants or what I want or the mayor wants. But I hope we can keep the conversation focused on the purpose, which is to essentially save lives, um, not overwhelm the medical system. Um, and those numbers that we see now, um, obviously, and this is the public has a right to know, uh, the numbers are not what they were in December. Uh, they're about half, a little bit less than half. However, we do have a big problem here in the Central Valley where we don't have the healthcare capacity that other parts of the state do. We don't have the medical personnel. We were very uh, fortunate to have gotten that support from the federal and the state. Uh, I believe we are getting some resources uh, here shortly, but we are going to be monitoring that uh, ICU bed capacity. Uh, I believe, uh, I think uh, 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 Mr. Barfield, Assistant City Manager, I, do we know what the number of ICU beds are as of this morning? Uh, that we have uh, available in, in Fresno County? Well, uh, the number's just updated, and we are looking at eight ICU beds in the county. 
So we have eight, eight ICU beds uh, in the county. And, and, and we've always said that that's a number that we were going to monitor very yes, closely sir. on yes. that. So, so thank you for that. But again, um, I just wanted to kind of bring the conversation back. I know there are going to be a lot of different debates and uh, areas that we're going to be discussing. Um, I think there's consensus here on the number one priority, which is essentially saving lives. Um, the, the last thing I'll say about that is, and this was through the learning process that we went through last year, um, we literally did not have an answer other than safeguards last year. Put on a mask uh, that some people disagree with, use hand sanitizer, social distance, uh, don't go to mass gatherings. The fundamental difference that we have now that we did not have back then is we have a vaccine. And based on the data that we see from our local hospitals, the vast majority of people in the hospitals right now are not vaccinated. That's just the fact. That's just what the data tells us. So we know the vaccine is effective. Um, I'm strongly recommending and urging people to get vaccinated. Uh, that is the number one tool that we have. Um, it is obviously your personal decision, um, and I hate to phrase it th that way, but there is a little bit of Darwinism going on, where if we have a solution, if we have a tool, you make the conscious decision of not utilizing that, then there are obviously uh, consequences. And I say that as somebody who has sadly attended uh, funerals in the last couple of weeks of folks that should not be gone, uh, but are gone. And so again, uh, there'll be a lot of conversation, uh, a lot of space for debate, but let's keep it focused on the goal, and that is to, uh, to save lives. Uh, Mayor, do you have any uh, comments or reports? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Council President. Uh, I wanted to um, just add a couple things on, on COVID, and I appreciate the, the dialogue, and I think it's that same dialogue that's happening all over the country. Uh, you mandate vaccines, not mandate vaccines, masks, not mask. Um, but you know what we do know, uh, based on conversations I've had as uh, recently as yesterday, is that the vaccine has been very, very helpful. Uh, it um, is the, the very thing that is, has kept our hospitals from completely uh, being overrun. Uh, but I did meet with a number of personnel yesterday, uh, as well as the day before, from uh, CRMC, um, as well as community and um, Valley Children's, uh, Dan Lynch from the county, Dr. Bora, uh, a number of folks just trying to get that, all the information in as much as we can. And what we do know is that our hospitals are overrun. Uh, they are at capacity. We do have eight ICU beds available. Um, and it's really not the beds this time as it was uh, before. We, uh, we just lack staffing. Oh, the Department of Defense uh, came to the rescue last year. Department of Defense uh, is not doing that this year. Uh, we have, uh, the medical profession has made requests for traveling nurses. I will tell you what's happening. It's not the shortage of doctors necessarily, it's a shortage of, of, of RNs uh, and medical assistants that we are challenged with. Uh, and quite frankly, uh, as I've been told, uh, that they're in high demand, so sometimes they go to different areas that ultimately end up paying more. Uh, we did, uh, our hospital personnel did reach out to a traveling uh, nursing agency in uh, Chicago. Uh, those folks are en route, some of them have arrived, many more will be arriving early next week. I don't know what the total numbers are, but we needed about 200, uh, and hopefully we can uh, meet half of that. Uh, I can tell you that 87% uh, as of yesterday of the people who were in the hospital uh, are unvaccinated, uh, that are COVID positive. And um, the, the disturbing trend is 55% of those that are under age 50 occupy our ICU bed. So a much different story than it was last year at this time when we saw the, the, our uh, senior population uh, who was in our hospitals and dying. Um, the good news in Fresno County, 87.5% of those 65 years of age and older have been vaccinated with at least one dose. And uh, I know that is uh, certainly what's, uh, what's helping. Uh, in Fresno County, 62.3% um, of those who are eligible to be vaccinated, uh, that is those are um, over the age, 12 and years of age and older. Uh, have been vaccinated in Fresno, 62% 60, of the eligible. And um, overall population, 51.3% uh, have been um, 
vaccinated. The good news is I think what we've seen over the last four weeks is a steady progression of people that are choosing to be vaccinated. It went from in one week 10,000, uh, then it went up to uh, 12, then 16, and then this last week um, we ended up with over 18,000, 18,385 vaccine doses administered in Fresno County. So we know that number is steadily increasing. Not fast enough, uh, but it is increasing. And uh, the, as you know, we are moving forward with um, either be vaccinated here as a city employee or be tested. Uh, that plan uh, was uh, going to start on the 6th, now it's the 13th, and, uh, or the 7th, and it's been moved back one week because of logistics. And, but I do look forward to having that conversation in closed session today regarding that. And uh, we, we do have some really good numbers that we'll share today in terms of our employees that we uh, now know have been vaccinated because we've been able to um, refine those, those numbers. And I think, you know, yesterday, uh, last night, uh, the city manager and I sent out a uh, email to all of our department personnel regarding the wearing of masks, uh, whether you're vaccinated or not vaccinated, if you're in uh, close proximity. Uh, and I think that is a wise thing to do. And by the way, it's the same thing that the county of Fresno is also doing with their employees uh, within their, their uh, government. So um, that's really the update I wanted to give on that. And, uh, and I look forward to the discussion that we're going to have later on today. Uh, on the positive side, I was able to uh, attend the graduation for the Fresno Fire Department uh, this last Friday. We uh, graduated 19 new fire recruits. Uh, that's uh, going to fill the existing vacancies that we have. And then, as you know, we're moving forward with the hiring of additional 42 firefighters once the uh, SAFER grant is awarded. So there'll be uh, two more drill schools uh, that will be occurring this year. Also had the opportunity to go out to um, Gazebo Gardens in D6. And uh, it is a, uh, it's, it's a <laughs> Shenzhen Garden. What did I say? What did I say, Gazebo? I actually went to Gazebo last week, too, and spoke. <laughs> nice save. Nice save. I'm all about the gardens, man. <laughs> Measure P in the gardens. One Fresno. <laughs> One Fresno, man. So uh, I, I went out to uh, Shenzhen Garden, and I just wanted to uh, share a few thoughts about that. What an incredible uh, gym that we have right in our community. And I wanted to encourage more and more people to take advantage of uh, Shenzhen. It is uh, absolutely gorgeous and uh, spent about an hour and a half there with the folks. So. Uh, and then as uh, Councilmember Maxwell uh, spoke of earlier, we had the clean of Fresno State uh, Saturday morning. I went out there and, and spoke to the folks, had uh, about 100 plus people there who participated and uh, unfortunately no shortage of trash in the area, uh, but appreciate the partnership with that uh, Tyler on, uh, on that cleanup. So, and thank you, go dogs. All right, thank you, Mayor. Uh, we will now go on to City Manager. Uh, any reports, comments? Yes, thank you. Uh, just a few things, just updating everyone on the tray memos we've issued this uh, since the last break. Um, we gave uh, Council an update on the affordable housing applications we received for our most m recent uh, notice of funding availability, so to get everybody a sense of what the projects are that have been applied for. Uh, we wanted to get an, a, a tray memo out to the council on our vehicle parts and acquisition delay. Just everything is two, three, four times in the in the just market is just difficult for getting vehicle and parts. But we wanted to get an update on that. We also provided some information on the promotions and staff movement within the police department. Just some adjustments that uh, the chief has been making. Um, we also provided a preliminary site selection assessment for the senior activity centers. Uh, that was something we had uh, initiated in some discussions with uh, D7. Uh, Council Vice President Esparza, so we got that out to everybody to kind of get a sense of what that might look like in those, those sites we evaluated. Um, and then we provided our last night our, our recommendations on the PLA. We'll talk about that later. Um, final thing, a couple of things I wanted to thank you, Council President um, Arias, for talking about the signs being removed. And I want to do the shout out is really to the Housing Authority. They're the ones that just been motoring along and getting that done. Continuing on the Fresno Housing Authority bandwagon, um, we will be opening uh, the, uh, the Valley Inn next Tuesday and start taking in, um, being able to receive uh, homeless individuals on Tuesday next week. So September should be a good month for working on the homeless issues in the city. We'll be opening up the, um, the, the Valley Inn. We'll get additional capacity from the Travel Inn um, as you guys have requested, we'll be transitioning folks out of the sands to take advantage of some of those. So that'll be 
ending. Uh, so we're really excited. And again, it's impressive to watch what the housing authority can do. They're like ants, man. They just get onto the site and just get it ready and turned over. And so in 60 days, it went from acquisition to occupancy. So I'm very impressed with, um, with how they've been proceeding along. Um, and then the final thing I want to just share is that we're putting together a trade memo right now for council. You may or may not be aware, each of you, a lot of you, have some park acquisition projects that you want to, that you've been asked us to initiate, whether it's um, to get the appraisals done, accept gifts. So I want to get a memo out there, but just so you guys get a sense of what that load is starting to look like. It's a lot of property and a lot of projects, and so just get everybody caught up on, on what that environment, that space looks like. Uh, and that's our update. Thank you. Thank you, City Manager. All right, that concludes our reports and comments. Let's go on to adopting the consent uh, calendar. But before we do that, let me actually take um, some public comment on consent, closed session, and unscheduled communication. I believe we have Mr. James Pratt Pratter um, on there, and then City Clerk, did Ms. Padilla not wish to speak anymore? Is that correct? That is correct. All right. Do we have Mr. Pratter on? Yes, we do. All right, put them on. Mr. Pratter, you'll have three minutes, sir. Is my volume okay? Yes, you're good. I come before this council requesting that you re-examine the decision that turned a law enforcement department into a revenue generator. I appeared before this council in April, and in my comments, I voiced my concern for the startling and unexpected increase in fire inspection fees. But of greater concern to me was learning that the origin of this decision was politics and not the needs of the fire department. Because this is a public forum, I will not disclose the names of the individuals I spoke with, but I will be sending each council member a copy of all the information I gathered through public records requests in hopes they will review it and decide if they're also troubled by what I've documented. Call me naive, but I think some things should be above politics and the fire department should be one of them. I think decisions on hiring personnel should be based on what the department needs, not what generates the most revenue. And I think those decisions should be made by the legislature because ultimately these fees are not coming out of the pocket of big business. They are coming out of the pocket of every renter in Fresno. In her testimony before the city council in March, 2020, Chief Donis made it clear there was pushback on these increases. She indicated that developers were insisting on an outside expert to examine the city's budget and the fire department budget make a recommendation. That recommendation was between 13 and 17%, owing mainly to the fact there had been no increases for the prior 11 years. Fire inspectors are the law enforcement branch of the fire department. They should be free to do their job without believing their position only exists to generate revenue. Don't take my word for it. Just look at the language of the fiscal year 2020 budget. Quote, this increase reflects 318,000 in anticipated revenue from the addition of six inspection staff and alignment of the budget to anticipated revenues, unquote. I think that this issue was completely glossed over at the March 2020 City Council meeting. I think that the information presented to the City Council made it seem like this was a fee increase directed at big business. And if you're talking about plan checking and fire sprinkler testing, those are absolutely costs that business can afford to shoulder. But fire inspection is about public safety, not revenue. I think that point was completely omitted from the presentation of the city council. That's why I believe it should be reviewed. I tried to ask the city attorney to look into this, but he flat out refused, citing a statute of limitations. Except the statute he cited is for development fees, not the inspection fees I'm discussing here. But even if that statute did apply, it doesn't change the fact that you council members have plenary power. You can investigate anything regardless of statute. As a final closing thought, I've heard many times heard this body bemoan the housing crisis and the lack of rental inventory. The fact that fees can appear out of nowhere or triple overnight without, without voter approval or even a courtesy notice inviting public comment is extremely troubling. That's the kind of uncertainty that makes people less likely to invest further in the Fresno rental market. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pratter. Uh, do we have anybody else uh, queued up to speak? City Clerk? Yes, on. we have, uh, next is Daniel. What's Mr. Daniel's last name? No last name. No oh, last name. Oh, Daniel? He disappeared. Oh. Uh, next is Lisa Flores. Ms. Flores, you'll have three minutes. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I have four issues I wanna talk to you about real quick. 
um, the transparency in the planning system um, with Elm Avenue. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, you okay. have three minutes, Ms. Flores. We can hear you loud and clear. The floor is yours. Okay, so I want to talk about the planning process that's going on with Elm Street. Um, last night it was presented that there was meetings with the community, but no one knew who the community was until the community stepped forward. Um, I would hope that all players in, in the city who are dealing with trying to find resolution for that will, you know, be clear and more transparent with the community. Um, because you cannot go to a planning commission meeting and just say we met with community and half the community that's there on Elm Street. Okay, I'm hearing somebody else speak. Um, you know, half the community that was there were having issues with, well, you didn't talk to us. The second issue I have is kudos to the Parks Department for coming out and taking care of issues at the dog park. Not one week, but two weeks. And this last week when we went, um, we still didn't have the same problem. So. I'm loving my, my parks department at Roding. Um, the third issue I have is the poor boys showing up at Adventure Church and um, one of their people alleging that they're gonna come back basically to knock heads with the community and you know, Larry abating, doing what Larry does. Um, and I'm really concerned. And also too, I'm kind of concerned about, you know, those Adventure Church folks because, you know, I went to a restaurant and I wasn't hitting the the uh, the after church crowd until they showed up in a very small Mexican restaurant. They showed up 13 people without a mask. And me being, you know, hypersensitive to this whole Delta virus, um, I didn't flip out, but I got the hell away from them as quickly as possible because they were not showing any sort of um, six feet of social distancing having a mask walking into a restaurant until they sat down and ordered, you know, there was no standard and that really freaked me out. Um, the fourth thing I wanna to talk to you guys about is COVID and the pandemic spread. Um, we're currently in Delta, there's Delta two, that is Delta with a twist. We still have um, um, two other ones to come up um, and hit us. Uh, the one most notably is um, you. It's from um, Africa, and they've just um, denoted that it is a, a variant of concern and that they're looking at. Um, as far as I'm concerned, the city now needs to invoke, you either get uh, your vaccine or you get fired, bottom line, because public safety starts with city and city employees. Also, too, I would highly recommend, because it is your fiduciary responsibility, to pass premium increases to those who do choose not to get vaccinated because this is a preventable illness. It is a prevent, it is preventable because what the city if is you looking wrap up at, your comments, Ms. Flores. I'm wrapping it up right now. My last point is it's, it's somewhat preventable and it's going to stop or collapse. And the cost, the average cost for a COVID case is anywhere from $28,000 to Two. Thank you, Ms. Flores. 4.8 to 4 million dollars. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Ms. Carla Martinez. We could queue up Ms. Martinez. You'll have three minutes. Good morning, council members. Car Carla Martinez, policy advocate with Leadership Council. Um, I'll be making comments for item 1I. Uh, we're happy to see that community-based organizations will be giving additional funding to assist residents with much needed financial assistance. They're doing the on the ground work that is really essential. However, the application process needs to be easy and streamlined for obtaining these funds. Residents are desperately falling behind and many still don't know how to access these funds. Um, we've tried to connect folks to these services by inviting CBOs out to hard to reach communities, but that still isn't enough. Recently, a resident we work with, Martha, had applied for utility assistance, and after we held her filled out an application, um, she is still behind $1,200 in PG&E bills after contracting COVID and after her hours were reduced. She fell even farther behind. 
She filled out an application and waited to be approved. It's now been two and a half months since she filled that out and she still hasn't heard anything back. Uh, Martha is only one of many residents who are still waiting weeks and months while the city sits on millions of dollars. How is the city promoting, promoting and pushing ERAP dollars and folks still can't get help? People are struggling to pay rent, pay their utilities, and with the Delta variant spreading quickly, ICUs filling up, and the eviction moratorium ending soon, the city must act now to streamline the process. Making the application short, such as requiring a self-attestation form, makes the process easier, faster, and efficient for everyone. We need to get these dollars out and help the most vulnerable now. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Martinez. Next up is Ms. What's the next speaker? City Clerk, Piombino. Last name is Piombino. Ms. Piombino, you'll have three minutes. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Good morning, Council, Council President and Mayor Dyer. Cindy Piombino here with Christ Helping Hands, Fresno Church. And I've been outreaching in the Roding Park, uh, Motel Drive, Shields West area for quite a few years. And um, I've got some concerns out there outreaching, I was, um, uh, detoured over to the Roving Park when I noticed Fresno PD there. I went up and asked him what asked him what was going on. He said, you know, he's making a move as they do. And I said, well, did you offer services offers to Holden? And he said, nope. I said, why? He says it's the same old crowd. They deny him. I said, you should have asked. So I went over to the crowd and I asked if any of them wanted services, and and five of them did. He went back to offer to Holden. He said he would call the Pav. He called the Pav Pavarello. They came out a few hours later, only to the disappointing, reoccurring constant news, which is there are no beds. That's a concern. Also, I'm currently helping a client at the Sun Lodge who was assaulted in their room, who is undergoing medical uh, care for serious issue right now. And I was asked by the case manager uh, there, and uh, I have the ROI on file, to um, come and help with this person since th they have communication problems with this this person and I try to balance those requests from this case manager and try to support my friend the best I can emotionally um, medical appointments uh, support prayer just caring and it's hard to do um, because when they got their their selves upset with the situation uh, I got me and the client both got escorted off the property how am I supposed to help this client when I'm not allowed on the property but lo and behold, a week later, I get a call from the case manager to please help with another situation with this client. And I said, sure, but this works both ways. How can I help when I'm not even allowed to come in there? In and out driving privileges. I have to park at Denny's. And this person, mind you, is undergoing medical situation. It's very serious. It's a, it's a concern. Um, also, the hot water hasn't been working there. I don't know if it is now this morning. I haven't been able to get through to Sun Lodge. They don't answer their calls for clients or the outside world. And um, so the case manager, I, I can't call because now they're on family leave. So um, I have no number. I'll have to drive over there and check it out. But the, the, the hot water's been out for uh, close to a week. And this is the second time in a month. Um, uh, you know, where do they go? Where do they go? Um, it, it's sad. Um, the, I just heard um, our city manager say that uh, Valley Inn is going to be opening up and they're transitioning sands. I'm hoping that there's going to be some beds available because I have about five people that want one of those beds. I, I, they, they, so I need to know um, how I can get them in there and they can get some priority. Can you wrap up they your are, comments, Ms. Piombino? Okay, so uh, has that we're out here trying to help our homeless community? It is a challenge, it's frustrating. I invite any of you council members to tag with me when, you know, when I go out and you'll see the frustration, just not from my mouth, but from theirs. And so I, I appreciate Thank your you, support. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Ms. Des uh -huh. Martinez. Ms. Martinez, you'll have three minutes. Hello and good morning, city council and city council president. Um, I ran into a couple of problems and Cindy spoke on some of them already. 
Um, one of them I want to speak on is that we need emergency funds for families with children that are out here in the streets. Um, I ran into a couple the other day. I knew the boy was uh, homeless, but I didn't know that his wife had recently became homeless with their one and a half year old child. Um, I did what I can do best and put it on the book. And, you know, not one organization reached out to me, not one, not even HSPs. Um, there was a, a certain individual that did reach out, and I appreciate that so much. Thank you. Um, but this is emergency. We need to have, if any outreach team is going to get any of these funds, there needs to be an emergency funds for families with children that are out of here on the streets. There's no reason at all that the, our city, HBs, is contacted and notified that there is a baby out here and nobody does anything, even dire. Come on now. Emergency funds need to be placed for these types of situations and they need to be accessible 24 hours a day because it's not always between eight and five that people end up homeless. Um, so we need availability 24 hours. This is an important, this is very important. We need to remove all children off Parkway due to the rise in the crime, the shootings. Multiple shootings have been happening over there and this is not a place for the children to be. We need different contractors on these motels because the, they're not getting completed like fast enough. Now, Tommy or whoever's saying that next Tuesday, I'm going to follow with Cindy. Sands is closing. Cap is closing. Are we just shelter going from shelter to shelter? What about all the people that have been waiting for eight months for this uh, project off ramp to be done so they can actually have a, a place to go? Now, those individuals that have been waiting for eight months for project off ramp to be completed now have to wait again because we're closing other shelters, Cap and Sands, and now we're going to transport them into the shelters that you are just now going to open. We have H Street. Come on, Miguel, I need you to go down, drive down H Street and see what I'm talking about. This is insane. You guys are constantly removing people and um, displacing individuals, breaking up camps, and now they're still coming down, being pushed down towards POV, down on H Street, where they're told that they can go ahead and be without being bothered. It is, you thought it was packed before? It is crazy. Now we have two dumpsters out there and they're both getting full. Two, you guys have placed two dumpsters out there and they're both getting full. This ought to tell you guys something. We need help right now. You guys can use that lot that I'm giving up. You can use that lot for tiny homes on wheels. The removable, you can lease it. All you have to do is sanction that. You get to pay a dollar a year, $2,000 admin fees. The city has got that. So Dyer, why don't you start a tiny home project on that lot that I've been on for a year and a half. If it's perfect area for a pilot program, there's no reason, no reason at all why you cannot put a tiny home pilot program on that lot because it can you have to sanction it first. thank you miss martinez yeah okay thank you next up is miss brandy uh news villegas Ms. villegas you'll have three minutes okay thank you first of all i want to uh support and piggyback uh support the things that were said previously uh, with cindy please take to heart the things that that she said about with both with uh, outreach with the contact with homeless and with those in hotels, these are not unusual situations. Do go out and hear, um, support what does said with the tiny houses. We need to have alternatives. We need to have places. We need you guys to work on places, um, placing uh, housing, I mean, shelters and tiny homes and things and safe areas, not only for families, but uh, people with other vulnerabilities that I mentioned at the last meeting. Um, I asked that with the Valley Inn that it would be open to all homeless and not just projects. I know that we, based on what was said before, things closing, it probably is pushing things over, but also for uh, residents have a means to communicate issues and, and get help, like the issues that Cindy mentioned that need to be able to go out beyond the staff. Um, I also want to thank you. Uh, so yeah, please uh, take these things seriously. Go out and listen. Uh, listen to people who are in those places. Um, I also want to thank you, Miguel, for making statements and also Luis regarding the COVID situation and for being leaders in speaking up on this. Um, it's not a matter of us not doing it, people not doing what you guys want us to do. It is the community is not doing what uh, we've been told could be protect the people in our, our, our uh, community and protect our, our hospitals. And we're seeing the effects of that. And it is serious. I have friends who are teachers who are seeing it happen. I know someone who lost half of their students in the first week and they have to be at home and do the online thing. So they're still back to that. Um, seeing kids getting sick 
Uh, there was, they mentioned that there was 11 people who died, and I have people now that I am grieving who have died, but even people with minor issues who are dealing with really, really um, debilitating issues and can't work because of uh, long-term effects of even non-hospitalized. And one of my friends was not able to be hospitalized. So, Brenda, I feel like you misinterpret a lot of things, and a lot of the issues are based on misinformation and people refusing to do things that would minimize this that you are encouraging and and you, we could be focusing on encouraging people and protecting themselves so thank you city for taking those protective measures that you have i do ask that the kit this the council all the council take it seriously and do what we can to protect people um i also want to thank you uh, support firm and it's and it's thing um and it's item with affordable housing and the ones on rental and um, support the statement made by the leadership county and we can do these wonderful things but we have to make it more accessible we need to make sure that people get the help when they need it because things like rent assistance can't wait thank you all right our last speaker is daniel daniel you'll have three minutes is daniel still queued up city clerk can you hear me okay we can hear you sir you have the floor okay um, well, I just wanted to make some comments based on what I heard today uh, and, you know, maybe ask some questions. One second. Did we lose them? Can you guys still hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, sir. Go ahead. Uh, uh, they said that the, in the, everyone was muted or something. Um, give me one second. Uh, so, I, like I said, uh, I don't know how much you got, but um, I wanted to say that uh, I wanted to make some comments based on what I heard today. And uh, obviously, the COVID uh, pandemic is a real thing. Uh, you know, people have died. There, there is no, you know, downplaying it to say. But, you know, what uh, what Miguel Arias said today is very concerning. Um, I moved to Fresno from the Bay Area because the Bay Area. The government out there, the cities out there, um, like to overreach a lot. Uh, and I find it very shocking and very weird that people are just willing to give up freedoms and personal choice. Um, and what I would like Miguel to actually expand on is, you know, who's essential and who's not. If he can provide me a list of who's essential and who's not, I would appreciate that. And then also, he said that there'd be mandates or alternatives. I'd like him to expand on what he means by alternatives. What is, is that a threat? I mean, I, I don't know, right? And then, you know, the, the mayor himself said there's a lack of staff in, in the nursing side. So to me, it does not make any sense to mandate vaccines to a group of people that have gotten us through this pandemic for over a year and a half without a vaccine at first and now we're going to force them to get vaccines while there's a shortage i don't know how that makes sense to anybody so you're willing to fire nurses that don't get vaccinated i mean again COVID is real but so are our freedoms so is the constitution and people like miguel the way that he spoke so calmly about having our freedoms taken away and threatening us because that was a threat because he didn't say what alternatives were i'd like for him to expand on that what's an alternative finding people for getting together with their family but I, I would love to hear more from miguel actually people like him don't deserve to be in government and and hopefully he's not there long that's all i have to say all right, thank you. Next up, I did have two more speakers punched up. Jody Ketchside uh, punched up to speak. We could cue her up. Ms. Ketchside, are you on? I am. Go ahead. Okay, good morning. I just wanted to respond to a couple of things. Um, I would love to make contact with Cindy on the issues that she's had with Sun Lodge and her client. We do reach out to folks that um, that present themselves as um, ask, you know someone who can help with clients that have built a rapport with them. 
when we're having difficulty, um, you know, trying to collaborate with other folks. I apologize if, if she's had issues with getting on site. Sometimes the security is a, a little hyper-focused, um, which is a good thing sometimes and, and works out like this other times. So I would love to connect with you. Um, I am listed on the Turning Point website, Jody Ketchaside, and my uh, email is jketchaside at tpocc.org. Cindy, if you want to contact me, if you're still listening. Um, also, in terms of the water, we are aware of the water situation. Um, the housing authority is repairing that. They are, there is a part shortage because of the age of the unit that has to be replaced. That should be installed next week. So um, we're working as fast as we can with the housing authority to get that situation resolved. So I just wanted to chime in and uh, make sure that city council was aware that we are working on that. All right, thank you. Does that conclude your comments, Ms. Kisside? Yes. All right, thank you. Next up, our last speaker is Harmon Singh. Mr. Singh? Good morning, council members. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, sir. Okay. Um, my name is Harmon. I'm uh, the ERAP program lead for the Chikara movement. Uh, the reason I wanted to make public comment today was because I really wanted to implore all of the council to actually take the initiative and extend the moratorium we have here in Fresno, the eviction moratorium. Uh, we've seen, you know I'm, I'm, you know, I'm here on the front lines, you know, working with tenants and landlords who every day, you know, we're getting new and new applications from folks who don't even know that this rental assistance exists, uh, whether it's our farm workers, whether it's folks who just don't have digital uh, access to digital, uh, you know, literacy, these, the access to the resources to even get to this grant or get knowledge of this assistance. Uh, We've, every day it's just more and more people that, you know, we talk to that, you know, are going through a situation that can be avoided. Uh, but if the eviction moratorium is lifted, I mean, the state's planning on lifting the moratorium and we're not hearing any news that they're gonna extend it, but there is a real, real dire need to extend this. Um, and so I, I'm just hoping that Fresno can take that initiative that we can be actually a step ahead and not wait till the end and wait and wait until our folks are, you know, at risk of homelessness, at risk of, you know, uh, sacrificing their monthly payment that would go towards groceries to just pay their rent. Uh, this rental assistance is out there. We know that, you know, of course, we're doing a better and better job every day, you know, learning how to or figuring out how to get this money out quicker, but it's still not fast enough. And it's not, we're not gonna be able to get it all out, of course. And, you know, yeah, we can give this money out after the eviction moratorium ends, but that also puts a lot of people at risk. So I would highly, highly, highly recommend that the council takes that initiative and extends the moratorium ourselves. That's all, thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Singh. That concludes our public comment. I will now close that part, part of the meeting. Uh, is there a motion to approve the balance of the consent calendar? So moved. All right, motion made by Councilmember Corbasi, seconded by Councilmember Arias. And uh, for the benefit of the public, I have items 1B, 1N, 1I, 1Y, 1AA uh, that were pulled uh, to contested consent. Uh, so with that, there's been a motion and a second. Do I have any opposition? Seeing none, motion carries. We will now take these in alphabetical order, hopefully. Uh, item 1B uh, was pulled by Council Member Maxwell. Yep, thank you, Council President. I'll wait for the director to get to the podium. Good morning, Council Member Mike Carbajal, Public Utilities. Good morning, Director. I think I remember when you gave me a tour of the facilities last year, you even pointed out the item that's in discussion today that needed replacement. So I've physically been able to see and hear a little bit about that. I just had a couple of quick follow-up questions regarding what I read in the staff report. I think it was mentioned that um, these new flares are going to create less pollution. Do we know how much less pollution? Do we have a percentage of how much more efficient these are than the ones that we had been historically using? Right, they have to meet uh, certain tier standards that are, uh, right. that are outlined by the air pollution control district. So these will be um, you know, an ultra low NOx um, sure. flaring operation, which will significantly re re 
reduce those emissions. I don't have the specific number in terms of the calculations, and that fluctuates on a day-to-day basis. Do you know, do you know what it's like? Is it, is it a minimal increase? Is it pretty significant? Uh, we are talking about uh, 62,000 pounds of um, sulfur oxide emission reduction and 32, it's actually right here in the staff report, 3,200 pounds of nitri- nitri- nitrogen oxide emissions. So it's, uh, you know, we're a large scale facility um, serving two cities. And so we need adequate flaring capacity. And, and as part of our agreement with the Air Board, we have agreed to install an ultra low NOx flaring operation. Appreciate that. I, I read here that the purchase of the credits is good for the new flaring operations lifetime. Remind me, what, what is the lifetime of these devices? So we're, we're talking putting in a facility that uh, should operate you know, for a, at least a couple decades. For these new longer. flares? Right, that's correct. Okay. So when we put them in, they meet today's standards. Um, those standards will obviously change going forward, but um, the goal is to continue to operate this, this facility um, going forward for a number of decades, uh, provided it's appropriately maintained and maintenanced over time. Uh, we're also looking at mitigating our flaring operations over time as well. So this $327,000 that we're being asked to approve for the lifetime of these could be expected to go about two decades? Right. Well, it's a one-time purchase right. for the ability to run the facility, right? So it's we purchase them up front. That's, that enables us to achieve the permits to operate the facility. So it's a one-time purchase. Okay. You did mention mitigation long-term, and that was something I believe we discussed when I did the site tour last year. So could you elaborate, Director, what is the long-term plan to not just – mitigate, but maybe even, you know, capture some of these emissions and turn them into something productive like energy for our city. Any long-term plans or discussions regarding that, Director? Absolutely. So historically, well, we operated a power generation facility. That facility was decommissioned in 2017. That's what's led to the need to increase the flaring capacity. Uh, we have also been engaged um, in interconnection efforts with PG&E. Um, that will require a pipeline that needs to be constructed from the facility and to an interconnection point uh, with their uh, transmission pipeline out along um, Chateau Fresno, which is the very western boundary of our facility out in southwest Fresno. So the goal long term is to develop that mitigation plan, uh, proceed with the interconnection, and so those efforts are underway. They're programmed in our capital plan, and so we will proceed with uh, um, uh, approving a, a, a long-term midi- flaring mitigation plan with the Air Board. Do you have a draft timeline you'd be willing to share with me on this project? So I don't, I, I, I don't recall off the top of my head, but it's within our five-year program that we are moving forward with the interconnection efforts, including this being year construction. One? Correct. Okay. All right, I'll make a motion to approve. Thank you, Director. Thank you. Council President, I do have one question for the Director. Sure. Can you remind me again, uh, the facility serves what two cities? City of Fresno, City of Clovis, plus um, certain unincorporated areas of the county. How long is our contract to continue serving the City of Clovis? Uh, that contract is set up to operate indefinitely. Um, so they are not moving forward with, uh, you know, there's no plan for Clovis to build their own wastewater treatment facility. So we are, we are partners in the operation of this facility. Um, when you say partners, what's the percentage of the partnership? And what is what if this body decided one day to um, respectfully ask Clovis to process their own waste? What would happen? I think that would be a significant discussion um, that I'm not prepared to talk about today. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they do they do participate in the the. Uh, they, they do have own certain capacity in the collection system as well as the, the treatment capacity of the plant. Uh, they participate in the ongoing operation inspects, um, expenses as well as our capital program. We meet with them on an ongoing basis to determine based upon their contribution to the flow to that plant what their costs are and they have to incorporate that into their rate plans on an ongoing basis. So in in short, um, this facility in West Fresno allows Clovis not to have to develop their own wastewater treatment facility? Say that again? This facility in West Fresno allows Clovis, the city of Clovis, not to develop their own wastewater treatment facility in their city? Well, I think that was an agreement that was made that um, How long ago, we would do you proceed. Know? Uh, I, I think our contract with them dates back to the 19, 1977, I believe. 
um, and there were arrangements in place even before that. Okay. So it's it's you know goes back almost 50 years in terms of the decision that this area would be supported by a regional wastewater treatment facility, and that the city of Fresno would be the operator of that facility. Got it. Well, thank you. I'm sure the our neighbors in the city of Clovis are extremely grateful that we have agreed to manage and process all their waste. All their shit. <laughs> all right. Um, I don't know what to say about that. There was a motion made by Councilmember Maxwell, seconded by Councilmember Soria. Any opposition? Seeing none, motion carries. Next up is item 1I. I believe it was pulled by Councilmember Bredefeld. Yeah, I just have a couple of questions. Why the such differences in the allocation that, that are there? Yes, uh, I, think we have, I think we have Courtney uh, available to respond, but I can get started. Um, what we had done was allocate the dollars. We looked at the uh, original allocations that were made in 2020. We made another allocation early 2021. What were those proportions? And then what we also factored in was how much has they spent through so far? And so based on how much he had spent through so far, we figured, okay, let's go ahead and reestablish them at those initial levels that we had had. So some people had spent a little faster than others was able to get the money. So the allocations are intended to get them back to where we had them originally. The thing I'm wondering, Tom, is like, so why does educational leadership get 1.7 million, but uh, Central Law Familia gets 57? You, you wanna? So thank you, um, Council Member Bredefeld, for bringing that up. I'd actually ask that we do make an increase. We do have actually uh, Margarita, Margarita from Central La Familia and also Jakara. I'm not sure who made the decision to give those really low numbers, but what I've been told, like for example, Central La Familia has 92 pending applications. Um, 50 some thousand dollars is not gonna be enough. It takes about 30 days to process a check, so I would like to actually see an increase both for Central La Familia and Jakara. Okay, uh, Tommy and Georgiana. Yeah, you... and, so, oh. and, and so part of the calculation was also how much money do they already have left? Okay. So some of these have more money left than others, and so that factored into how much he allocated. But the council member's right. Several of the organizations have identified that they'll be out of money in the next few weeks. So the timing is right. We just need to revisit the allocations. Okay, and somebody was... Oh, and Courtney, can you kind of update yeah. folks? Oh. Council yeah. President? Yeah. Hey. Courtney, can you talk a little bit how the, uh, at what we walk, talked about on the allocation methodology? Right. So what we did is I, I got information from each of the organizations asking them how much they've spent to date and um, took those into considerations when uh, we were making our decisions on how much would be allocated based on what they had left to what they thought they could spend within the next um, four months. So at that time, Central La Familia still had a large share of money left. I was updated by Margarita this morning that um, she does have a, a significant amount of money that they've spent to date. So um, increasing those now might might be a good idea. But at the time when we got all of this information, they had only spent about 50% of their funding. So what I want to do, uh, if you allow me, Councilmember Member yeah, yeah. I know that it's your time, but um, I do want to give it the opportunity for both um, Centro La Familia and then also Jakar, the Jakara movement to kind of speak in terms of their needs. But then also I want to offer that we are, this resolution would be a, appropriating the entire amount that we have and then um, settling these agreements, but to actually give the authority to the manager so that they don't have to be coming every time to allocate another 50,000 or another 100,000. They have a track record, they've been working with us, they've been successful, that you, we just kind of um, give them the authority to yeah. continue funding them. Yeah. But I do wanna give sure. them the opportunity, they're on the phone. Do we have Ms. Margarita uh, Rocha on, on queue to speak, city clerk? Yes, and I am promoting DEEP as well. Okay, Ms. Rocha. Uh, good morning, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Uh, good morning and, and uh, thank you, Council President and Council Member Soria uh, for the opportunity. Uh, and I do, and, and Courtney is correct, we had a conversation a couple of weeks back where we did discuss where we were at that point. I do want to add that at that particular time, I had a couple of staff members out with the COVID issues. Um, 
and one staff member that had returned to school. So we were at a low, in other words, you know, the peaks and valleys. Uh, but since then, you know, we're back up to full staff and have been able to process the applications. So we, in fact, have spent more than $700,000, have 91 applications pending, and have uh, at least 40 appointments in these next 10 days. Uh, the other thing that we have done because of the issues that we were challenged with in the COVID issues, uh, we have an aggressive outreach uh, a media plan, uh, which is already in effect, so that we anticipate that we would have no issues in spending the remainder and also would be out of funds by the end of September. And so we'd have to come back because we'd have applications, families waiting for additional services. So uh, both scenarios are correct. One is when Courtney spoke to us, we were at that point, uh, but effective today. I've done all the research on where we are today and and we're definitely going to be out of money rather quickly. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rocha. Do we have uh, the other gentleman queued up to speak? If you could let them. Mr. Singh? Yes, can you all hear me? Yes, go ahead, sir. Per perfect. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I, I also just wanted to echo uh, some of Margarita's comments. Um, We've, uh, I had a fantastic conversation with uh, City Manager Eva earlier this week and have been in touch with Courtney. We are actually completely out of money at this point. We're about negative 15,000. We've gotten all of our money out in, in our previous allocation and, and our, uh, we're, we're running on fumes because we know at some point that the city will be able to reimburse us, but we're just trying to get money out as fast as possible. Um, we are ready to take on a, larger load, I would share that with uh, City Manager Scala as well. We've had two volunteers that have been working with um, Harmon. I would love to actually uh, hire them. But they're just passionate about it. Uh, and one of them was actually the stuff. So we're, you know, ready to go. And also, I just uh, echo the comments that were made earlier, uh, especially by Harmon about, you know, the city was looking into an extension of the eviction moratorium, as, as well as the comments earlier by Ms. Martinez about um, just quicker and better ways to uh, streamline our process and ease our flows because more and more people are learning about it and uh, the sooner we can get out the money to help folks, uh, more we can actually even ease potential increase in our in our shelter this population. All right, thank you, Mr. Singh, City Manager. From an implementation aspect, what do you what do you recommend to address what Councilman Masoria said on the on the you know practical side of it? To do what Councilmember Soria said, which is appropriate the money, and then that gives because because the way these things are happening, it just gives us a flexibility. Okay, you're ready to go, you're ready, and we can just keep Recognition. pushing the money to them. So I thought it was a, a yes. genius idea that you brought up, and let's just do it that way. Great. Is that already codified in the item, Councilmember Soria? Oh, so I'm going to make the motion okay. to approve um, with the authority to the city manager's office to work with the organizations on a case by case basis to continue allocating so that we don't lose the op the momentum that we have out there um, to fund these applications. Okay. Second. And, and Council uh, President, Council the COVID President. committee had discussed this and we're supportive of the recommendation to make sure that we don't lose any time on distributing these funds. All right, motion made by Councilman Soria, seconded by Councilman Bredefeld, and Councilman Bredefeld yeah, still just, has the floor. And so the oversight of these funds and how they're expended, how's that happening, Tommy? So there's a couple of things that happen. Uh, the first thing we have is we have Courtney, who gets monthly reports on you know, applications, and we're doing that through the ERAP program. So we're watching the, uh, the efficiency and progress of each of the agencies, and she's in contact with them once a week to just, if you need anything, how's it going? Uh, and then the other one is the oversight committee that we have every Monday we meet and we just kind of update them on where we're going. And then that's where we have these discussions about should we change the strategy on how we're distributing the money? And then with the moratorium ending, uh, end of this month, or the, yeah, the end of this month now, I think the timing's right to go ahead and add this added flexibility so that we can just keep pushing it out there as the demand the, changes. The only thing that I will add is if you can just keep the oh, yeah. council appraised with you know, the reports just so the council knows. Um, but again, it takes 30 days to issue a check. So you guys heard some people are already out of money. So I think that's why it's important to um, give the city manager that authority at Absolutely. this moment. And are these funds going to landlords and renters both? 
I believe we're, Courtney, are you still there? I think the, the, the yeah. design is to go to the exactly. landlord first, but in some instances we send it to the tenant. Okay. Right. The intent is for the landlord first, and if the landlord refuses to participate in the program, the money can go to the tenant. Okay. Thank you. Council All right. President. Vice President. I had a question just generally for the administration. Um, you know, uh, we're dispersing these funds. At, at what point, you know, what sort of a threshold where we're going to get to that tier where we're paying forward rent instead of back rent? Obviously, we're having a lot of trouble dispersing these funds for back rent. I think a lot of folks suffered during the pandemic and kind of just, you know, made those tough decisions and, and paid rent instead of uh, taking care of other essential costs. Uh, and so we're, we're hearing from a lot of folks in the community as well. This would have been helpful, and but the help came after the fact uh, from the federal government and state government. Uh, so I, I think really there's probably a whole lot of folks we'd capture on the sort of forward uh, rent to help them catch up in general, as opposed to struggling to kind of pick up these small these last few folks in the back end. So at what point will we reach that tier where we're helping pay two three months? ahead to those families that are uh, that do qualify. Can can I kind of respond to that? And, and I think that's an excellent point, Council Member Esparza. I think that's a policy call. I think that we need, if we want to have that discussion, we should. I think right now we have built good momentum to try to help those that are still behind. There's still people that are behind and it's evident by the applications that are um, that we're attempting to process. Number two, we're starting to process the utilities. Um, so water and internet. And so we're getting through that, the PG&E. So I think once we get closer to where we're seeing you know, less and less applications and that we've gone through those phases, I think we can explore, hey, we're, we have these dollars. How are we gonna make sure that families are taken care of moving forward? What she said. Councilmember uh, Soria and Esparza, I think it would be very helpful to allow Courtney five minutes to give us a quick update on where we're at with disbursements, because I know she knows, like the back of a hand, our percentage of disbursement, how many pending applications yet to be processed, how much PGD we've already paid, and you know what's the next uh, phase of that. Courtney, you have all the answers to those three, four <laughs> questions. I hope so. All right. Um, so just just to. Um, talk about what council member Soria said um, right now the ERAP program both at the state and the federal level only allows us to pay through September so unless they make changes to the program at this point uh, we we can't move forward and pay October through whatever that decision is so I just wanted to let the council know that there is that restriction we have been paying prospective rent as of um, probably the middle of July. So we have been paying August and September prospective rent for those um, applicants that have requested it. Uh, moving on to answer the questions and kind of give a detailed um, background of where we are. Uh, right now, we we finished the 24th week of operation for the ERAP program. We've accepted about 9,700 9, applications. Um, those accepted applications are um, not including the disqualified and the incomplete applications. Um, we've funded about $7.4 million in rental assistance. We've also made uh, 672 um, household payments of PG&E totaling about $1.1 million. And we make those PG&E payments on a, on a weekly basis for those that are, are requesting pg &E assistance. Um, we're currently at a 14% um, pay rate of applications at this point with the 86% remaining still in the pipeline. That doesn't mean they've been disqualified or anything. That just means we are still working on them. We're still getting the documentation needed for them. We're still getting the information from the, the applicants themselves. Um, so that's kind of where we are at on the program in general right now. Um, like uh, like uh, city manager said, we do update the, the council subcommittee on a weekly basis with um, these figures. So I can't answer any other questions. Thank you, you Courtney. And, and I would also add that um, what's not included in this ERAP um, conversation is we did use some of the ERAP funds to fund the Marjorie Mason Center for domestic violence victims, breaking the chains and the eviction protection program. That's all from the same fund. If we were to fund every pending application in the queue now, we're looking at about $30 million that would be fully expended out. Because on average, we're providing $5,800 of assistance to every applicant on average so far. 
um, and that's before we um, consider paying city utilities that we're allowed to use for these funds and that we know, I think the last count was like 14 or 15 million. 14 of, million. Uh, 14 million of unpaid city utilities across the city. We were very intentional as a committee to start with PG&E, because that's one that you know nobody else is gonna help you with. We're pursuing paying off internet bills for kids who were home all last year um, doing homeschooling um, or online schooling, and um, as well as, as going through the process for city utilities. So all that is being done in a way that's very secure, and there's electronic payments to the actual utility versus it going through the uh, applicant. So we make sure that what is owed is actually paid, and it makes the utility whole on behalf of the applicant. So just want to say thank you to Courtney, Chris, all the nonprofits that have stepped up. It's a lot of work. We have been asking for flexibility. It's come, um, it's been delayed, but it has been granted and we'll keep on moving through it, and you know, it's a, it's a heavy lift for everyone, but I think so far the help has outweighed the amount of work that has to be done. Okay, one question uh, for the COVID subcommittee. So uh, I see that we're appropriating the 32 million. How, how much of that money has been spent from the original uh, allocation we made? Um, I wanna say total, we have about 35 million in ERAP. We just got another allocation of 7.9 million for ERAP2, which brings us around 43 million. Of that, what's been expended is the money for Marjorie Mason Center, breaking the chains, eviction protection, which is, I believe, 1.5 million, plus what's been dispersed so far, which is 7.4 million um, for rental assistance, plus 1.1 million for PG&E. So we're around probably $10 million of disbursement so far, if my math is somewhat correct. How much did you say? 10 million. Around Dang, within five hundred thousand dollars, we're at nine point five. Good and job. And I plucked math, so <laughs> not bad. You got to be in math. So, so I do want to just so update. City, so, city manager, on on that, so nine point five million that we've spent so far, but we had our own program through the city of Fresno, correct? Or correct. You so had two and a half million. That, this includes the CARES Act and all the all the rental assistance program. There was a two million dollars that came out of the general fund. That's not included in this That's number. That's not included. Yeah, yeah that was just money. So oh, council member, council president, when we say what's been expended for ERAP, we mean both the city and the CBO, and the CBO. Um, work right. to provide relief to both. I, I do want to update just on the numbers. So the federal government and the state government have actually allocated about $64 million to the city. They're just giving it out in tranches. We've received about 42. We spent 10. Now we want to get this 30 as part of this, and we'll just keep moving the money through. All right, uh, Councilmember Bredefeld, do you have any other questions or concerns? All right, motion was made, seconded by Councilmember Bredefeld. Any opposition? Seeing none, motion carries. All right, next item is item 1N, and that was pulled by Councilmember Maxwell. Uh, Councilmember Maxwell, item 1N. Thank While you, they wrap up President. their sidebar. Yeah, don't I, do I, that. I was impressed by his quick calculations. <laughs> <laughs> Fuzzy man. How are you, sir? I'm doing great, thank hey. you. Um, we had a couple of questions from my office on this item. I believe one of them was answered this morning just in regards to you know how frequently are we receiving this money. My outstanding question um, regards the function of this money, what's it used for, and I, I thought I read something about some of this money goes to the Fresno County Sheriff's Office. Is that correct? And can you just elaborate a little bit more on what this money is used for? Yeah, so the JAG grant is a very beneficial grant to not just the Fresno Police Department, but it's used nationwide. Um, I used to get this grant in Oklahoma City. And it's federal money. It's uh, through the, the uh, Department of Justice. And it has to be earmarked to be used for certain things. Um, we are the managers of this grant. Um, and again, we've been receiving it since 2007. And uh, the um, Fresno County Sheriff's Office does uh, receive a, a certain part of it, a certain percentage of it. This particular year, we're, uh, the total amount is $280,000, of which $196,000 is going to be coming to the Fresno Police Department. And uh, basically- Can I interject real quick, Chief? Why is that a stipulation of the grant, that part of it has to go to the county, or is that a- agreement that we worked out on a local level with no the that's County a stipulation it was it was when it was originally applied for uh, it was stipulated that it was going, going to help uh, law enforcement in the, in the county of Fresno therefore they uh, get a certain portion of it so we applied for this grant together and that's the portion that they receive uh, so we're annually. joint applicants on 
the actual grant? We are the fiscal agent, which means we manage okay. the grant. And, and there, so this is very common with other uh, entities. For example, we also apply for grants through various of the uh, organizations that you've mentioned today. For example, Marjorie Mason, we apply for a grant, and, uh, and, and we're the ones that manage the grant. So the very similar case here. Could you? Um, explain a little bit for me, Chief, how you plan on using these funds over the next fiscal sure. year. Sure. Uh, $22,000 is going to be, has been allocated for um, ammunition, um, annual needs. Uh, ammunition is very important. We need it for training. We need it for our specialized units. So we plan on spending 22000 of the money there. $35,000 is going to go towards ballistic vest, vest replacements. Uh, the vests that police officers wear uh, only have about a five-year uh, shelf life. You know, basically they expire in five years. Uh, more expensive vests, such as the ones that SWAT uses, uh, those can have a longer uh, shelf life, about 10 years, but they're also a lot more expensive. So we plan on using $35,000 to replace vests. About $13,000 is earmarked towards uh, our canine unit. Um, uh, we, we project, you know, annually to uh, replace uh, a, a one canine. Uh, the purchase of the dog, the training, the equipment involved is about $13,000, give or take. Um, also, we have some uh, safety equipment for our motors. Um, that also is very ex expensive. 12000 is going towards that. Um, is this a use it or lose it basis, Chief? Or are we able to carry this over from fiscal year to fiscal year? Some of it is carryover. As a matter of fact, this is uh, 2020 projections. This goes through 2023. So if we have a little bit left over, that's okay because we can spend it right. the following year. So it's not a use it or lose it. And primarily good. for larger one-time purchases. That is correct. Okay, Chief. That was helpful for me. I just wasn't sure what the nature of it was, but mm -hmm. you've done a good job explaining it. I'll make a motion to approve. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any other questions? All right, did you make a motion, Councilmember Maxwell? Yes, I did. All right, seconded by Councilmember Carbasi. Uh, any other, qu oh, Vice President Sparsley, you're punched up, no? All right, any opposition? Seeing none, motion carries. All right, next up is, and for the benefit of the public, we're gonna do item one, double A, and then we're gonna go into closed session and wrap up with item one Y, um, which is Councilmember Soria's item. So one, double A, uh, Councilmember Bredefeld, you pulled it? Yeah, so why we're, uh, one why we go into closed session before we discuss it out here? Um, yeah. Okay. Yes. So that's part of kind of the item that okay. the city yep. manager put. Okay. So um, okay. One um, AA is, is um, Mr. Kirkland from Club One on. That's his item. Yes. That's the item, right? This was. Yeah. No, I, w I wanted to see if Mr. Kirkland. Oh, was if he's. On. Uh, yes. 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 Know. One second. Let me promote him. So we'll have Councilmember Bredefeld ask Mr. Kirkland his questions, and then we'll come back to Councilmember Maxwell. It's his item. Mr. Kirkland um, is on. Thank you. Mr. Kirkland? Yes, ma'am. So, uh, Mr. Kirkland, this is Councilmember Bredefeld. So this is an item um, where I guess it's being requested that uh, the permit for your additional 21 ta tables, should they be awarded to you, uh, would be required to have an annual renewal, but on the fifth year, I believe it comes before the council. Is, is that correct, the city manager, the way it would work? Council member Maxwell, do you well, want to just Council update them? Maxwell? Sure, I was actually going to, um, and I want to thank the administration and the mayor for working with me to create some language to better improve this ordinance to make sure it was, you know, both business friendly, but also, you know, a sense of accountability for long term. So I was going to make a motion, Council Member Bredefield, to amend this um, to where that five year review would only kick in if and when the state wide moratorium on casino license is lifted. Um, my understanding that hasn't been for some time. Um, but this language would give us, as a council, the flexibility to review any additional tables every five years, similar to what we do with alcohol ABCs council member. Those are every seven years. Cannabis CUPs are every two years. And this is just uh, following suit and saying every five years it will be reviewed, but that's only if and when the statewide moratorium is lifted. Okay, so... Um, to make that motion, Councilman Maxwell? I'll formally make that motion to make I'll, I'll second it. That and so the motion is, if the moratorium is lifted, that's correct, Council Member. Then it would come before the council in five years. 
but if the moratorium is not lifted, it will not come before the council. That's correct. Council member doesn't make um, a whole lot of sense to have it being reviewed if there's not any other players locally in the city to where these tables could even go to. And so we might as well be utilizing these tables to their full extent, create jobs, bring revenue to our city through taxes that we get on the tables. Um, and until such uh, moratorium is lifted, that will be the case. Okay, so um, Mr. Kirkland, uh, I was curious from your perspective what impact this resolution would have on you, be it either what is being proposed now at the last minute or what was being proposed before the change. Well, first of all, thank you for allowing us to speak on the topic and I appreciate the questions and I appreciate the effort from the uh, city manager, city staff and, and council members for looking at this. It was uh, when I saw the original draft of the amendment, it was uh, somewhat disconcerting because it precluded us from making long-term investments uh, as written uh, that we thought, you know, in our experience, uh, it, it's how you need to operate a card room successfully. Um, with my understanding, and I haven't seen the rewrite, but it's my understanding from what Councilmember Maxwell just said is that the uh, <clears throat> the amendment would apply to the 20 additional tables that were under consideration for later. The council awarded us 31 tables and approved our permit at the last council meeting. This would apply to the 20 additional ones and it would be uh, subject to the moratorium, which I believe is section 19963 or something of the California Gambling Control Act. If that's removed and the current moratorium goes through uh, January 2023, if for some reason that's removed, then we have four administrative re reviews of those 20 tables. And then on the fifth year, um, it's considered, we basically have to start from scratch. And it, I, with that, Councilmember Maxwell, did I articulate that correctly? Mr. Kirkland, I, that, that is spot on, but I do want to no, elaborate yeah. for my colleague as well. Um, after several discussions with the city attorney's office, um, you know, it was made aware to me that the city council does have the authority to grant up to an additional 11 tables on top of the 51 that are in circulation. Any more than that would have to go before the voters of the city of Fresno, but this ordinance would also apply to those 11 tables that historically have not been in circulation and could go to uh, Club One or a variety of other folks um, down the road as well. So just that small clarification. Were you able to catch that, council member? Yes, but okay. but the issue is now uh, are, are liquor stores coming before the council to be renewed and pot shops coming before the, because my understanding the pot shops go to the planning commission and if council member can yank it if they want, but they're not coming before the council. Yeah, I'm going to need to work with uh, staff to get you an answer on that. I apologize. I'm not sure the timing and the sequence of when those CUPs trigger and then time out and then we then we have to reconsider. I apologize. Okay, sorry. I, I don't think that's accurate what was said, but we, we can verify that. Um, Mr. Kirkland, so prior to the change um, that is being proposed now, the impact to your business, you, you were saying that you could not make investments. What, what did that mean? So uh, basically as written before, it was, um, we, we couldn't make long-term investments in our business. And our card room, um, we need to make significant investments investments in security and physical plant, whatever, to make it safe, secure, um, and also competitive and welcoming to guests. And with the uh, four-year administrative renewals and then the, the full uh, reset every five years, we couldn't have any confidence, whether it's buying a building, taking a mortgage, a lease, you know, our copier leases are seven years, for example, it's a, it's a, it, sort of a short term approach. And, you know, I'd already had, when we saw it, I already had discussions with uh, the property owner and said, you know, this is, you know, problematic for us. We can't continue here if this is the case. Uh, so it was, uh, it, you know, obviously we scrambled a little bit on that. I think we gave some, a little bit of feedback and uh, I, I think it's been amended here. Uh, in its current form, it uh, is more workable. It's my understanding that 31, we would not have to go through the administrative uh, or we'd not have to go through this process. We re renew uh, ministerially um, every year as we've done for the last 25 years. Uh, I understand council member uh, Maxwell's thinking on the 20 incremental tables. Uh, I 
I think there's a little bit of conflict between the city attorney's interpretation of the Gambling Control Act and the additional tables and what we're being told by you know, our folks that, that do that. So I'd like to maybe meet and confer on that at some point to, to sort out the, the difference in the thinking. Um, right now, it's our understanding there's up to two more tables available to the city of Fresno. But that said, the 20 incremental tables would require us to we renew administratively each of four years and have the hard reset in the fifth year. Uh, that is, it's not uh, great, but it's workable. And given our understanding of the moratorium, uh, I think it does let us take a little more long-term approach to, to what we're doing. But certainly as written before, you know, we wouldn't continue with the project. And I don't know where you put a card room. I don't, I don't think you put a card room in, in Fresno under a five-year time horizon. It's just not workable. Okay, so the way it was written before, it was not workable for you to pr continue to proceed is what you're saying. Yeah, it was, okay. it was so problematic. The, so this moratorium is reviewed January 2023. If that's lifted, what does that do for your operation if now the 20 tables, if they're granted in the 90 days or whenever they come back, what does that do for your operation? So, well, so it's my understanding, and, and again, um, City Manager or Council Member Maxwell can chime in on here. If, if just thinking that through, if in 2023 it were lifted, then we would have the uh, annual administrative review, and after the fifth year of where we want to start the, the the year process, we'd have to start from scratch on those. But again, if the if the moratorium's lifted, there's some other things that the city needs to do. It needs to go to a vote of the people, both for new for any additional tables, but also for another card room license. So it's not immediate that. It's not immediately obvious that there'd be another card row that, to that go through. So I think practically for us, we reapply for the 20 tables and then see how the moratorium, how it sorts out from there. Um, but it's, uh, and Council Member Maxwell or, or City Manager Squared, city fill in if my interpretation is incorrect on that. The city Manager, can I just clarify a point? I know at our last council meeting when we had a discussion, administration would bring forth a resolution to grant additional tables to Club One. Are you planning on putting any language in there that would uh, exempt Mr. Kirkland from having to pay all the hard fees all over again if the five-year cycle comes up? Correct. That's the discussion okay. we've had in preparing that resolution. Okay. Um, that sounds like something I'd be interested in hearing more about and probably something I could get. And we can meet with you and take you through it and show right. you. And same exactly. with the uh, applicant. Sure. Make it as easy as possible for Mr. Kirk. Uh, could you, could right. And the, the other thing I would um, just have been thinking about it practically. Uh, and I don't know if it's possible for us to see the amendment or how the, the process works on the on the review. But um, I appreciate that as as uh, Councilmember Maxwell made the motion. Um, but, you know, we'd, ha we'd start anticipating that hard set renewal probably in year four because, you know, it's not really cl clear what the timing would be as we saw it with this. We don't do it that frequently in the city, so there's always some new ground. And so we'd want to make sure that that was as seamless and uninterrupted as possible. What I wouldn't want to do is get there and say, oh, okay, sorry. And not that, you're, that it would be the city's fault or our fault, but, you know, we just don't understand the process enough. So there's some sort of interruption in the use of those tables. Um, so we'd be working with the city manager trying to figure out how to make that as seamless as possible. So the question, question I have for you, Mr. Kirkland, so how long were you, you personally operating downtown Club One? Uh, since February of 2008, so uh, About 12, 12 years. 12, 12 years, up, in, up until J July 2020. Okay, and were you operating the, all the 51 tables at, during that time? We operate 49 tables till 2012. We operate 51 from 2012 forward. Okay, so the issue becomes, I mean, if in fact there was a moratorium lifted and you lost the 20 tables, I don't know who's out there who would want the 20 tables. I mean, wouldn't that have an adverse impact on your operation? It, Obviously. It, will, it, it would, I mean, it would, you know, listen, anything that can, reduces our size and scope is gonna affect our ability to get back to full strength and you know, make the tax payments and, and do, get the employment we had before. But again, if the more terms lifted, we also need a, a vote of the people to add another card room. And frankly, if it's at the point where the more terms lifted, my sense is there's going to be a little more extensive overhaul of the Gambling Control Act because it's that's a serious enough issue for all the stakeholders, including the state, the tribes, card rooms, um, cities that have card rooms that that, that would get a fair bit of attention in Sacramento. 
and that's an understatement. Okay. <laughs> you see some but fireworks. <laughs> in terms of operating your business, yeah, it, yeah. It, I mean, you've been operating it for 12 years, 51 tables. Uh, I don't think there's a blemish on your record. The police have reviewed the, the uh, operation. Uh, you generate a million dollars a year to the city. Uh, the only thing you did was you moved to another location and now you potentially have to come back before the council in five years reviewing your 20 tables that weren't given to you when you made your initial application. And so in some sense, there is a bit of a cloud that you have to deal with that you didn't have to deal with before you moved. Uh, I appreciate that. It's more process. I mean, certainly the, certainly the city can amend an ordinance. I mean, we're like anyone, we're entitled to due process and equal treatment and what have you. We, we, when we started this process uh, in talking with city management, uh, felt like, okay, this is, doesn't happen that frequently. There are extenuating circumstances of COVID and our move and the whole bit. So um, it, it, is a, it is different than what we had when we closed um, and it's unfortunate, I understand what's going on. Um, would I prefer just to have all 51? Of course, right? But I, um, oh, listen, we've always felt like we've, we're in partnership with the city and we've had a long standing, very productive, very good relationship with the city. I felt over the course of the last maybe six or nine months where that's been, you know, a little more friction, a little more adversarial. Uh, and we certainly want to get back to where we're just, you know, operating off the radar, serving good food and shipping you folks a good check every month. Well, so, uh, and, that's and you, our goal. And you mentioned equal treatment, and I think that's very correct because I don't think you've been treated equally as other people have been treated. Yeah. I don't think we have this process in place, uh, city manager, where you know they're coming five years with a with a review from the city council to do an up or down on an operation. Here it's twenty tables, unless you have something. And, and for the. Uh, for the um, for the CUPs, there is a seven-year cycle. Mm -hmm. It goes to the planning director. Planning. If the planning director uh, decision is not supported, then it comes to the council. Right. It doesn't come to the city council. It goes to the planning director, and a council member can pull it before the city council. So this is a complete change. This is not done before. City manager. And it's only happening here with Club One. So there isn't an equal treatment. He certainly hasn't been treated equally. And I want to give just a brief synopsis of how that is very clear. Can I ask a clarifying question first? Yes, Council go Member? ahead. City manager, for those CUPs that get renewed either for alcohol or cannabis, it was mentioned that we have the authority to, to pool those. For historic purposes, for card rooms, when they were ministerially approved year after year, did council have that same ability to pull those and say, hey, we want to take a closer look and review those? No, that, 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 those, didn't, those were administer, administered, right. police department, and, uh, and CUP, that. and the gambling, and so those are the people that we, we took the input from. Duly noted, thank you. Okay, so it, it is very different, and this, this motion is very different, even with this new change to it with, uh, if the moratorium is lifted. Difference in equal treatment, June 18th, 2021, you had Boots in the Park in your district at Granite Park concerts. Um, Terrence Frazier and a promoter put on the concert. There were tremendous problems with Boots in the Park in the neighborhoods. The people complained about all of the parking that took place. And that's, that's a fact. That's June 18th. One week later, council is a, has a hearing. We're scheduled again to give Terrence Frazier $4.3 million that is set aside from a $5 million put into a budget. He, his bills of $2.3 million were going to be paid. We were going to front him $2 billion on a billboard contract. City attorney, is this within the point of order, the scope of this? Yes, it is. Topic? In consideration of legislative item, yes, you can discuss. Uh, uh, Councilmember Maxwell, let's let Councilmember Betterfield go through his. Thank speech, you very and then much. The mayor wants to speak, and then we can come back and wrap it up, because I, I think we're there. Because I am going to get equal treatment here. Not one penny needed to be paid to Terrence Frazier, and the only reason why we, he didn't get $4.3 million was because a letter was received the day before the council meeting from DA Smith Camp saying she was investigating the city council for Brown Act violations related to Granite Park. The next day, $5 million was moved out of the budget and the item was pulled from the agenda. Of course, the day before this council was poised to give him $4.3 million, he held a fundraiser at his home for a council member. 
July 29th, Club One came before this council seeking approval for their 51 tables. This is after they spent months paying $40,000 in fees, meeting all of the requirements. Uh, 70 people in the chamber came here and said, I want to go back to work for Club One. I've been locked out. By the way, many on this council threw them out of work with lockdowns. Council Member Maxwell uh, said that uh, Mr. Kirkland made a major error in coming before this council without having held a community meeting. He told them, you need to go knock on doors. Now, he could have told them three months ago before that to go do a community meeting. He could have told them two months ago, one month ago. He waited till he showed up here. Being the good operator that he is, he went back. The city manager held a community meeting August 5th uh, with Club One, and the only complaints were about parking related to Boots in the Park, not about Club One, not about their moving there, and people were very angry about the parking. Now, is that is that accurate? You held the, the community meeting. We, we, the, the number one complaints we got were related to Boots in the Park, but we also received concerns about um, just people, the, the traffic and the presence of that in the neighborhood, but the specific things that people were complaining about was Boots in the Park and the parking. Okay, again, speaking to equal treatment, August 19th, Club One comes back after the community meeting to council, having complied with the community meeting with essentially no complaints about Club One. Council member Maxwell gives the uh, awards 31 tables, not 51, uh, though uh, Mr. Kirkland's operated 51 tables for 12 years and has done so again with a record that is completely unblemished He's been a f uh, phenomenal businessman, a great community leader, and somebody who goes and rescues animals. He's been doing it. It's his passion. This is the man who got the treatment uh, as he did over the last several months. Mr. Maxwell said, I will let you come back in 90 days for your other 20 tables, and we'll see if, quote, you're a good actor, end quote. Though Mayor Dyer said he respected Maxwell's decision and motion, I don't and I didn't. Same day, August 19th, uh, Mr. Maxwell passes a resolution that skims 12% off of Club One revenues for a community center that he said in his resolution he wanted to go to. The community center does not exist. Oh, and he also said the 12%, which is about $100,000, should go for parks within 1,000 feet of Club One. The only park within 1,000 feet of Club One is the baseball fields that are operated by Mr. Frazier. He put in there that they had to be open to the public free of charge. Currently, they are not. But the deal that was supposed to be two months ago where he was getting $4.3 million would have opened up his parks free of charge. And that could change any day with any motion at any time. So that's how uh, he was treated over the last two months. So in summary, Club One has had 12-year history under Kyle Kirkland's leadership of outstanding business operations, many years of community service rescuing animals. Revenues from his business operation to the city is over $1 million annually. The city council, one, closed his business during the pandemic and threw, threw out 300 em employees. He tries to reopen, pays his $40,000 fees, hundreds of thousands of dollars to refurbish the site in the building at Granite Park. Comes to City Hall, and he and his employees are treated horribly. The 11th hour, he's told, go have a community meeting, which delays his opening for at least two weeks and keeps people out of work. Then he comes back. He's allowed 31 tables, which keeps 130 people out of work because of those additional 20 tables he still has not received. Then he's told to come back in three months to see if you're a good actor. Then they skim 12% of tax revenues to be held 1,000 feet of Club One in order to help one person, uh, Mr. Frazier, that's the only person it can help. In contrast, different treatment, not equal treatment, Boots in the Park operated by Mr. Frazier on June 18, 21 causes all kinds of parking problems. What happens? Nothing. No community meetings, no restrictions imposed on his operation like they're doing to Mr. Kirkland in terms of 20 ta tables. No motions to skim off profits off of boot, Boots in the Park, not 12%, not 50%. Mr. Frazier's just given a new date for Boots in the Park on September 10th, 2021. Uh, this has been nothing but further harassment, 
of Club One, Mr. Kirkland has been treated horribly, shamefully, and in a disgraceful manner. And what, has, what this motion has done that was finally changed at the last minute meant that he would have to come before this council over the next five years and, in essence, have that hanging over his head, that hatchet hanging over his head that he would lose his 20 tables. Now, why would you do that? I mean, we know why the 12% would be done. That's to help out a friend at Granite Park. Well, frankly, I think, and it's my opinion, that this was to basically to shake down Mr. Kirkland for donations over the next four or five years, and that's my opinion, because this makes no sense. And all I can tell you, as I've said for the last two years, the stench continues, and it's reflected here, and it's been led by Mr. Maxwell with this atrocious treatment of one of the best businessmen we've had in our city with an unblemished record who's running a clean operation, and all he wanted to do was open his business, reopen it, and have 300 employees come back. And you, Mr. Maxwell, who've never held a private sector job, wouldn't know about a business if it landed on you, have treated him disgracefully, and you should be ashamed of yourself. Mayor, do you want to say a few words and then we'll wrap up, move on? God, I don't know if I want to get in uh, this fray after that. Mayor, just speak <laughs> calmly because that makes people upset. Okay. Um, let, let me just uh, say this. I, number one, I do appreciate uh, Kyle Kirkland and, and the way that he has operated Club One a Casino uh, uh, over all these years. Uh, as I said last council meeting, uh, as the former police chief and having the opportunity to interact with our vice unit on a regular basis who uh, not only did inspections but uh, did all the background checks on um, employees, anyone that was in the facility, and a stellar business operation uh, the entire time. And that came from our, our vice folks. In fact, uh, one of our former vice officer is head of security for Club One. Richard Denise and continues to do a great job. So in my mind, there's no question about um, how he operates uh, uh, his business. Uh, in terms of the card uh, tables, I want to thank uh, Councilmember Maxwell for willingness uh, yesterday to, to amend that um, resolution so we could, um, in fact, state that uh, this would not occur uh, without the uh, moratorium being lifted. Uh, Having some insight in terms of how um, that moratorium came about, uh, I do not personally think that moratorium will ever be lifted. Uh, in fact, the last vote, I think there was only two people out of the entire legislature that uh, voted to lift it. So I do not see that happen in the future. Um, and so that is good news for us not having to do the, uh, the five-year uh, review. Uh, we will be coming back to council. The uh, city manager will be very soon, I believe September 16th. Uh, requesting the council to award the additional uh, not only 20 tables uh, but any other tables that we uh, are legally able to um, offer to Club One Casino that are not being utilized now by the city of Fresno. I don't know if that is two tables or 11 tables, I've heard both, but I think the way we would want to uh, word the resolution is that um, any, any tables that are available in the city of Fresno above the 31 we would want to uh, recommend to this council that they be awarded to um, Mr. Kirkland and I did have a conversation with him uh, a couple of times yesterday as well as last night and uh, he would obviously be more than willing to um, operate those tables. Um, so with that I just want to um, say thank you uh, Mr. Kirkland for your ongoing dedication and that million dollars a year and we hope it increases at Granite Park. Thank you Mayor. Uh, Councilmember Arias, do you want to throw some gasoline on this or some water? I do. Just a little bit of, a, of calm, collective, articulant um, comments that I'm sure will make some people mad because they expect people that, that look like <laughs> me to lose their composure. But when Terry Slidek does it, you know, there's excuses for him. Um, you know, Council, what, what I heard last meeting was that we had not exercised this muscle on awarding card rooms in 25 years. And we all um, recognize that there are some improvements that could be made. Everything from only noticing people within 300 feet to going into the actual residential neighborhood. Um, and conditional use permits are pretty normal. I've also heard from the business community that they're all pro-competition. None of them want, want us to engage in a monopoly for one owner of a whole industry. The proposal simply gives us the opportunity 
if and when the state would allow it and the voters would approve it, that there'd be competition in this industry. Mr. Kirkland has been a good operator in my district, but I'm getting very uncomfortable by these Club One conversations where one owner can essentially dictate to this body what the policy should be for the direct benefit of his operations. Imagine if we allowed a cannabis company to come before this dais and tell us how the policy should be changed for their profit model to work better in their benefit. We would say that that's the role of this body with the advice of the administration, not going to that deep conversation. So just to let you know, I'm getting very uncomfortable that we're allowing one owner, as good as a guy as he is, and a business owner, to get very specific on what he wants in a citywide policy that in the future may apply to others. Um, and the only reason reasoning I hear is because it would financially benefit his operation. Just as a reminder, the cannabis license holders, their license re, uh, expires every year. It costs 1.5 million to open an, a, a retail spot. And they're taking a risk, because if year two, this body and the administration finds that they're not good operators, they're at risk. Their conditional use permits also expire, and they're subject to the administration and others, and we were intentional in that to ensure that the industry would be responsive to the neighborhoods and the areas in which they're operating. And in terms of equal treatment, I think these public discussions have been more than equal to the applicant. Matter of fact, I've never seen us allow an applicant or a business owner that much time and space and room to feed a potential policy that would impact their operations. Um, I, I also would, would, would caution us with, we have been, and some have been very unequal in the references to the operators of Granite Park. I think we're getting close to going out of our way as a city to not only criticize, but to be discriminatory in some of the comments that are being made. So let's keep this on what, what it's about. It's a citywide policy that takes into account the input of the operator, the guidance of the administration, and the priorities of this body for the benefit of the whole industry and the city. Just because somebody generates a million dollars doesn't mean that they get to dictate the policy that they're required to follow. Cannabis is gonna generate 10 million. They should not dictate the policy and the limitations that this body puts in, 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 in place for the benefit of the city. Um, so I appreciate that the conversation. Again, Mr. Kirkland's been a good operator in my district. I'm fully you know, um, confident that he'll be a good operator, but putting limitations on CUPs are not new. It's a good practice for a city and it's done frequently across multiple industries in the city. Um, and we have been more than accommodating to Mr. Kirkland, and he's earned it, being a good operator, but he's also not a council member that gets to prescribe policy for a whole industry. Councilmember Member Um Thanks, so uh, if I say anything that's already been said before, forgive me, I tend to tune out when the debate gets to this point. Gasoline um, or water? Water, mm -hmm. neither, just. <laughs> You know, let's have the fire chief come in here and help us. Um, you, you know, I think that we need to focus on the real issue at hand. I'm going to ask some questions, but I just want to add, look, I understand there's conflict in this issue. Councilmember Rutterfeld has made points, and this is, he made some points that were a bit personal towards Councilmember Maxwell. They can work it out. There's no need to compare, bring up other people and try to marginalize Councilmember Rutterfeld. I disagree with him at times. We've had sparks up here. But the fact is, every one of us has an equal vote. We have a right to speak. We may not agree, but we've got to find ways to work together, and I hope that you guys can actually sit and work that out. Now, talking about this issue at hand, um, this type of talk and the way this works, this is actually what I think hurts regular Fresnans the most because this is what discourages people from investing in this city. 
Um, on the one hand, we're saying Mr. Kirkland is this great person who, based on the evidence I've seen, uh, you know, um, I have no reason to believe otherwise. He is a good operator. Um, and that's just based on the facts. But then it looks like he's being treated by the process itself. I'm not saying it's one person. It is not one person. The process is treating him unfairly. So for appearance's sake, I think that there may be a solution here. Now, this new policy 1AA, which is a baseline policy, so if the moratorium is lifted in the future council member, we will have this policy across the board for the industry. Got it. So what happens, because last time, I'm very sensitive, it's your district, we're coming back in 90 days, uh, or less than 90 days now, to consider the other 20. Where do those 20 fall in this policy? I know the policy isn't activated unless the moratorium is lifted. Um, first off, do we know if the moratorium is lifted, if we will get a higher allocation for tables? I mean, it's all hypothetical. I highly doubt that's ever going to happen. Does anybody Listen, have any? Uh, I, I could chime in if okay. you want some help. Yeah, the, the, but the moratorium is lifted. There's not an automatic uh, lifting of, that, that lifts the moratorium on the issuance of state licenses. Uh, there still is the, you need both a state and a local license to operate for the city of Fresno to add additional car rooms the way the law is written now. It's my understanding that the city would have to go to a vote of the people uh, and to get either an additional car room license or car room licenses uh, or additional tables beyond what's allowed right now by law. So it's if the moratorium's lifted, it's not automatic that the city has more tables or that there's more car rooms. There's still um, the Gambling Control Act provides that the, you must the, the uh, local jurisdiction must go to vote the people. But it would seem that if that moratorium were lifted, this was all part of the same chunk of the Gambling Control Act. It would seem that there was be a more major overhaul in place at that point. So that's how it's written right now. If the moratorium were lifted. In, January 2023, that's well, my While I have you on the line, Mr. Kirkland, let me ask you a question, um, and uh, if anyone else wants to chime in as well. There, if, if let's say an operator in your industry, whether it's in the city of Fresno, city of Clovis, anywhere, commits certain egregious acts that are illegal. I mean, I would assume you're more afraid of the gaming commission than us, but- I'm a, I'm a, Listen, I'm afraid of the back with squad car. <laughs> Right. right. Not, I don't want to end up there. Thank you. But, but my question is, if that was to happen in your industry, do yeah. municipalities have the power to stop your op any operation that does commit so, an egregious act? Yeah. So um, a couple of things. I mean, certainly the the ordinance is written allows you to folks to terminate us for cause. Uh, we answer to a lot of folks. Uh, you know the. the um, California Gambling Control Commission, the Bureau of Gambling Control, FinCEN, which is the IRS uh, and money laundering folks, um, Health, you know, all the Fresno PD and the city council. So there's certainly a lot of folks that we have to um, keep pleased with us going toward. Uh, and the ordinance as written right now allows for you, if, you know, we step by line that you can terminate us for cause. So we do something that's you know, inconsistent with safe operation of the city or whatever's listed in the ordinance, you can terminate us for a cause. Uh, now, how that sorts out with lawyers or whatever, I'm not, I haven't really, I'm, I've been trying to stay away from that. So not really looking at triggering those things. So, uh, and I don't want our folks to either, but I don't know how that really unfolds if, if things got out of line. I do know that um, the city did have two card rooms back in the day. Both of them got out of line, one with the city, one with the state, they were shut down. The city made a determination that they thought, and PD and Fresno Vice made a determination that was easier to supervise one card room and get one check. Uh, and that, with respect to, to Council Member Arias' concerns about competition, that, was a, that wasn't something we put in place. That was something that predated us. Um, it's, it's worked. I'm not saying, you know, I'm a, I'm a private enterprise guy and into competition, but this was something that was put in place uh, years ago. Um, so those licenses no longer exist. There's only one in the state. And, you know, the enforcement of that is quick. I think that those licensors were removed and certainly shut down in short order, that one of the folks that predated us had a issue with the tax authorities uh, and he lost his license, which is part of the reason we were able to purchase Club One back in 2008. So it, there is precedent for someone losing their license in the city of Fresno. And I would say this too for with Council Member Arias, I, um, 
you know, it's certainly not our intention to dictate the policy. All we've been saying throughout this process is, hey, we've been doing this for a while and have a pretty good base of knowledge and can certainly turn you on to experts and stuff and show you, you know, what we've seen in other jurisdictions. I'm president of the California Gaming Association. We have lots of folks that work with us. Um, I, I get that there's self-interest. There's certainly a self-interest in, in something that covers us in the city, but there are also best practices throughout the state. And so we've offered that up to the city manager and others to say, listen, if you, you know, we're happy to turn you on to, to things so you can see how to, if, if you're ready to update the ordinance. Uh, but it, it seems like this is a little bit on the fly here because we're applying. And it seems like at some point, maybe we want to sit back and do a workshop and have, you know, sort of a, uh, more measured approach to it, right? I, I definitely understand that given the process that's here right now, the council wants to put in some some protections. Uh, appreciate that, but also would like you to know that you know there are resources out there to help sort through some of this stuff. I have a follow up, but if you want to go ahead and before I go, go sure. ahead. Council Member Carbasi, I think I'm following your train of thought here. You know what? You know what forms of control and accountability are built into place right. and i think you're right and mr kirkland hit the nail on the head there are forms of accountability if there's a lot of crime going on sure if there's tax evasion going on but i don't think that covers necessarily all the bases which i'm trying to address with this ordinance mm -hmm. and if i could just provide um, for means of clarity uh, an analogy uh, sure. to try to simplify this you know in a sense we're, we're giving away a sense of property that the city has control over right now and, you know, put the analogy to something if this were a different form of property. Let's say we were giving away a house. We have a housing crisis. We can't house people fast enough. We want to give something away um, with the results of getting people housed. And what would happen if we gave a house away and the person we gave it to didn't live in it, they didn't lease it out, they were just kind of sitting on it, and there was nothing that you could do? Well, that's something similar to what I'm trying to do with this ordinance. You know, let's say we give away 51 tables and only, you know, our purpose there is to create jobs and to create tax revenue for our city. What happens if similar to, you know, sitting on a house property, somebody sits on 30 tables. They're not creating jobs with those tables. They're not creating tax revenue for our city when we could be giving that to somebody else that would do that. And I'm not saying Mr. Kirkland has ever been guilty of that. But as we know, Mr. Kirkland may not be around the scene forever. 10 years from now, 20 years well, from now. Do you know something I don't, Council Member? <laughs> I, I, I wish you a long, healthy life, Mr. Kirkland. But, uh, you know, sell, if you were to sell it there, I think that's what he's getting at. Sure. Yeah, right. What may happen to the ownership? And we have to take that into consideration that Mr. Kirkland may not always be around in the game industry. And we have to create uh, safeguards and accountability which I don't think, you know, the FBI or the tax, the people that come after tax evasions, they don't cover those bases. Right. And the only folks that would be able to cover those bases is us as a council. And I think we have to make a decision that's best for the city of Fresno as the representatives of the city. So I hope that clarifies, I know it's kind of a drawn out analogy, but I, I think you're right. There are forms of accountability in place. I don't think all the bases are covered because it's been 40, 50 years since right. these rules have been written. So I follow your train of thought. I actually am not against the policy itself. What I'm concerned about and what I wanted to work out, I'm trying to find a way to support this. I think that if we had multiple operators like we're talking about with the cannabis industry, um, I, I get it because we set a baseline and now we have the applications going through. My concern is this all kind of happened together where we have a particular applicant, whoever that person is, in this case it's Mr. Kirkland for this industry, and I feel like the bar was set here, and then for the 20 tables, it's being changed. What I'm trying to, to see, because if the moratorium's lifted and we can have multiple operators, we're probably gonna be able to have more tables, but this is all hypothetical. So is the, the policy, that's if the moratorium's lifted. It's good to have a policy, not debating that. What I'm trying to get at is appearances do matter. To keep things kosher, I think it may be prudent either to wait until we approve the remaining tables, or I don't necessarily need to do that. We can vote today. I'd like to support this, but I'd like to make sure for this particular operation, because they're already in process, the 51 tables are exempt from this policy. And that's where I'm getting at. I know you might have some reservations about that, so I want to discuss that here, but that's my line of thinking right now. It solves the issue of appearances, and it basically treats him based on the standard that was already set. That, that's where I'm getting at. I, I appreciate those comments, Council Member. I, I would hesitate to go that far if we exempt all 51 tables, which is pretty much 
the total amount that we have citywide, and we run into the hypothetical issue that I, I drew out, I mean, what do you do? There's no more tables to issue unless you go before the voters of the city of Fresno. That is the only way to add additional tables. Which we did with, good point, which we did with cannabis. And I think Councilman Brett is saying, yes, there's 11 more tables potentially, but that won't be enough for a single operation typically. Right, that's our city attorney's opinion. I know Mr. Kirkland's we're opinion still is that there's right. maybe two tables. Right. So we're seeking clarity on that, but we know it's not enough to operate a business. Right. right. I, I get your point. Um, I think that, I think we're just a little bit separated here. I get your point. I'm trying to find a way. It's just I, I, I want to make sure we're following logic and a reasonable set of rules. I'm more comfortable exempting these 51. There are safeguards in place because if the policy comes into effect, I'm pretty sure the same way the city did with cannabis, um, we do the same thing again with, and please go ahead. I might be able to meet you halfway there, council member. There's, sure. there's some number of tables um, that are not issued. They're not floating out there like the additional 51 tables. I would still prefer to have the, the, Kyle, Mr. Kirkland, have the 31 tables grandfathered into existing law mm -hmm. and all future tables under this new proposed ordinance. But, you know, out of a sign of good faith, you know, if we're just sitting on those tables that are not issued and that's something that Club One can make a profit off of, hire more people for, then I would be open to the discussion of introducing those um, when it comes time to assigning more tables to Club One down the road. Elaborate sure. on that. So let's say the 90 days we come forward and we're going to talk about the additional 20 tables. Would there, is, is there something different? I'm sorry, I didn't catch that part. There are a X amount of tables that are not in circulation that we're sitting on. We're Currently. trying to figure out what that exact number is. Our city attorney believes that number is 11. If it's the belief of Club One that they'd be able to actively operate those tables too, because right now we're not making any profit on those tables and we haven't been for a number of decades. If that's Club One's... Um, opinion that they could generate some sort of revenue, I'd be open to having that discussion too, but having it under this new ordinance council member so that it could be some sort of oversight, but it, granting additional tables as a sign of good faith. Right. We want to do business with Club One. Uh, we want him to create more jobs and we want more tax revenue for sure. a city that we haven't been receiving. Sure. So I'd be willing to meet you halfway on that. So you're talking can, about can I, the 11, not just, the 20. Cause I'm more, I don't, I don't know about the 11. In addition to. Yeah. I'm more concerned about the 20 just cause I, I think when they originally applied, that's what they went for. 40, 30. I, I appreciate what you're trying to do, but, um, the original application was for 51 tables. Is that correct? Uh, Manager? Correct. Yes, okay. correct. That's why I'm concerned. They applied for this, and then these are all changing. That's where I'm at. Yeah, um, Councilmember Carbasi and, and Councilmember, so I've heard the conversation, okay. and, and I think it's pretty clear that th there is no space to move into. Um, I think people made up how they're going to vote about 15 minutes ago. I don't think anybody's going to convince anybody otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, so if you have any more clarification questions about the policy, if not, I think it's it's time to, to, to move on and, and vote. Okay, and because items. of the Brown Act, we weren't able to talk about this, but I appreciate you having this conversation with me out here, Council Member. Sure, and I would just like to did, remind did, did that answer your question? Did you get your yeah, questions answered? Yeah, I think I, think I yeah. understand. Okay. Yeah. Council Member Bredefeld, did you have one last uh, question for this? Well, we were just looking at, uh, uh, um, what, what is it called? In 500 Club. Club. The 500 club that they have uh, about seven tables. I think they may be using. There may be uh, available 18. So I know we've all of a sudden have a lot of uh, card room experts up here as to how many tables you need to operate a business. But what was we your have question, 11. Councilman Burtefield? I'm sorry. What was the question? The, the que there was some statement about if there's 11. Ta uh, there's some uh, belief that if you have 11 tables which are outstanding, that a business could not use those 11 tables, and that's simply not accurate just I, based on the uh, uh, okay. card room in Clovis. I made that statement. To be fair, you're right. Let's ask uh, Mr. Kirkland. Well, how, how, council members, how, how, is, how is that relevant to well, the conversation? Well, they were making the argument about uh, the moratorium, and he wanted it, all these 51 tables exempt, and then the argument came back, well, I you know, you can't use Because if we 11. sit back here and try to correct each other, I think we're going to go No, all it's night. not trying to correct anybody. It's, it's just larger, pointing out. The larger President Chavez, can, can I just make a clarification? Sure. Mr. Chavez. Kirkland, you are the card room expert. If you could just answer well, that question well, so we can know, move I'll on. Do, I'll do it quickly for you. It is Very quickly, make please. Money. It, it, yes, sir. It is possible to make money for either a card room in the state exists with between anywhere from one to 270 tables. There are successful card rooms with 10 or fewer. Uh, I would su suggest that... Uh, you certainly need some critical mass. That was a determination that the city had, you know, decades ago. 
if uh, when they were thinking about building a compliance or what have you, but a one-off operator could operate with fewer tables. But is it important for this council to understand that even if the moratorium were lifted, you would not only have to uh, go back to the people, yes, if you want to add more tables, but you'd have to go back to to add another car group because it's not automatically granted at the local level. It would, the moratorium be lifted at the state level, but at the local level, the, the city is still charged with going to the vote of the people to get either additional card rooms approved or uh, additional tables. Yeah, thank, thank you for that clarifying question. Uh, all right, I think we're ready to vote. Councilmember Maxwell, you made the motion. I second it. Any opposition? Well, I Council, wanna, can we clarify also, what the motion is now? Yeah, I want Councilmember Maxwell. Motion to amend my original ordinance language to include language that would only set this into motion if and when the statewide moratorium is lifted. Did you capture that, City Attorney? Well, and also, Kurt? there was a discussion about whether this would apply to all 51 tables. Um, I mean, the first 51 tables would be exempt, or this applies to the 20 additional potential tables that may be awarded. I don't think a motion was made for that, City Attorney. Okay, um, it's what's in the it's what's in the language codified that you okay. wrote, City Attorney. That's that's what the motion Got was, it. but just with the amendment that Councilmember Maxwell described. So this would apply only to additional future. That's tables, correct. Not the first 31. <laughs> correct, City Clerk. Did you get that for the record? All right. Any opposition? I'm opposed. All right, two oppositions. Thank you. We're going to move on. All right, let's do item one. Do we have time to do closed session real quick for item one Y and then come back and vote, City Attorney? Or that is purely the real estate discussion. Uh, Councilmember Soria and the administration. I think it they could weigh in on that. Uh, is that going to be a long? No, shouldn't be long. No. For, for us to have the discussion in the back about what, what just the expectation you, you, we have, we want to share. You want you clarity, right? Yep, I want that. clarity. Let, let's do the closed session real quick in the back, and we'll come back and, and vote on this item. I don't think there'll be a lot of discussion. This is a Zoom thing, right? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. So we're going to do closed just session the, just on item one Y, and then come back in here immediately afterwards. Uh, I would suggest we do it at. Let, one, let, we'll come 30. back right after lunch and, and vote on it. Okay. okay. So the, the one closed session we're looking at now is Conference Real Property Negotiator concerning 2004 North Van S Boulevard.
council member drops his sandwich that he hid underneath his coat. Um, uh, city uh, attorney, I think procedurally we just had an outstanding item, which was one Y, but I believe uh, we addressed that in Councilwoman Sora. You want to just remove that from the yeah, agenda? Yeah, it will be withdrawn from the agenda. All right, Thank is you. there a consensus? We remove it since we addressed it. I don't see any opposition. All right, let's move on to item, let's see, 2A and 2B are already taken care of. Let's go to 2C, which is a hearing to adopt uh, resolution ordinance uh, CFD number 11. I believe this is in Council District 1. Um, do we have staff here to answer questions if necessary? Council, I'm sorry, this is in your district. It's uh, 2C, it's just a CFD uh, number 11. Do you want to make a motion or do you have questions? I will make the motion. All right, motion made by Councilman Soria, seconded by Councilmember Bredefeld. Go out to the public. Do we have anybody punched up, city clerk, to speak on this? No, we do not. All right, I'll close that portion. Motion's been made, second. Any opposition? Seeing none, motion carries. Let's go to item 2D, 1005, and this is also in Council District 1. I believe this is a consideration of a vesting tentative track map. Councilwoman Soria. Thank you, Council President. Um, I know that, just for the record, um, D.R. Horton has submitted a letter of a voluntary condition of a small um, park, a green space within a Stubbs Street. Um, you guys should all have gotten a copy of that. Um, I do want to uh, thank um, city staff and then also um, the developer for meeting with us and working with us um, as they're moving through the process. Um, so all of the information is reflected and um, I am supportive um, as um, is stated in the, in the submission of the letter with, which adds this green space in that um, development. Um, that will be maintained by the CD, CFD and then also um, the developer did agree and thought that, um, that it would be important that in the future development up north, this is west of the 99, um, will be conditioned to remove that street, that stub street, and incorporate the new park green space within the, the new development. And, you know, who knows when that will be, but they know that those are kind of the future plans. Um, I don't know if the council has any questions, but I am good with it. I've been working with the developers, and I'm ready to make a motion. You want to make a motion, Councilman Soria? Yeah, ready to make a motion. Motion to motion. approve. Seconded by Councilman Bredefell. Councilman Rodriguez, are you punched up? There's c city staff that oh. wants to. Oh. Oh, good afternoon, Council uh, President, Council Members. Chris Lang from Planning and Development Department. Um, planning staff would like to read uh, two conditions into the record oh. regarding the modifications sure. uh, proposed by the, the applicant. Um, one, the stub street located to the northwest of the map shall be dedicated to the city for purposes of public street and interim open space purposes. And then the second condition, uh, the developer shall provide written notice to all prospective buyers within the subdivision that the open space is intended for future roadway purposes. Perfect. Thank you, Thank Thank you. you for that, staff. Com uh, Councilwoman Soria made the motion, seconded by Councilman Bredefeld. Let me actually go out to the public. Anybody in the public queued up to speak? Uh, yes, Lisa Flores. Hi, Ms. Flores, you'll have three minutes. Is she on mute? Yes. Can you unmute okay. yourself, Ms. Lopez? Flores, um, it's Ms. Flores. Um, in, yeah, she caught that. Go ahead, Ms. Flores. Yes, I did catch that. I'll, I'll give you an extra um, 30 seconds for that boo-boo. Okay, well, I won't need that that much. Um, well, my first um, comment is, in the future, we, as you go through the process of the agenda, could you let us know what it is? Because I'm having a hard time finding the agenda online, that's, but that's just me. Um, second, um, I think it's a very good thing to think about open space and green space as west of, uh, west of the 99 and District 1 gets developed. You know, I have been a long proponent of more green space and um, a better layout plan of the area as well as, you know, creating a central business district there as well um, and just not, you know, um, liquor stores or um, strip malls at the corner. We need something more significant. So I think this is a step in the right direction. Thank you. All right, thank you for that. Uh, now close the public 
common portion. Motion was made, second, any opposition? Seeing none, motion carries. Let's go to item 3A, and that's under general admin. We got a workshop on SB 1383. Who do we have from staff that's gonna present on that? Director Carbajal? Director Carbajal. All right. Good afternoon, Council. Mike Carbajal, Director of Public Utilities. And while we're getting that up on the screen, I'll just go ahead and get started. So today I'm gonna to provide a brief overview of Senate Bill 1383, which establishes a statewide target for uh, reducing short-lived climate pollution pollutants in California. Um, SB 1383 is the most significant waste reduction mandate to be adopted in the last 30 years. Uh, it's a significant policy. It's got legal implications um, at the state and local government level. So if we can go to the next slide. So looking at the requirements, uh, we can see that uh, 1383 builds upon the mandate, uh, mandatory commercial organics recycling law. Um, the city of Fresno has been implementing this law since 2016. And that's been on the commercial solid waste side. We've been doing that with Republic Services as well as Mid Valley Disposal. So they are our franchise haulers that we've partnered with um, for commercial solid waste service. Uh, 1383 set an interim 50% reduction target in landfill organic waste for 2020. And then it furthers that to 75% by 2025. So. Uh, just for perspective, California disposes of approximately 27 million tons of organic waste annually, so a 75% reduction is 20, about 20 million tons of material that we've got to divert from the landfill, find a place to put it, process it, reuse it in a short period of time. Uh, additionally, as part of the disposal reduction targets, uh, the legislature has directed CalRecycle to increase edible food recovery by, by 20%. And so food edible or, or um, food waste makes up about 18% of California's uh, waste stream. And so right now we don't really know how much of that food waste is edible. Uh, there are studies that are underway right now to really determine that. Uh, but what we do know is that if the food is edible, then uh, there is a need and it should be diverted for those purposes. So if we go to the next slide. Looking at the key jurisdiction dates by January 1st, 2021. So what rolls up under that date? Provide organics collection service to all residents and businesses. Uh, establish an edible food recovery program. Initiate education and outreach efforts. Uh, meet procurement requirements and undergo capacity planning. So we'll look at each one of those at a little higher level further on in the presentation. And January 1st, 2024 is significant. That's when we will begin to monitor compliance and conduct enforcement actions against non-compliant entities. So next slide. So taking a look at those jurisdictional responsibilities. Hey Mike, so, question, yes. can you go back to that slide? So next year we're gonna have to provide organics collection service. Right, so. Um, what does so, that mean? So we'll get so into what that. Are we gonna, what, what, is a plan already? Are you guys working on a plan? Well, that's the thing. So we're doing an overview. There are a number of things we need to be doing, um, some of which you know it, we would have liked to have been started earlier on. But we have a why good foundation. We, so we why didn't we start earlier? Because we're already at the end of 2021 instead so, of 2022. So some of those items include working with our franchise haulers. So on the commercial side, we've got a, a, a big head start on that. On the residential side, uh, we have a good foundation because we have a three-cart system, and that's something I was going to point out here later on in the presentation. So we do have the three-cart system. Not a lot of agencies have that. Uh, but for the purposes of these new regulations, it's about transitioning our customers on the collection side to move their food waste from the gray cart to the green cart and working with our service providers to make sure they can process the that green, material. The green, the one where all the... Like the grass and all the That's out, correct. outside so, yard? Yep, green waste, wood waste, fiber, um, our biosolids that are generated at the landfill, all of those materials are organic waste. For our residential customers, the biggest piece of that is food waste, which right now and historically has been put it in the gray cart, 
we need to shift them over to the green card. Uh -huh. And then we make sure Can our service providers- Can we already providers, do that? Uh, so that's the piece that we are working on. We need, an, we need uh, a, an ordinance that we are looking to bring forth in the next um, few months. No, but as a customer, like for example myself, could I put the food waste in the green cart? Uh, you, can, you can do that. You can put it in the green cart. And that's one of the efforts that we're going to be moved forward with here in the near future to get okay. all of our customers. And there's 114,000 accounts, and we've got to get an education, an outreach program in place, and we have to put together an enforcement program as well. So we've brought on compliance officers that we look to deploy for those efforts going forward. Um, is there funding that the state is rolling out as part of this requirement, or is just we have to kind of absorb it within the rate structure that we have? I, I'm gonna say it's an unfunded mandate at yeah. this point. I'm looking back, yeah. So unfunded mandate. Um, it will have implications on our future rates going forward. We are going to look for every opportunity to utilize um, grants as they are available. Uh, but this is a huge undertaking up and down the state. There's going to be a lot of agencies that are going to have uh, a huge challenge to get in compliance. Um, I think we have a good, robust program already. Yes, we have things that we need to be working on. Um, and there is still a lot of work for Fresno to fully implement this. And we're... One of, the, one of the big challenges is going to be funding. I mean, that's gonna be part of our rates going forward where there are new facilities, new programs, new educational outreach, all of that has a cost to it. So from the dates that are here, 2022, we're supposed to start providing organics co a collectible service. By 2024, looks like we must take action against non-compliant entities. What, is that, what does that mean? Does that also, are we going to be also doing enforcement on our commercial waste since it's a privatized um, industry? Absolutely. So that's working with our franchise haulers. So we have existing contracts. They have already implemented a number of these provisions and the enforcement piece kicks in in 2024. So there is, and we've got a graphic that, that in here. You know, the, there's two years of education, outreach. We want to do everything we can to make sure that whether it's the residential side or whether it's the commercial side, that they have every opportunity to be informed and that they have every opportunity to be successful. Our goal isn't just to come out of the gate in 2024 and hit them with enforcement. When was the, can you remind me, when was the last time that we um, amended those agreements? Did we recently vote on some of those um, Hauling agreements or no? So we yeah. have amended the franchise agreements, the originally 10-year agreements. We extended those by 10 years. So that was within the past, I want to say, three, four years. Okay. And okay. so those run through 2031, um, I believe. And so I hope they don't come back in the next two years and say, hey, we have an unfunded mandate that now you know, we, so we are gonna make them comply since they're, you know, providing us with the service. Um, so so the, I hope that they've included that as, just like we have to probably tie in our belts, right? In the way that we fund this unfunded mandate. Right, well, it's gonna cost, on the residential side, there's a cost to it. On the commercial side, there's a cost. We have strong contracts that require them to comply, uh, but it's, we're, we're talking about the, the franchise agreements. We're talking about our green waste agreements. So we have service agreements where we deliver yeah. our green waste to. And if we're talking about processing food waste and the green waste, um, there's likely to be a cost and the door is open to negotiating those costs. So that's something we will have to contend with going forward. Okay. So just so you guys know, we'll probably be faced with that issue shortly. Okay. Next, next slide. So just looking at the jurisdictional responsibilities and, and some of this we just kind of skipped ahead and talked about providing an organic waste collection service to all residents and business, um, establishing an edible food recovery program for tier one and tier two commercial food generators, um, conducting education and outreach, that's that two year period that I just mentioned. So we are looking to kickstart that. Um, the city will be required to procure certain levels of compost, uh, renewable gas for transportation fuels, electric electricity, 
uh, heating applications that could include pipeline injection. So we had a conversation about that this morning as well. We do generate methane or biogas out of the regional wastewater treatment facility. Uh, we got a plan and secure access for recycling of the edible food and recovery capacity. So what infrastructure or organizations are needed to help support that. And we're required to monitor compliance and conduct enforcement. Uh, we talked about the 2022 and 2024 timeline already. Uh, so one of the first things we need to do that we look are, are looking to bring forth in the next few months is we need to ad adopt an ordinance that is consistent with these regulatory requirements prior to 2022. So that's on our, our to-do list right now, and we expect to bring that within the next um, two to three months and have that discussion with the city council. Okay, next slide. So the law extends beyond the Department of Public Utilities. Uh, we expect that uh, each department will need to understand how this regulation will impact their work. Uh, there is also specific record keeping and reporting requirements that will extend to multiple departments. Uh, we've listed the city council up on the screen. We're going to need city council support for uh, any amendments to our, our service agreements, our hauler agreements. So at a bare minimum level, it's likely that we will see amendments to those contracts. Uh, we're also going to need the council support to implement a new enforcement ordinance in the near future. We've listed the city manager up there. Um, city manager will be uh, involved with directing the procurement of certain recycled organic products um, like compost or renewable uh, natural gas. Uh, we've got finance and purchasing, city attorney's office to assist with reviewing contracts and procurement. Um, public utilities obviously involved with our, our hauler agreements. Um, and program compliance is going to be, be a big one, so we're already gearing up, staffing up them to make sure that we can conduct those efforts. Uh, public works and parks uh, may need to assess the need for compost application and, and landscaped areas, such as our city parks, and then transportation and fleet uh, may be involved in procuring renewable natural gas for our fleet. Uh, next slide. So drilling into the organic waste collection services, and we just did that. If, kind of a few minutes ago. Uh, the most basic element of that is that uh, we've got to implement the uh, collection of organic material and on the residential side, that's diverting food waste from the gray cart over to the green cart. So fortunate that we've got the system in place already to do that, uh, but there's quite a bit of work to make sure that that material is gonna be able to be processed. So a lot of concern about, um, uh, about what levels of contamination are gonna be in that waste stream so that it can be adequately processed and meet the objectives of the requirements. Uh, jurisdictions also have enforceable requirements on its haulers to collect organic waste in the jurisdiction and also for each commercial and residential generator. Um, let's go to the next slide. So looking at our edible food recovery so 1383 requires that we strengthen our existing infrastructure for edible food recovery and food distribution. And so the city has um, a, somewhat of a head start on that. I mean, we just recognized the food bank this morning. So, so they're potentially a partner and they provide, um, you know, a service here in the community that could be rolled up into these efforts. Um, also want to recognize that there is the Fresno Metro Ministries Food to Share program. And so they have been conducting um, edible food redistribution uh, in the city, and they are also recognized currently on CalRecycle's website, so a good case study, and it's right here in Fresno, and it's on the state's webpage, so there's a good model there. Um, so what we'll have to look at is how can these programs be expanded, what sort of support do they need uh, in order to help meet, or, or the city to meet these requirements going forward. And, you know, even where, you know, communities where these programs already exist, you know, there are new record keeping, um, inspection requirements, and we've got to implement those on an annual basis um, going forward as well. So next slide. Okay, in terms of education requirements, so annually uh, we're going to be, we're going to have to be out there as well as our uh, franchise haulers to educate our organic waste generators about commercial edible food, uh, or I'm sorry, okay. organic waste generators, commercial edible food generators, um, self haulers of those requirements. Uh, there are very detailed requirements in terms of making sure that you can reach all members of the community and we are committed to doing so. 
um, in multiple languages, most specifically Spanish, Hmong, any other language that uh, is needed to get the message out there to make sure that all of our residents and our businesses are successful going forward with these regulations. Uh, next slide, procurement requirements. So each jurisdiction will have a minimum procurement target that's linked to its population. The state has provided calculators, so uh, we're gonna be working with a, a partner to help go through the process, generate those calculations, determine what the thresholds are so that uh, we can move forward with um, procuring uh, what is gonna be compost, could be mulch, could be, again, biomass, uh, derived electricity, renewable gas. Uh, procurement doesn't necessarily mean purchase. Uh, as an example, the city you know, can produce its own compost um, or renewable gas, which we already do, and we're working on the interconnection studies right now and design of a pipeline to get interconnected with PG&E. So um, some good headway already on that effort. And there's also some pretty specific paper procurement requirements as well that we'll have to implement as an organization. Next slide. Okay, in, ter in terms of infrastructure, again, I'm gonna mention, you know, at statewide, 20 million tons of material statewide. So we're gonna need some new facilities to manage that, and that's gonna be spread out across all of the different uh, jurisdictions and local agencies. Uh, we've got a plan for adequate capacity for recycling organic waste, um, edible food recovery. Uh, cities have to demonstrate that they have access and, uh, to recycling capacity through various contracts. Uh, there are also requirements that each jurisdiction uh, needs to consult with specific entities. Uh, one example is, is the lead enforcement agency. Um, another example of that, and I'll point out that, you know, this includes disadvantaged communities. So we have to reach out to them, discuss the benefits as well as the impacts associated with any new or expanded facilities in the future. All right, next slide. Uh, continuing on the in inspection and enforcement, so, he so here's the timeline, you know, ordinance takes effect 2022. Uh, when you look at the 22 to 2024, uh, it's heavy education, heavy outreach. This is where we want to connect with all of our partners, all of our customers, uh, get the message out, understand what the challenges are, and then make sure that we are building and responding to their, their needs so that there's successful implementation. After 2024, uh, jurisdictions are required to take uh, progressive enforcement against organic waste generators that are not in compliance. And so I'll point out that the regulations do a, set a minimum penalty amount of, of at least uh, $50 for the first offense within one year. It can go up as high as $500 a, uh, a day for multiple offenses occurring within one year. So again, uh, it's gonna be an, an early, robust education program that with the intent to minimize the amount of future enforcement going forward. So along with that, there's gonna be annual compliance review, and those um, that's gonna be aimed at commercial businesses that generate greater than two cubic yards per week. Uh, we're gonna uh, conduct route reviews, both on the commercial and residential side. Uh, to inspect for contamination. So one of the things we are considering right now is a pilot program working with our residential customers, um, starting with a couple of routes. Uh, we want to uh, start the educational piece, have them start to transition that material. Uh, we want to understand what some of the challenges are, how we can help them be successful. We also have to work with the service provider. So when that truck hits the delivery point, what comes out of it? You know, is how contaminated is it? And that's going to drive um, our educational response as well because we cannot have plastic bags and other foreign material if we are going to expect to process the food waste along with the green waste in that stream. Uh, we also have to conduct inspections to verify edible food recovery arrangements for both tier one commercial um, generators by 2022 and then tier two commercial generators by 2024. Next slide. So in terms of record keeping requirements, uh, the city will have to maintain an implementation record for all items that you see up on the screen. Uh, many of these sections have a minimum level of record keeping, such as ordinances, contracts, franchise uh, agreements, um, the list goes on. And CalRecycle may um, conduct a program audit, take a look at that impl implementation record going forward. So we wanna make sure we've got a good start and uh, we're tracking all of this information at a high level uh, in the event that we are subject to an audit. 
All right, lastly, uh, these are the key implementation dates. So the 1383 legislation was adopted in 2016. Uh, there's been uh, a couple of years of, of rulemaking, regulations set to take effect in 2022. We're gonna enter this education and outreach effort. Uh, we're required to take enforcement action beginning in 2024 with the 75% reduction targets um, that are currently set for January 1st, 2025, unless the state decides to relax or revise that number. So going forward, we are looking at bringing forth an enforcement ordinance uh, within the next uh, two to three months. Uh, we are going to develop an SB 1383 roadmap for compliance uh, for the city, our residential customers, and then working with our, our partners as well as the county. And we are going to initiate uh, a food waste pilot program. We're gonna work with our residential customers and uh, try to learn more about um, how to successfully implement that transition of food waste to the, to the green cart. So with that, I'll do my best to answer your questions. Thank you, Director Carbajal. I don't think there are any questions. Yeah. Oh, we do have some questions. Okay, Councilman Barrios. Sorry, but apparently, yeah, it's uh, after lunch, you know, coma. Don't take it personal, but we were paying attention. On just a couple of points, on your ordinance that you have to bring forward, can I just recommend that you do some advanced meetings with the council? Absolutely. Uh, the last thing I want is folks to be able to describe that we're you know, doing you know, police checkups on people's garbage cans, so let's be thoughtful about that. Right, that's the intent of this conversation, was to make sure that yeah. you're informed, and then yeah, we absolutely look forward to reaching out to each district and, right. and working through the ordinance process. And then, um, I didn't hear from, from your presentation over the next to 2025 rate increases. I know it's the elephant in the room for DPU that we haven't discussed publicly, but I'm presuming that between now and 2025, rate increases would have to be brought to the table, right? That's correct. Do we know when that's gonna happen? Yes, uh, we plan to bring a uh, workshop to council in October, November. We'd like, at that time, here's the financial status of the utilities, and we'd like the green light to go ahead and get the consultants on board to do the rate studies and probably look at doing a 218 in that January, February time frame with the, and then we're going to sequence the rates. We're not going to just do everything, so we'll just see, and we'll give you that sequencing plan, but we'd like that first adjustment to probably look at July 1st, 2022. And just out of curiosity, how, how long does it typically take to do a rate study? Is it six months, a year? No, we, the, the last time we did the, uh, the, the water one, we did that in about three months. Okay. Yeah, because it's just assembling all the data and information you got already. It's just packaging it and in doing the math. full disclosure, um, I am going to open the conversation around the Clovis Fresno uh, wastewater treatment facility. And I know Clovis is growing at a much faster rate than Fresno is. And in order to accommodate that rapid growth and sprawl, we have to expand to the facility. And then we have to burn the gas in our community in the most impact and polluted part of the valley. So just be aware, I'm gonna bring that conversation up and I, I am gonna reevaluate the agreement and what have any, you seen the agreement? We can bring the, I think it would be good yeah. to, if we can get you the agreement. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to just go deeper into that. I just want to let you know that I'm going to spend some time understanding that whole agreement and all the special districts whose waste we process. Okay. I, yeah, I think we definitely should look at the agreement, um, get a thorough understanding of the background yes. there, mm -hmm. what some of the uh, implications are of yep. that, and some of the challenges. I think that's uh, yeah. a pretty significant undertaking with yeah. 50 years of history plus uh, yeah. another agency that has capacity, that owns capacity in that facility. So uh, yeah. it'll be a good conversation. Yeah, definitely. I, I think whatever we did in the 70s hasn't been all that fruitful for a certain part of town and you guys know which one I'm talking about. So I wanna make sure we're not just building on, you know, um, a previous decision making that wasn't thoughtful right. about who actually lives in that area. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot more to that conversation. Um, some of that has to do with wastewater effluent, uh, groundwater yep. mitigation. So um, yeah, it's a complicated. Lot of, a, a lot of, yeah, yeah, it's complicated is a good way to say it. Yes, it's complicated and, and I'm very thoughtful about the, the complexities and the magnitude. So know that I'm gonna spend quite a bit of time with you all for a while understanding all the implications and what if any options we have and what considerations we have to take into account. And then the, the last question I have is, it, it looks like the state is now mandating us to go um, not only in the, your traditional, you know, managing waste, 
but also producing energy. That's where you have to invest in the flare and connectivity of pg and &E. Is it time for us to just engage in the community choice aggregation conversation? Because I know later we'll discuss pg and &E rate increases that are, are way out of whack compared to um, you know, other parts of the state. But I know we funded a study in 2019. Whatever came of the community aggregation study, was that completed? Which department might have done, did, might have done that? I remember in the budget in 2019, there was a community choice aggregation uh, study that was funded. Let me, we'll check on that and find out the status. Yeah, um, I think Anne? our, uh, Ann had uh, worked with uh, some folks on it, but they, they can get them the summary. Yep, uh, we'll get you the yep. summary. Yeah, I, I, I just, just starting to feel like if we're gonna go into the, not only managing waste, but also converting it to energy, then the natural conversation should be, if we're gonna go into the energy business, business should we full go into the energy business with two feet in? And if, if it makes sense, evaluate If it doesn't, then we don't. Um, and then just the last conversation, commercial garbage compactor. So thank you for the work so far. I'm gonna keep on repeating that every time there's a DPU item with the hope that one day the city manager will do a ribbon cutting with the mayor on a commercial compactor so that the transient population doesn't have to take out all the garbage that we just put into those bins. Thank you, director. Thank you. I, I would be careful about that Clovis conversation, Councilman Barrios. You might not be welcome at Big Hat Days uh, next year, so just uh, FYI. <laughs> Councilman Soria. Um, thank you for the presentation. I actually found this pretty um, interesting. Um, just a couple other questions that I had. Um, I know that there's already cities across the state, um, maybe a handful that are doing already some like composting or food recovery. Um, what I think about when I'm thinking about this issue, I'm thinking also kind of about the businesses. Are we also going to be, um, are we required to also kind of uh, monitor that as part of this um, legislation? Correct. So there, as part have of we the requirements. Out, is there like a, a working group? Are we, have we engaged the chamber, the restaurant association, just so that they know what's coming in the pipeline and that, you know, they get an early start in trying to kind of start thinking about what they're gonna be doing. I'm sure some already have some kind of system where they even donate their food to some food pantries or, or whatnot, but I'm just interested kind of in knowing that right. piece. So on the commercial side, these regulations have already been implemented. You know, so, so that's already moving forward and, and many of our commercial customers are already engaged in um, diverting their organics from the landfill. And that's been through Republic and, and Mid Valley. So this is building upon those regulations. It's furthering it, plus it's adding in the piece that, that you're mentioning, which is the auditing um, and the ongoing compliance checks. Plus there's gonna be a huge reporting piece now that as a, as a city, we will have to take responsibility for that. So we'll take that under consideration as well that um, you know, maybe we should reach out to um, some of the other organizations in the community that support our local businesses just to make sure that there's a good place for that conversation to occur. Yeah, no, I think that that would be a good idea. And then um, as part of the collection system that you guys are trying to create, um, are we going to create compost? Because I know in some communities you can get free compost from the city once they make the waste. You know, people use it for their gardens and so forth. So right now we do not have a program where we generate compost. We actually drop off at um, our green waste goes to two service providers who are gearing up to process the food waste in the green waste. And from there they have programs where they, they compost it. They are also looking at alternative processing methods, whether that's generating electricity um, or other types of programs. So we are gonna continue under our existing contracts right now with those service providers we will look at and consider going forward whether we engage in other types of activities, whether that's composting, um, anaerobic digestion at the, the wastewater plant, um, and you know converting uh, some of this material into renewable products. Well, is that part of though, kind of your implementation piece? Because I think I'd like to see what are the best options, right? I know right. that you're putting maybe together a plan, but I'd like to see, hey, I get it, we have a contract with certain haulers, but um, what other opportunities 
can we create? Right, so that's gonna be part of our roadmap going forward as we start to look at and dive into these regulations and look at near term, what are the things we need to do to check the box? What are the long term things we need to do to, to be successful at implementing these? It will consider whether we need to invest in um, new facilities or whether we need to form new partnerships. Um, it could be a mix of those. And so those are the things that, that we need to look at. They're not defined, but we intend to roll them up and, and look at those options and then present that going forward. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, you for the presentation. It was very informational. Thank you. All right, thank you, Director Carvajal. Are there any more questions? Any more questions? All right, that wraps up. Let's do item 3B real quick, uh, the uh, symbolic resolution that we have. Who, Mayor, did you want to say a few words on that? Shouldn't be, it shouldn't be rocket science uh, on that. Thank you, uh, Council President. Well, let's, let's hope not. Um, yeah, just I wanted to um, highlight a few things that I think are extremely important for this council to get behind, and it's a, uh, a resolution, and I want to thank uh, Council President Chavez for uh, co-sponsoring this with me also. Ann Kloos has uh, given me a lot of guidance and uh, done a lot of research for us, but the item you have before you is for the council to support a resolution um, in opposition of PG&E's uh, June 2021 general rate case filing. And uh, every so often, uh, the PG&E requests a rate increase from the California Public Utilities Commission. And uh, in this case, what is being uh, requested is absolutely uh, shocking and uh, is really, in my opinion, constitutes a, a rate crisis uh, for, uh, for us in the Valley. And uh, that increase is um, on average for the general user, residential user, 22% over three years. Um, but what is probably most shocking or is most shocking is the fact that they're requesting a 18, over an 18% increase in residential PG&E rates in the first year, and that's 2023. And uh, the impact, I believe, is going to be uh, detrimental on a lot of folks in our community, uh, regardless if you're in the um, below the poverty line, middle class, um, or folks that are, uh, you know, making six-digit uh, incomes. The, the impact is, uh, is going to be spread amongst uh, everyone whether that's residential or business. The, um, there is a, a disparate impact that occurs here in the Valley uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, number one, 23% of the people who live in Fresno are at or below the poverty line. We know that that's twi almost twice uh, the, the average in the state of California. And uh, what's interesting is that the recommended rate increase uh, for uh, care customer, which is those that are, have a lower income, is actually being recommended at 18.3%. So it really is going to have a, uh, an equitable impact on them. And, and the rates that are established by PG&E, and don't get me wrong, I, you know, I, I, PG&E has a very difficult job delivering energy, especially in the drought uh, with all the uh, restrictions that they have and the wildfires and so forth. Um, but the rate structure that they have is not equitable and it's not fair. Um, PG&E customers pay 80% more per kilowatt hour than any other um, person receiving electricity across the nation, 80% higher. So that's in, in, uh, in, and we're one of the customers of PG&E. Uh, and the absolute um, issue for us is that the rate structure is flawed. And the reason is because charges are tacked on by kilowatt hour. Uh, charges such as wildfire fund uh, uh, charges, uh, electric uh, public purpose uh, program, nuclear decommissioning. So it's based on a kilowatt per kilowatt hour, those charges. And since we use more kilowatts, in the valley than any other of the ratepayers, then we obviously carry that burden. We pay more than anyone else for those, those charges instead of them applying it per customer. Um, and again, we use more kilowatt hours because of our climate here, uh, more than the coastal or Northern California or mountainous regions. In fact, I believe we pay 97% more per kilowatt uh, or more electricity bill than uh, San Francisco. Um, 
The other um, issues that, uh, that impact us, uh, certainly uh, beyond the rate increase, is that um, it's not equitable in terms of it being uh, a rates being determined by region. We know we have the hottest region, so there should be a, a different rate for those in the San Joaquin Valley. So what we're asking in this resolution uh, that will be sent to the uh, California Public Utilities Commission is number one, a rate uh, freeze um, prior to the CPUC approving this uh, rate increase that they've been requested. Uh, only lifting that uh, rate freeze when they've come up with an equitable uh, rate reform and for PG&E to identify internally some cost cutting measures, spending uh, cost cutting or cost spending measures um, and, and, and until those things happen, uh, we do not believe that this uh, should, should go forward. And we're asking um, for there to be some, uh, some various uh, rate structure models in place by region and certainly uh, not tacking on those individual charges per kilowatt. Um, I've uh, sent letters to Assembly uh, Member Patterson, who's on the uh, Energy and Utility Commission for the state. Uh, he, um, he and I have had a conversation about this, and he is going to be uh, continuing to fight that battle for us. Also, Senator Borges, I've sent one to Governor Newsom, as well as the California Public Utilities Commission. And uh, what I'm hoping for is this body will stand together on this, which I know we will, and uh, send this resolution uh, to the Public Utilities Commission. We are, the city of Fresno, the highest um, or the, the, the number one customer of PG&E. We pay city government $27 million in energy costs. So uh, we do have a, a large voice. And we're also uh, hoping that our community will get behind this. I know they will. And to uh, make their voice heard uh, to the uh, Public Utilities Commission. So uh, with that, I'll uh, turn it over to you. Yeah, Councilmember Bredefeld, you had a question? No questions. I, I uh, support uh, what's what's being proposed. However, it's not uh, a long-term solution. Uh, the fact is PG&E is a government-protected uh, regional utility monopoly uh, because for people living from Eureka to Bakersfield, it's their only choice of purchasing energy. Uh, you can either have electricity uh, or you work with PG&E. Uh, there's three regional monopolies, PG&E, Southern California Edison, and San Diego Gas and Electric. And the state government and executives of utility companies justify their monopoly status based on the large capital infrastructure investments needed to create and operate their energy companies. Consumers prefer competition, but not in this state. We don't get competitions. Utility executives obviously prefer the monopolies because it allows them to pass virtually any cost to consumers, which is what Mayor Dyer is talking about. They don't have to fear losing market share to competitors because there are no competitors. Uh, interestingly enough, we looked into this, 91% of the PG&E stock is held by large international investment firms, global capital management firms, consider PG&E PG an ideal investment because of its monopoly control. Over five million households paying $16 billion for gas and electric in California. And California energy prices are among the nation's highest uh, with unnecessary environmental restrictions. So. What's the answer? The answer we can request freezes in rates. They'll probably not laugh at us publicly, but laugh at us privately and do their 18 and 22% increase because they can. And what other states do, like uh, Texas, they have a deregulated electric sector. That means that power generation comes uh, from selling their production in a competitive market. Uh, when uh, my son uh, moved to Texas and wanted uh, to set up his utility, he had a choice between 40 different companies to choose from. That's competition. Uh, his rates for his home, less than $100 a month. And he has a three-bedroom, uh, three-bath house and uses electricity like most people, and it's $100 a month or less. That's competition. And that's the long-term solution to this. Uh, we can get on our hands and knees, and I will join you, Mayor, in getting on my hands and knees and begging them uh, not to raise the rates. Uh, on I'm not our, doing that, for the record. <laughs> uh, you are doing it, whether you acknowledge it or not. Uh, we're all doing no. it be because we live in this uh, uh, climate where uh, this monopoly controls everything, 
and it, it is uh, a lack of leadership on the state level because we don't bring competition here, and that's a fact. And until we bring competition here, we will always be faced with these issues. So I will support this uh, mayor. I appreciate uh, you doing it. But we all ought to be wide open and, and not have any blurriness in our eyes that the long-term solution is bringing competition. Competition will lower rates, and we need to bring other companies and other uh, grids um, to the arena. Uh, there are different public... There's a public utility commission in Texas. There's an electric reliability council. There's power generation companies. There's tr transmission and distrib distribution utilities. These re there are retail electricity providers. There's energy brokers. All of that can happen in one state. There's no reason why it can't happen in this state and, frankly, should happen in this state because we're California and our constituents deserve better than they're being provided. And that's the long-term solution. Thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Bredefeld. Councilmember Arias, I just want to remind folks we got a 2 p.m. Uh, PLA uh, main event uh, scheduled here. Thank you. I'm glad my Republican colleague wants competition again because we were just arguing for a monopoly of casinos an hour earlier. Um, but And I'm glad that you brought up Texas because Texas just proved that deregulation completely can be a failure. And nearly 900 people lied, uh, died in February when their system, their grid, went down. So there is advantages and disadvantages to a fully regulated system and an unregulated system. Um, for me, Mayor, wh when is the uh, Commission on Public Utilities going to make a decision on this matter? The, um, in terms of the, the actual time frame, 60, the, the request to the CPUC was filed uh, just over 60 days ago. And so the process is always, uh, already underway. And so um, they will make that decision, and you know. And then um, just my, my, my other comment. Uh, personally, I'm not ready for this today. I haven't met with pg and &E, and as you know, I, I like to measure twice and cut once when it comes to policy items. So if it's not urgent, like it needs to be done today, I prefer to have an opportunity to meet with pg and &E. And I, I also don't agree with their rate increases and how they're set. Um, it's, unfortunately, the more you use, the higher, more you pay. It's how we do water rates. The more water you use, the higher rate you pay. It's, that has a disproportionate impact on people in poverty. We know that. So um, I, I'd like to understand from them a little more. I know quite a bit of the fires took a huge hit. Um, some of those rates are baked into the settlements that they've reached. Um, I know. California has earthquakes, and their costs must be higher to maintain certain infrastructure. But w when is the uh, commission going to make a decision then? So the process, as the mayor said, is underway. They're going to have the public participation hearings. will be starting in about 90 days. Okay. Prior to the public participation hearings is the reason we want to take all this activity to uh, create public awareness, give people, you know, from the community all the way up to local local leaders and opportunity. So the decision doesn't come till next year, Got it. but the process of being uh, educated and becoming engaged yeah. and starting you know the process, that's all already underway. In fact, the deadline to file an official protest was about four weeks ago. Oh, and, and we didn't file an official protest or we did, did we? No, we didn't. That would have taken council action and it all happens like that. It happens very quickly, okay. so which is part of the process is broken. The way they go about doing this every three years is they, it's kind of like the routine song and dance, and so we're trying to affect change on that. Okay. Uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm supportive of, of, of the concept of, you know, not having to absorb that significant amount of rate increases, especially given that the city manager just informed us that we'll be looking at rate increases for utilities also in the near future, um, but I would like the opportunity to sit down with PG and understand the structure and how they're planning to you know, allocate that additional uh, revenue um, before I personally you know, take a vote on it. Yeah, and I'll just add to the reason that the, um, the, the difference, for example, when you have more people utilizing uh, more water so they pay a higher rate, understandable, but what happens if we would tack on charges, additional charges, to each gallon that they used. So in PG&E's case, for every kilowatt you use, there's additional charges. 
for wildfire fund, de nuclear, uh, the nuclear decommissioning. All those funds are tacked on by kilowatt. So they, um, that's what makes it unfair. And the timing of this, quite honestly, is I would like to go forward today. Um, the utility consumer advocacy organization, TURN, has requested to uh, partner with the city of Fresno. Um, following the, um, the September 2nd vote here today at the council, they're hoping to have that resolution so that they can begin collaboration uh, next week. And uh, their um, a meeting is set for uh, next week, September 9th, that we're going to collaborate on. And uh, they, they know that they need to start now in order to get the uh, citizen engagement and awareness to the degree that they need, as well as other uh, governmental entities. And so that's why we've started. We're actually um, a little bit late, as, as Ann talked about, um, but uh, we, we do need to, um, to move forward as quickly as we possibly can. All right, Council Member Maxwell, you were punched up. Yeah, thank you, Council President. I guess I also just wanted to comment on the irony. I guess it's easy to speak about monopolies when they're at the state level and out of your control, but when they're actually something you could do about granting a monopoly, I guess it's a double standard when it's convenient. But <laughs> when it comes to this PG&E item, Mayor, uh, do we have PG&E here to speak on behalf of this here today? They do. They're actually punched up. We got Erica. Would you like to hear from her, Council Member Maxwell? I would like to hear from her, but I'm just also curious. What tangible results do you hope to get from this letter? Is this mostly ceremonial in your opinion, Mayor? If not, I mean, no. what do you see this accomplishing? No, I, I honestly, I think with uh, the rate increases that we're seeing, uh, it is a rate crisis. I, I do believe that people are fed up. It's going to be a rate revolt, and, and this is uh, something that I, I think that we as a city of Fresno should be very engaged in, and I do believe that um, as a result of our efforts, and if we can mobilize folks, uh, I do believe we're going to have an impact. Certainly the CPUC is going to listen, and uh, I do believe if they get enough calls, enough emails, uh, enough letters, uh, that there is a potential, a uh, very strong potential, that they're going to uh, do a uh, restructuring of their rates. And uh, what we're asking for is a fair and equitable uh, spread of charges uh, across the service territory. And uh, we're asking for regional rate setting to, to occur, regional rate setting models. Uh, we're asking them to remove the, uh, the charges from the, uh, the kilowatt per hour that is currently in place uh, that I spoke of. And so, uh, and we're asking them to take a look at their internal, internal cost-cutting measures. And uh, I uh, have some insight in terms of where they can cut. And uh, I agree with Councilmember Arias in the sense that they've, they've uh, had to go through quite a bit uh, with their electrical lines and some of the restrictions that they have on being able to cut trees in, in the mountainous regions, which ultimately whenever a, a tree limb falls and hits a line that they're, you know, uh, responsible, even though they're not allowed to cut the tree. Uh, but uh, still, I think there's some, a lot of cost, uh, uh, cost cutting measures that they can take. Uh, and and we, we cannot continue. This is not sustainable. This is, this is not at the rate of uh, cost of inflation. We're talking 18% in one year for residential customers on top of the increases that we've seen year after year after year. And given the time frame that we have on this item, you're not willing to move this? Well, it, it again. Uh, Let me just speak to that, sure. Mayor, because I, I co-sponsored this, and I just want to give my colleagues some insight as to, I didn't even know about the rate increase. I, the mayor spoke to me about it. And the reason I signed on to it, Council, and Council Member Maxwell, is you know, we just got through having a discussion about the rental relief program that we have for folks. And the city, as you know, has been paying the utility bills as well as the PG&E and, you know, the, the Comcast, the Internet. And so when you look at this, we had a moratorium on, you know, rent and evictions. The city of Fresno itself put a freeze on it. And so we're essentially asking PG&E to do the same and to work with our, our, our neighborhood residents. Uh, short of them getting this rate increase right now, um, we're just going to end up paying a lot of that from even the city coffers with the amounts of money that are going to be owed. And as the mayor said, it's an 18% uh, increase. Um, I've always had issues with the rate structure. Um, part of the rationale behind me driving that community choice conversation, um, I think that is something that we should be exploring. I think, but this just to me underlines the main challenge with 
you know, City of Fresno just having uh, one vendor or, you know, two vendors. And so I, 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 to answer your question, uh, Councilmember Maxwell, I think part of it is symbolic, but the other one is also sending a message for our constituents and making sure that they know that they at least have a voice because I think the mayor's right. I think there's going to be a lot of conversation when folks start getting that bill, um, especially in the, you know, winter months or the summer months. I mean, we just get hit with those bills very disproportionately. Uh, and that's really the intent of this. So it's a combination of purpose, but also uh, symbolic to answer your question. Uh, Councilwoman Soria. Uh, I, th I thought pg &E was on the line, but. Yeah, do we have uh, Erica Cabrera? I think she, she could answer some questions or, or maybe speak. Yes. On can, can you hear me? Yes, Ms. Cabrera. I think Council had a couple questions. Perfect. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council President, and Fresno City Council members. I'm happy to answer a few questions. I'm not sure if you'd like me to kind of address some of the topics and issues that have already been uh, mentioned by the mayor during his comments or how you want to go ahead and proceed at this moment. Councilwoman Soria or, or Council, did you guys have a specific question for um, Ms. Cabrera? Well, I think... The Council the President, I, I would just like, if you can, maybe save me a meeting. Uh, can you give us an overview of what's the source of the rate increases? What's that the additional rate so, increase going to go towards? Yes, absolutely. So CPUC, our rates are regulated by, or pg &E's rates are regulated by, regulated by the CPUC. Traditionally, it is every three years, but it has been modified, so it'll be a four-year process now. The rates that are proposed um, would potentially, if they're adopted by the CPUC in its entirety, the CPUC has the ability to identify if they want to take it at a reduced rate. Um, the filing was done June 30th of 2021, and the final decision is expected next winter, late November, early December of 2022, and would go into effect of 2023. I know that the mayor did highlight you know, additional charges that are on the bill, electric public purpose program, wildfire fund decommissioning, the electric public purpose program, that is what funds the care discount. And so when you're talking about the residents that are struggling and are taking advantage of the care discount or participating in what we call ESA Energy Savings Assistance Program, that is the funding mechanism that is utilized to pay for those types. And just to kind of give you an understanding of where we are in Fresno, in the city of Fresno, there are 106,000 customers that are currently enrolled in care. And that's a 14% increase since March of 2020. That answer your question, Councilman Soria? Yeah, I think that, that those are, um, that's good data. I don't, you know, I'm not too familiar with, with the process, so this has been um, enlightening. Um, I haven't spent too much time looking at whatever the filing was. I briefly read the letter. I, the mayor never talked to me about, you know, how important this was in terms of the timing of it. I would have liked um, to have a little bit more time. Um, I'd like to dig deeper. I, in particularly, care because I don't know that we have the muscle to to create uh, a competitive utility, another competitive utility, so that we can have options. I, I'm not sure that this council has the muscle to really do that. Um, and so, I'd like to understand how the residents that I represent are gonna be impacted if we do say, I get it, the, I, I'm not for increasing rates. I, I don't even know if I wanna support rates um, to, you know, for our solid waste. Uh, and you guys are talking about us having to take a vote. We, we have families that are struggling and so I wanna really um, understand those families too that are in the care program. If we do um, just blankly right now say we oppose, what happens if in fact, um, you know, we take that position. I wanna make sure that we're not jeopardizing the ability to help those residents that are already struggling. So I have a lot of questions. Um, yeah, uh, you um, know, and I, can you answer some of those questions? I know you used to work over there and familiar with the care program and the fee structure, because I kind of went through that in my head too. Yeah, so, and I completely agree with you about the care program. I mean, it is a safety net that is critical. The issue here is 
the way that the public purpose programs to include care is loaded on the kilowatt price, the, de the deck is stacked against us. Because we buy more kilowatts in the Valley and in Fresno, we disproportionately pay more for the care program than the rest of the service territory, like at the coast, Northern California, the mountain regions. Since they buy less kilowatts, they are contributing less to the care program than people in the Valley to include people that are on the care program. So that's why what we're suggesting, this action we're taking, it's not putting care at any kind of a risk. It's just, we're just saying that the funding of care needs to be more fairly uh, and appropriately funded throughout the whole service territory and not just those of us that buy so many kilowatts. I see, okay. I, I appreciate I, I that. I would like to say- yeah, Erica, do you, wanna, uh, do you wanna address that? Yeah, so um, the baseline in the Central Valley, you know, the tier structure has changed. You know, there was AB 327 that was passed several years ago that there used to be four tiers and now it is three. And the baseline for the Central Valley does include a higher baseline. I recognize, you know, as a homeowner, as a resident of the Central Valley, yes, we do exceed those tiers. But just so that we um, are, you know, under the same understanding that there have been some improvements to the rate structure in the past. And absolutely, we're willing to work with the legislative body to have those conversations. And so, like Council Member Soria and Council Member Arias have said, you know, I'm happy to facilitate conversations with um, my senior vice president that oversees regulatory affairs um, to have a greater conversation so everyone understands, you know, I, I understand the position that the elected officials are in at this time, but if we were afforded the opportunity to have those conversations, I would greatly appreciate it. Yeah, and, and there's nothing that stops us from having this conversation, um, Erica, in the future, and I'm willing to do that um, as well. I think for the sake of this conversation, and I, I think we've all said that, I mean, let's just, like we say, let's just vote and see where we're at. I'll make the motion to approve the resolution. Yeah, and I understand that, Council President, but I think it's also yeah. having the opportunity to really, you know, hear uh, much more comprehensively um, because it is a big issue. Um, again, you know, I, I'll publicly state, I, I don't want to increase rates. I don't want to see the type of impact that, that um, will happen to our communities, but I feel like I don't know enough you know, I know, um, and that's your comfort level, so, Councilwoman Soria. So, I, um, so I, I don't want to have my constituents find out about this and then say that why didn't the city do anything? Well, why didn't we but we could do it right. next council meeting too. So that that's my only thing. I I am willing to take a vote on it. Just if we can bring it back in the next council meeting, I'm happy to take a vote then. At least that gives me the opportunity. Council President, I guess the question yeah. is for the mayor. Do you want to vote today or can we wait till next meeting? Uh, my preference is to get a vote today so we can move forward with our partnership with TURN. They are the, the ones that are going to really move forward with uh, the advocates. I've met with uh, Senior Vice President Robert Kenney uh, and uh, sent a letter uh, to him. I've also met with the Regional Vice President who's new here in Fresno but lives here, who I believe will be uh, an advocate for us, Joshua Symes, he used to work for Comcast. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, and the folks that I've talked to at pg &E, folks understand mm -hmm. that there is a problem. And yes, there have been some improvements, but not enough, and not even close to enough. And, and I would hope that we would see this, and I know you guys do, that this, there is a sense of urgency about this, um, to see that we are collectively moving forward. We see the urgency. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm all for, you know, people meeting with pg &E again like I did. But quite frankly, um, I haven't got the answers I need. I know. And I believe we owe it to the people we represent in Fresno to move forward with this item. And, and I agree, and I appreciate your urgency, and I'd like to second the motion by Councilmember Chavez. So, so um, Council, just, I mean, we've, we've heard the concerns, and I'm more than happy to meet with um, PG&E and, and, and Erica and keep the conversation going. I think we just want to get a placeholder uh, in, in, you know, in this situation and open up that, because if we don't, I think it'll just be conversation after conversation. Um, and, you know, so with that, um, you know, motion was made. Uh, second, any opposition? Oh, I'm sorry, I think we have to take some public comment. I thought Erica was, was there anybody else speak, to speak on there? One more person, right? Mc There's a total of three now. Next is Cody McDowell. McDougal. All right. Uh, Mr. McDougall, correct? Yes. 
Mr. McDougall? Is he on mute? Uh, Cody, you're, there you go. Yeah, I, I'm here, but I'm here for the PLA. I, I apologize. Okay, let's wait on that. Miss uh, Lisa Flores? Ms. Flores, did you want to speak on this item or were you also waiting for the PLA conversation? No, I was actually waiting for the unmute button to come up, Louie. Okay, go ahead, ma'am. Um, okay, um, I see both sides. I see the urgency from Mayor Dyer, but I also would like to give my representative, um, Councilwoman Soria, the time to get educated on this and come back to the council and make sure that all the T's and I's are crossed and dotted. Because when I hear 20%, a chill goes through my spine. As a person on a disability retirement, my income is very limited. And every month, the biggest bill I fear is PG&E. Because, you know, at any given point in the summer, it's going to be $200. That's not what I allocate for in any given month. Um, so, you know, when I hear a 20% increase, my rent just went up on my birthday last week. Food costs are going up. My health care, I, I don't even know what that's going to look like in January because that just went up. Now pg and is going up on my limited income, which basically puts people like me um, pushing us more and more toward poverty. And so, you know, I think it's great that everybody's basically on board with a conceptual idea of talking to them and objecting to this. I didn't start no wildfire from no gender baby reveal, nor do I maintain the forest for the night. They're responsible for that. I shouldn't have to pay for that because they chose not to. And we got horrific fires last year and my pg &E had to go on. Last year, literally, I was skirting almost a $300 bill for one person because I had to keep my... Um, my air conditioning on because of my health. So, you know, I week, so Councilwoman Soria has the time oh, did we lose? Did to, we lose? you know, review what she needs to review and ask the questions that. I think we lost Ms. Flores. Thank you, Lisa, for yeah. having my back. Thank, <laughs> thank you, Ms. Flores, and thank you for calling me Council Member Louie. Um, I think that was a first. Uh, I hadn't heard that one since middle school, so I really appreciate it. It's just Louie Louie, there's the song. All right, next speaker, I think our last speaker is Cesari Hardiman. Cesari Hardiman. Then do no, do? Um, no. Um, Different I'm item, sir? Coming on. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. All right, that concludes our public comment. Uh, motion was made, second, any opposition? Seeing none, motion carries. All right, let's move on to the main event, uh, item 4A, the approving a project labor agreement for citywide public work of improvement projects. And motion the sponsors were Vice President Esparza, Councilmember Arias, and Councilwoman Soria. I'll second okay. Councilmember Soria's motion. All right, motion made. Councilwoman Nine. Soria, seconded by Vice President Esparza. I've got, Councilwoman Soria, you're punched up. Council President, can I start and then I'll hand it over to the, my colleagues? Yeah, let's go ahead. Thank you. So Council, just a quick reminder for the public that in February this year, the Council unanimously approved and authorized the Council Committee um, to work with the administration and begin negotiating a citywide PLA. Since then, um, for more than six months, we've been at the negotiating table with the Central Labor Council that represents quite a bit of labor groups. Today, our city our Attorney representing the city, Mr. John Holzman, is down here to answer any questions. Um, our partner, who has been the lead negotiator on behalf of the labor, Chuck Realhouse, is also here to answer any questions on the proposal. Um, in general, Council, uh, you've seen the proposal. Um, it builds upon what has worked at the Fresno Airport PLA that is, in act, is currently active. In short, it would result in the majority of the workers uh, would be from the city of Fresno under any project over a million dollars that's eligible to be funded under, under the PLA. The majority of new apprenticeships would be from the city of Fresno. The majority of hours worked um, will be by city of Fresno residents. 
it would focus recruitment on veterans, women and minorities. All contractors, both union and non-union, would be eligible to um, bid for projects. And um, it would also ensure um, overarching council that Fresno taxpayer money remains in Fresno, employing Fresnans in the construction industry with good paying jobs that provide a prevailing wage, health care, and pensions for a lot of our workers. Some folks have described union jobs in our country as a middle class jobs that have you know, been the backbone of our economy, but have also been shrinking over time. This proposal represents months of negotiations. It does also ensure that the city has access to high quality, um, skilled workforce uh, from the halls. Um, it would also help us get projects completed on time, and it would ensure that none of those projects would be eligible for strikes or work stoppages. I do want to thank the city manager for being on the table with us for months. I know that in any you know, negotiation session, we all ask for 10 things and we might get seven. Um, that happens routinely, but throughout the whole time, he's been respectful, um, thoughtful. Um, we've heard his suggestions as well as uh, Director Scott Moser and other directors who've been in the negotiating process. Over the last couple of days, we spent a couple of sessions with the mayor going through the proposed language. Um, but I do also, Council, um, want to make a point to address all the comments that we have received from the public. In total, I have received 11, um, 12, 12 emails in opposition of the PLA. Eight of them are from residents in Clovis. Two of them are PO boxes somewhere in the city. One resident from the city of Fresno and one resident from Sanger. Um, and I've been thoughtful to respond to, try and respond to every single constituent who call, who emails us and voices concerns and explain to them um, what the facts are. I haven't had a chance to do that via email with these individuals because we just got their emails last night, but I did want to cover some of the concerns and clarify some of the points that they brought up. Um, for Mr. Gordon from Clovis, his understanding of the agreement is that non-union contractors and non-union employees would not be allowed to work under PLA projects. That's not the case. Again, both union and non-union contractors and employees could work under this PLA. Non-union employees would not pay union fees either. For Ms. Kim from Clovis, she's under the impression that um, we would not allow, again, non-union shops to bid in these projects. That's been addressed. From Tyler from Clovis, um, his email included a lot of false claims related to Selma um, that have been disproven two years ago when we approved the um, agreement with the airport. For the record, um, uh, she indicated that this would increase the price point. That has proven not to be the case in the Selma project, uh, nor here. From Richard and Clovis, he also would like, um, his understanding is that no apprentice in a uh, non-union apprentice would be allowed to work at any projects. From Kate from Clovis, she believes that um, this would be a blanket citywide PLA. That's not the case. There are numerous exemptions in this PLA. We exempt um, specialty projects, projects under warranty, projects done by city employees, um, and we also have a side letter potentially exempting slurry if we get no bids. There are a series of exemptions. In addition to that, projects that are funded by federal, state, and county funds that are not eligible under PLA would also be exempted. So I want to clarify, it's not a blanket PLA. We anticipate that this PLA would um, make about tw less than 20% of our city projects eligible to be covered under it. Larry from Clovis. Again, he makes the false claims about the Selma PLA that were disproven in 2019. Kristen from Clovis expresses the false claims that have been disproven in the Selma PLA. Chris from Clovis, his assumption is that costs will be driven up. Um, just as a point, whenever we award construction projects under the regular bidding process, um, sometimes a lot of those projects end up 
at a higher cost, change orders, cost of material, cost of constructions. There are legitimate reasons why, uh, why construction costs increase in any particular project. It's not a reflection of the delivery model. It's a reflection, a reflection of a series of variables, all of which staff uh, presents to us when they request change orders. Um, I can think of at least four projects today that are higher than what the bid was or what the architect's um, estimate was, and there's valid reasons for that. And I have full confidence in our staff when they present the rationale for why those costs increase. Andrew from Appeal Box is claiming that this would lead to less high-skilled workers in Fresno working. This actually does the opposite. It increases the amount of skilled workforce in Fresno. It increases the amount of pipeline of apprentice, new ones, current ones, and journeymen. And it ensures that when they complete their apprenticeship hours and program, they don't have to drive the barrier for a job because we would have more jobs here. Dave from Appeal Box somewhere makes some claims about the Selma PLA that have proven to be false. Steven from Fresno is concerned that non-union workers like himself would not be allowed to work on these projects. Again, that's not correct. And then lastly, uh, Luz from, um, from Clovis makes claims about the Selma PLA that are not proven to be not true and did not come to fruition. I would also enter for the record that we received some opposition from ABC and others locally. ABC is a group of uh, folks that represent contractors, not workers, but those contractors who stood in this chamber in 2019 guaranteed that the Fresno Airport PLA would result in a project that was over schedule and over uh, budget. That's not the case. The Airport PLA has performed well for a variety of reasons, just want to point out, it is not over budget, it is not past schedule. So um, I take all that seriously, council, because I have spent six months of time with city staff and my council colleagues trying to develop a document that may not be everything that our labor groups think would make a great PLA, but it's not everything that the council thinks um, would make a great PLA, but ultimately it's a compromise that we believe is in the best interest of the city and would result in higher skilled workers living in Fresno, having the opportunity to work in Fresno, and becoming part of the working class of Fresnans that we have. Um, I, I find it always surprising how many folks who have good paying jobs and work in a Fresno project live in Clovis. Um, and that's good. That's good that our projects result in good paying jobs that affords them an opportunity to live in one of the best suburbs in the state. But we want that opportunity for more Fresnes too and we think that this strikes the balance. So with that council, I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Yeah, and Thank for you. the record, Councilman Barrios, the best suburb is in Southeast Fresno, not uh, Clovis. <laughs> no. um, Councilmember Carbasi? Well, I'm part oh, of the, Sorry, part the, of the introducing... committee. Let's let, her, let the committee go first. Yes. Thank you, Council President. Um, so. I think Council Member Arias did a good job in kind of summarizing um, this endeavor. It has been six months um, in the making. I do want to thank um, our city manager, um, the city staff that has been involved, obviously, our attorney, John Holtzman, and the other city attorneys that um, have been part of this um, grueling process, <laughs> um, difficult at times, but I think that out of great difficulty, I think that this is um, something great. And then obviously um, also to our other partners, the building trades who have been at the table um, negotiating um, with us. Um, for me, what this um, resolution and this item today represents um, is very significant because it's about working families. When we look, when we look at our city and we see that one out of every four people in, that live in this city live in poverty, um, we got to be thinking, what more can this council do? And I think this is a, a great continuation to what this council did when we decided to do the PLA for the airport. This is a continuation in building the future middle class of Fresno. Uh, we have seen time and time again, not only here in our city, but in our country, that there is a missing middle. And that in order to really build that, we have to be intentional about our policies. 
Um, and you know, this is not the panacea to solve the poverty in our community, but it is an attempt and it is a tool that will help us uplift people out of poverty, that will create the future workforce here in the city of Fresno. And what best way to do it by ensuring that our projects incorporate that workforce training that is desperately needed, especially for those people that live in disadvantaged communities, that have been homeless, that have been victims of domestic abuse and end up on the streets, but they just need a shot, that were previously um, drug users or have criminal convictions, but they need an opportunity to turn their lives around. I've gone to probably um, majority of the apprentice graduations that have been put on by the building trades here in Fresno. And it is remarkable to see how impactful these types of apprentices are um, in our city. And I know that through a citywide PLA, even though it has several exemptions, um, we have an opportunity to create that pipeline and build the middle class for the city of Fresno. Um, when we look at the PLA and all the exemptions, I just want to give context to it because people are saying, oh my God, the sky is falling. Oh, people are not going to be able to bid on these um, you know, contracts. They're not going to have the ability to do these projects. Um, that is a flat lie because if we look at just in the last calendar year, we did, we did a very quick analysis from May to May only 15, about 15% of the city of projects would have fallen under our current PLA. That means that 85% of all projects in the city of Fresno would have been open for everyone else. So when people are saying the sky is falling, people are not gonna be able to bid, they're not gonna, that is.
good? We're on. We're live. All right. Fantastic. Uh, I was very proud to be one of the sponsors from the very beginning uh, of this project labor agreement citywide. Uh, you know, with countless hours uh, went into putting this thing together, as as all parties who were involved uh, know. And I think this final document uh, reflects uh, uh, a direction that's going to move our city forward. Uh, I think ultimately this will be a very helpful tool uh, for an economically challenged region uh, like ours. Uh, it's going to ensure the city projects are completed on time, uh, within budget, uh, that our local folks are prioritized. Uh, one of the, the best components uh, of this is we're really reining in the definition of what local means and, and, and truly prioritizing our city of Fresno uh, uh, residents. Uh, I'm always preaching about how we need to find ways to uh, bring dollars into the city, uh, make sure local, dollars, local dollars are spent locally, circulated throughout our economy. Uh, that's one way, one primary way that's going to help us help our city grow. And I think uh, this project labor agreement uh, for years to come will accomplish just that and again helping our, our city grow economically. Uh, so I won't uh, beat the horse to death here. I'm very excited to vote yes uh, on the citywide PLA today. All right, thank you, Vice President. Councilmember Carbasi. Thank you, Mr. President. So I look forward to the discussion we're gonna have on this item, but there is one person who is not here today and that's Randy Elgan. Randy is a Fresno native. He was a very passionate labor leader. He first joined his first union here in Fresno in 1973, and that was the Bakery, Confectionery, and Tobacco Workers Union. Um, I always found Randy in the time I was able to know him. He was very approachable. He was very fair, even though he was very passionate and dedicated to labor and the local economy. So I'd like to propose a friendly amendment um, in honor of Randy's memory. I'd like to rename this the Randy L. Gann Project Labor Agreement. I'll agree to that friendly amendment. Thank you. That, that was it. All right. Uh, Councilmember Maxwell. Thank you, Council President. This is a no-brainer for me. As somebody who has spent most of his adult life as part of one union or another, I've been never been part of the building trades, but you know, when I was in the Bay Area, I was represented by SEIU. When I moved back to Fresno, I was part of the Fresno City Employees Association. When I moved back to the county, again, SEIU. And I can't begin to tell you how many times being part of a union has saved my butt when it comes to the workplace environment, when it came to fair wages and COLA increases in the Bay Area, that made a world of difference for a lot of people. And I think like council member Esmeralda Soria mentioned earlier, this is gonna be huge for the people living in the city of Fresno. Thousands of my constituents live at or below the poverty line and struggling to find real work. And what this PLA is gonna do is not only put people to work, but make sure that they could do so and get paid a fair wage, that they're not exploited, but most importantly, it creates a pipeline. It's not just gonna chew up and spit out these workers when this project or whatever these projects are get completed, it's going to wrap them into the larger uh, association and make sure that they have long-term jobs ahead of them to rebuild our city. I don't know how many folks on the council have been part of a union or from a union family, but I could tell you growing up and having union support makes a world of difference for these families when it comes to having a good quality of life. This is uh, in a very extremely uh, easy yes for me, and happy to support this project today. All right, Councilmember Bredefeld, you're next. Yes, um, uh, City Manager, you put out a memo, and I'd like you to address some of the things uh, that you did. But before you do this, one thing I want to address, you know, we make a whole issue about making sure the council chamber is closed to the public, and yet, some council members had one individual, and I don't need to mention the name because it's not about the individual. It's about council who say, we have to close it down to the public, except when it serves our interest to allow someone that we want in. It's a hypocritical. The public should be in this chamber. And if you make a stand where nobody should come in, then there shouldn't be certain exemptions that you have when it suits your purpose. That's all. Yeah, thank you, Councilmember Bradfeld. And I do appreciate the uh, council members having spent six months on this. That's, uh, I, I, I appreciate that. Yeah, and um, I think, uh, you know, because we're probably going to make you vote on this twice. And so the next time we come back on this, 
Um, we're going to run a video, and I think it'll be the video of Council Member Arias, uh, his comments about nobody likes a monopoly, and no individual group or individual or group should dictate policy to the city council. And here we are considering an agreement that would create a monopoly and dictate policy to the city of Fresno. So I'm going to go through it a little bit about how this process worked. You know, to start with, I've been it's been 31 years since I graduated from college with engineering. Um, I remain a licensed professional engineer. I've built about a billion dollars worth of stuff on both coasts. I don't know a lot about many things, but I know a lot about bidding and construction. This is what I put roof on my head, put my kids through college. This is what I know. Um, this is the day I've been waiting for to talk about this, because we've been nine months, six months behind closed doors having these meetings with council and the building trades, trying to push this thing through on the administration. And they can do it. We totally get it. That's, that's within their right. Appreciate their opportunity to let us sit in on this. Um, but now we can talk about this in public, so I'm hoping people are, people are watching. The reality is that the, uh, the union labor in the construction industry is not competitive. Their membership is declining. 87% of the, of the construction labor market is non-union. 13% are union. They need help. They need a competitive advantage given to them through a legislative action, and that's what this is. This is a legislative action so that the union labor building trades can be more competitive. They can get an advantage over everybody else. That's what this does. And I'll, and I'll read from the agreement specifically where it talks about that. Again, nobody likes a monopoly and no individual group should dictate policy to council, but here we are. It's stunning to me that we're the fifth largest city in the state, um, one of the top 40 in the nation, and we think so little of ourselves that we've got to we got to bow to a, 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 a special interest group to put our future of how we develop talent here in the city. I just, it's just stunning to me that that's the, that's the solution we've come to. Uh, it's a classic case of a solution in search of a problem because I hear about the performance of the PLA at the airport. It's not any better than the performance we've done on any other project. In fact, it's performing worse. The number of people who are outside the local area is greater with the PLA. The total number of people within the local area is less than we've done historically on projects, but yet we've come to this conclusion that it can be better. Well, it's not better. It's not better than what we've been doing without the PLA, so here we are. Hey, let's do a PLA. I'm still trying to understand what the, what the problem is we're trying to solve. The high-speed rail is one. We hear about the airport all the time. The high-speed rail is under a project PLA. For those of you who don't recall, Tulare Street has been closed for four years, no, sign, no, no time on when that's going to open again. Project has started at a billion, now it's two billion, way late. That's a PLA as well. Um, the council is pr proposing to adopt an agreement that serves, again, 87% of the construction industry is non-union, 13% are union, and we're about to uh, adopt an organization, uh, 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 a PLA agreement that caters to the minority at the expense of the majority. So here's what this agreement has. It's just terms right out of the agreement, just sentences right out of the agreement. The agreement governs all construction contracts awarded on city projects. And there's a definition of what all means, but it says all. A lot, of, a lot of really absolute terms in this. The agreement covers without limitation all activities on a project. The contractor and employers agree to be bound by each and every provision of this agreement. Those three things, that's dictating policy. We're allowing this group to dictate policy to the city. The contractor employees recognize the unions as the sole bargaining unit representative of all craft employees working within the scope of this agreement. Again, the union can't be competitive, so we have to put it in a contract that every craft has to be union affiliated and that they're going to be the representatives of that. That's what it says in the contract. Again, they can't be competitive, they need an advantage. Let's get the council to give us that advantage. The uh, contract employees shall make and transmit all deductions for union dues, fees, and assessments in accordance with all applicable master fee agreement. I'm sorry, master agreements. Pay to play with our money. The contractors agree to pay contributions to the vacation, pension, or other deferred compensation, apprenticeship, worker protection assistance, health benefit funds, established and applicable me measure master agreements. Again, 
pay to play. Those are costs that we would not incur without the PLA, but now the city's dollars, citizen dollars are gonna go into that, contractor will get that payment, write a check to the union, pay to play. All disputes, now here it is, local contractor, you have a local business, you have a local people you've hired, the PLA will require you to get people that you don't know assigned to your company to work on a project, and if it doesn't work out, all disputes involving discipline and discharge of employee working on the project shall be received through the grievance and arbitration provisions concerned in the master agreement. So the contractors didn't hire these people. They've been assigned these people. They don't work out. Now they gotta go through a three-step process to get them off the project. Who does that? What private company would say, hey, look, hey, Mike, you, got, you own a company. If you had to be told this is the only place you can get labor, and that's it, and if you decided to just leave with them, the, the, you, you'd have to be subject to rules outside of your, the way you run your business. I love you, Tommy, and I get your logic, but I'd be a union shop. I know, exactly, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so this is a pay-to-play agreement. It's gonna cost more. Um, you know, when we understand, again, council can do this. We, we get it, this is a thing you can do. Um, we'll make you do it twice, though, just because we like it. Tommy, can you, you keep saying pay to play agreement. Can you explain that to people who are yeah. watching who don't? This is, right out of the, this is right out of the agreement. Can you explain it for the layman to understand what you're Yeah, so the way this is going to work is that the unions uh, will receive, the union halls will receive a payment from the contractors as a result of this contract. The con and again, it's in the contract it says, contractors agree to pay contributions for all this stuff for every hour worked on the project in the amount designated in the applicable master fee agreement. So that's a dollar, so that's dollars we wouldn't pay if we didn't have the PLA. Those are dollars now that it's less potholes, it's less fencing, it's less parts, it's, it's less because we gotta, we gotta pay the union that stuff. City manager, could you also just elaborate, you said bring it twice, can you just elaborate on? Yeah, so, so, the, so you guys will do some vote today. We'll, I'll sit with the mayor. The mayor may have a decision to make and then that decision may require you to the, the mayor's going to veto it, is what the city manager is alluding to. So yeah, we might have to I vote on it twice. Committing to that yet, but that is the potential that we could, that we're proposing here. Um, so I guess you know what what we're prepared to do. We we identified in the in the memo the things we would like to see. We would like to see this exempt from local contractors. A local contractor started a business in the city hired city of Fresno residents to be journeymen, be apprentice. He knows them, he recruited them, he trained them. We want him to be exempt from the PLA so that he can go ahead and use his forces and thank you very much for opening a business here, hiring local city of Fresno residents. You don't have to do this because you've already done what we would expect the PLA to do. You, you did it. We, we want local people hired, we hired the local people. Um, we would also like it very explicitly that we don't want any, have to have anybody send money to any other agency for the right to participate in projects in the city. And that's the way the contract currently reads is every hour work, got to make a payment to the union. We would prefer that if you're a local contractor who's done the local work and hired the local people, why would you have to pay extra? You're already paying benefits, you're already paying a retirement, now you got to do it again. We just recommend that the local contractors be exempt from that, because they did the right thing. They've already done what we've asked them to do. Um, You're saying in addition to paying the salary, the wage, the retirement, there's a payment that has to go to the union hall, whether they're a union or not? Correct. Okay. And, and then the final thing that we talked about was just having, again, again, I don't know a lot about anything, but I know how bidding and construction. We need an we, we need the ability to exempt any project that we deem necessary from the PLA for whatever reasons it might be. Just things happen in the business after having done a billion dollars on both coasts and hurricanes, tornadoes, and ice storms, things happen. And we're gonna wanna go out on the street and bid a project and just say, hey, this one's gonna go out quick, easy, without the PLA, let's get this done and efficient and out. We've asked the, the labor units, the, the, bar, the trades council to consider that. They're not interested in considering that. Exempting local contractors, they're not interested in considering that. So, and then, the, and then the final thing is just, they made it clear during negotiations that they really can't tolerate anything in this agreement that would upset the trades in the Bay Area and in Southern Cal. And we, as the administration, made it very clear, we're not interested in dealing with 
or addressing problems you may have in the LA and Bay Area. We want a project labor agreement here in this Fresno that is specific to the city of Fresno. They're not interested. They, they're just, they just can't get there. And I understand why. I mean, it's a Me Too clause, and somebody in the Bay Area or Southern Salad Cow may want it. But we, we, we recognized at the meeting that we weren't interested in, uh, in, in, in dealing with labor issues in those other cities. So um, we are opposed to it as drafted. We prepared a memo that identified the changes we would like to see for us to be supportive. Those are rejected. Again, we may make, you, may, you may have to vote on this twice. Okay, so I have a question. Um, uh, Chuck, Rios, you're here. You've heard some of the concerns that the city manager said. Do you, I give you an opportunity to address any of them uh, as a representative, because I would like to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, I would. <laughs> yes, sir, thank you. Uh, Chuck Real House with the Building Chase. Happy to answer them. Yeah. Uh, I think that's why I'm here, uh, whether I should have been here or not, I guess. And it's not, my criticism room. wasn't of you, Chuck. No, no, I got it, I understand, okay. I understand, sir. The politics of it gets kind of crazy, but yeah. too numerous to mention. But um, where do you want me to start? Wherever, wherever you want, I mean, you know, th these Tommy are the concerns. Tommy was wrong on every point. That's <laughs> to make it really clear. Absolutely wrong, it's bad faith bargaining. He started out from day one working against the whole document, um, so what do you want me to tell you? It was through a process of negotiations. We tried to educate. I went to breakfast with them a couple of times. Sometimes you just can't educate them. Sometimes you just can't show them the light because they're gonna disagree with you anyway. It does his, I didn't know how far I wanted to go today, but it does shine a light on how he bargained throughout the six, eight months, you know? And so knowing what I know now, hearing from him now, he doesn't get the crux of bargaining. He doesn't get really the attitude. He had a fixed idea of what he thought we were about, what the intent of this agreement is, and where we were going. And he never, in my opinion, negotiated in good faith with an open mind to what this project labor agreement is all about. And so, uh, give me one example or one thing that he said. So let me ask you, do contractors have to make payments to the union for every project hour worked? No, not to the union, to the trust accounts. To, to the, the trust payment. accounts, to the trust account. Do they have to make payments? Well, we need to be clear in our language, Tommy. When you say to the unions, mm -hmm. other people don't recognize that as that. So right. when we talk about those trust agreements, but, yes. But, but a payment has but, to be made by a contractor to somebody that's above and beyond what would be normally required in a, in a project. Absolutely not. It's prevailing rate. You can't get around prevailing rate. There's nothing above and beyond required. It's a prevailing rate job. And so these are earmarked funds to pension and health care and to wage. And it's not an employee payback. Contractor pays this. It's a, it's it's a city money, right? That's expense. city money. Contractor payment will be city money. Wage that the city is required to pay. And we would pay prevailing wage. Yes, I would imagine. But yeah, yes. We pay prevailing it's, wage. It's not above and beyond. It's not a double payment. It's not anything to that regard. Is there another one you'd like me to correct? Yeah, I mean, the contract says we've got to make that payment. You're saying that we don't have to make that payment. The contractor doesn't have to make that payment to the trust funds. No, you will pay to the trust funds. Yep. I think Mr. Holtzman will back me that back up that as well. Yeah. Right. Can we get the, our, our attorney, Mr. Holtzman, to explain why there is... Oh, hold on, Councilmember Member Arias. Uh, Council Member Bredefeld has the floor. Yeah, He's was asking there anything this I mean, really, I mean, I, I didn't well, mean to be kind of dismissive when I said everything was wrong, but it, it kind of is because he never really grasped it. So I don't want to be come off as snide. Or, you know, I'm, I'm happy to answer every question. So, or Council Member do you have well, a specific you, question, yes, I guess? If you, just, if you uh, could, that would, help, that would be helpful. Well, Tommy, you had mentioned, well, the, I'd like to get this clarified, because you're saying there's an additional payment above the prevailing wage? It says, it says in the contract that we've got to make payments to the trust fund. It's not in addition to prevailing rate. It's part of prevailing rate. Mm -hmm. It's not in addition John. to. Is the mic... Can we turn this mic on? John, you just click it up and then we'll wait a few seconds. Thank you. And then just maybe tap on it a little bit. There, there you go. go. You're on. All right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there are two pieces going on here. Um, the, the payments that are made to the trust funds um, are not in addition to prevailing wage. So what happens if it's covered 
under PLA or if, if you're a union contractor to begin with, is that some portion of the prevailing wage amount goes to benefits. For those who are not, they get, the, they get all that money in cash, uh, but they don't obviously get the money put into uh, a trust fund. So, so Chuck is right in the sense that it doesn't add to the prevailing wage. The prevailing wage is a number. It, what it does do is it takes some of that prevailing wage that would otherwise go to an employee directly and puts it into a trust fund. Uh, actually, a couple of trust funds. There's health and welfare, there's pension, there's apprenticeship. There are usually a, a number of different trust funds. So the answer is the overall bottom line doesn't, for a contractor, the cost doesn't, isn't greater. But it does take a significant amount of money that might otherwise go to an employee and it puts it in the trust Put, fund. Puts it into Thank you, John. Okay. So instead of the employee getting it, it goes into a fund that is related to what? Union membership? No. Um, so, so to be clear, and Chuck was right about this, um, these are trust funds, first of all. They're not the union itself. The trust funds are nominally at least independent of the unions themselves. And um, the, the main two trust funds that cost money are pension and health and welfare. Uh, so health and welfare obviously provides uh, health insurance uh, and pension uh, is, is pension. Uh, usually the criticism that you hear is that even though health and welfare you qualify for in maybe 90 days, it's different for different unions, uh, that pension, there's a, there's a period you have to work before you qualify for that. Okay. Are local contractors exempt from these PLAs? They are not exempt uh, from the PLA. They're not treated, the contractors themselves are not treated any differently if they're uh, within the city or outside the city under this PLA. Uh, they, it, it does focus on employees and whether they're within the city or not, but, but it does not treat the contractors differently. So let me ask you then, uh, without the PLA versus the PLA, how would not how are non-union contractors or employees different under a PLA versus having the PLA? So if you're a non-union employee or employer, there are two different issues. Oh, uh, let, oh. let me do both for you. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, so if you're a non-union employer, you sign uh, an agreement to be bound in order as a condition of working on the project to be bound by the PLA. You are not required to sign a, a master agreement of any of the unions and become signatory to the union. But for the life of the project, you're effectively bound by the rules of the master agreements of each of the unions, but only for the life of the project. Once you, once you leave the project, you're, you're on your own again. And the, and the PLA is very explicit. So what does that, that mean logistically if you're so, bound by the rules? What so are, a couple of different things. It means you operate under, under the rules that are in their master labor agreements, which are labor contracts, and there are various you know, job rules and other things. You get the wages, you get, actually get prevailing wage, it doesn't really matter, but you get the wages that are provided uh, and you pay the benefits uh, that are required uh, to the trust funds. So that's, those are the key reasons, the key differences. The other big difference, and this is the one that, that, that uh, I think the administration is most focused on, is that you are required by and large to get your labor referred by the union hiring halls. Uh, that the exception to that is if you are a non-union contractor, you have a right to have up to five what are called core workers. That's workers that are from your own workforce who've worked for you for a while. And you get them on, it's a one for one. So uh, what first happens, the first worker is a union worker. Second would be your own worker. Third worker would be a union worker, again, coming from the hiring hall. Fourth one would be your own worker, up to five of your own workers. So that's a benefit, obviously, to the unions, clearly. Because if you're a non-labor contractor and you have your own employees, you're now restricted from definitively bringing all of the employees on because you have to go to, the net, to a union, then you go to yours, then you go to a union. This is what that, you're saying. That, that's, that's right. Okay. So that, that obviously, a disadvantage to a private... Uh, non-union contractor who has his own set of workers all the time. That, that, I mean, I, I, don't, I can't speak to whether it's a disadvantage, but, but obviously the, the, the fact of the matter is you don't get to bring all your workers. Okay. Yeah, and is there any other fiscal um, um, thing that impact to a non-union contract or to their employee by having to be in a PLA? Does some dollar go to these sure. unions versus in their own pocket? Yes, so, so the effect on the employee is the following. Um, 
if you, because you're entitled to prevailing wage, many and, and many uh, of these employers don't, don't provide you know, benefits, et cetera, you get the entire prevailing wage amount you know, in cash, in wage. Uh, whereas if you are uh, under a PLA or if you're obviously a member of the union, um, you, uh, a portion of that money is taken off to pay for health and welfare, to pay for pension, and there are a couple of other usually small trust funds as well. Okay. So, you know, for me, and uh, Tommy, was there anything you wanted to add? Before? No, I'm gonna, I will continue, but go ahead. I'm good for right now. Okay. For, for me, you know, I've uh, supported a PLA, um, but I, it's on a project by project basis. That's my problem for me. We are now in, enacting a policy, a five year policy that any project over a million dollars will be subject to a PLA. That's my problem. When Tommy says, you know, we're doing a solution in search of a problem, I'm not sure why we're doing this. Um, it doesn't appear to enhance having any more local hires from the city of Fresno doing a PLA, which obviously would be uh, an important thing. Based on the data that you're presenting, there isn't an advantage from the PLAs looking at the PLAs. I mean, Chick, you may have a, a different analysis, but that's the data that's coming. So I, I'm not interested in tying the hands of the city into a PLA for five years for any project over a million dollars. It doesn't make sense to me. I think it's bad policy to, to do that. Um, as, and as I've said, I, I don't see a problem with looking at a project by project PLA. And I think we can look at PLAs and some of them have worked out and some of them haven't worked out as, as Tommy has alluded to. But this, this is just setting a bad precedent and that's why I can't support it. I'm not going to support it um, because I think it does tie our hands. It does uh, create potential problems uh, as Tommy's alluded to in terms of the language. And so for me, I'm not going to support this. And, and Tommy, was there anything? Because this is my time. I wanted to give you the opportunity. No, to I think I think the, um, you know, just just in closing again, they, I, Chuck and I did go to breakfast, and we had the discussion about, you know, this is about you guys can't be competitive. You guys need a hand up. You need a lift. You need help. Is there another way we can do that other than tying the city's hands? Every project over a million, they get to be the exclusive representatives of all crafts on projects that just. Why would we abdicate and cede control of our bidding and our construction bidding process? That's the part I just not comfortable with. I, I, the project by project, twenty-five million dollar fire station coming up. You know, I could see that, but just doing 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 a blanket for policy, I'm I'm, I'm having a difficult time with that. Yes. Yeah, uh, and again, just my time. Uh, do you want to ask something? I just or? want Chuck to address why the workforce component that is critical, that I, I get it. We're saying, you know, one local core employee of the existing contractor, if he's a non-union, and then the labor one, the union. I want you guys to understand the crux of that, because that's what's important in terms of, I don't know if you've gone to any of the graduation yeah, I have. of the apprentices. Can you speak to that? Because that's really the center of why I drove this policy. It's about the pipeline. And without this type of agreement, we miss out on the opportunity to really build on the pipeline. Project by project makes it a lot harder because then you don't have the ability to be consistent. You want stability and consistency in order to turn out people to become journeymen. And so that's, if you can speak to that, because I think that's so critical and I think we're missing that component. This is about the future of Fresno, and I think we're getting caught up on other things that may be somewhat important, but the fundamental piece is workforce development for the future of the city. And Fresno residents, residents that don't get typical opportunities um, in the other apprentices. Yes, thank you, uh, council member. Um, sorry. Uh, let me start by saying just because I don't respond um, to the city manager's uh, comments doesn't mean I endorse them or that I say he's right. Um, but I won't engage uh, that. I think the, the more important discussion is exactly what Council Member Soria was addressing. Uh, if I could put it in a nutshell, we do this and I engage in this for apprenticeship opportunities. 
in order to target uh, certain demographics in the community, any community, whatever community that's engaging in a project labor agreement, we need to have a project labor agreement in order to target those demographics for those first year apprenticeship opportunities. Uh, Mr. Bredefield, I know you're a supporter of apprenticeship. I, you've been there in the past, and, and I harbor no ill will towards your comments today. Mm -hmm. uh, I respect that. Um, but to, it is truly about apprenticeship. And if I may put it in a nutshell, this, I, I believe the city council is about to do something that's historic and very, very, very responsible to the community. Because basically what it does is it allows us in the building trades to continue to, to prep and prepare the future workforce that we're gonna need. And that future workforce is a targeted workforce. We, in the building trades, and I say this without reservations, have solved some of the homelessness issues. We have solved recidivism issues. Not completely, but we have taken people that were justice, that were touched in the legal system, and we moved them into journeyman. We have taken people that were homeless, and we moved them into apprenticeship where they now can sustain themselves and their family, and they have health care. I have example after example mm -hmm. of what we've done that. All we're looking to do is create a pipeline of future work. And if you do this for five years, you see, I have monies coming from the state of California to do workforce preparedness programs. The high-speed rail funds another pre-apprenticeship program that we run, and we're putting that pipeline together. Yeah. Fresno Unified School District right. is a sponsor of MC3, which is a feeder into our program. I have 32 Fresno Unified graduates last year that are on, gonna be on the list for these pers pers uh, prospective jobs with the city of Fresno. Mm -hmm. So Council Member Soria is absolutely correct. If, it's, it's almost like having a job for 15 years, you're more apt to get the loan. I have jobs coming up for the next five years. Be it 15% of the city's work is all it is, but that's all it takes for me to continue to prepare these students, these applicants, these citizens for access to a viable apprenticeship. You see, so the more, because what I don't want to do is train up 100 people a year and have no place to put them or no reasonable place to put them because then you're just flooding the market. You see, but if I can go out there and say, look, I have a project labor agreement, it's gonna amount to X amount of jobs, X amount of opportunities for first year apprentices, allow me to go in the community and, and train these people for access to apprenticeship so that they can get successfully into the middle class, then that's what I'm gonna do. That's where I think the crux of it is. And I think that's the frustration from some of the council members is that vision or that thought is not even being heard. You see that, so it is vital to complete the pipeline for a project labor agreement to be there because it does more, more, way more for a community than the conversation we're having here. It could, really does. But Chuck, could not, on the reverse side of that, a non-union contractor make the very same arguments that they have people that they work, that they train, that if they were able into, to enter into a five-year agreement that favored their workforce, that they would help all of the issues that you've outlined, and, and I've seen what happens, it happens, you're exactly right, but could they not make the same argument? I'm curious why they don't engage in project labor agreements. I'd like to know that. I wish somebody would ask them that. Mm -hmm. Why is it they don't go and commit themselves to a 30% local hire piece? Why don't they commit themselves to first year apprenticeship as well? Why don't they make the same commitments that the building trade unions are willing to make? Because they can go do what I do. Mm -hmm. Project labor agreements are not designed just for unions. Everybody can use them. It's a curious question. Mm -hmm. I don't, they'll never answer it to me. No, I, 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 they I, I, may I, I, answer it to we, others. We've got, we got the data. Excuse me. Hang on one Excuse second. Me, Let her finish and, please, and then Tommy. Please. Go ahead. Go ahead. You see, so there, there's all these different reasons why they'll give you for engaging. You know, I happen to have my opinion on why I do, but I'll reserve that for another day. But yeah, that's a curious question. Why don't they engage in these type of, why don't they commit the way we've committed to the, to the, to the demographics that we're trying to benefit in this uh, uh, project labor agreement with the city of Fresno that I'm about to do in the city of Madera. Okay. And I'm about to do in the city of Selma. And I'm gonna do it throughout the Central Valley. Council because Member. I believe the Central Valley okay. needs okay. these types of job opportunities in order for us to uh, elevate. Okay. Uh, let Tommy go and then Miguel. If you, yeah. yeah, well, Tommy the reason go. they don't do it is because they're doing it now. I mean, we're getting the same local hire numbers without a PLA now. That's why they're not promoting it. Why, why do it? Because we're already doing it without the PLAs. We're getting the local hire numbers. We're getting. So for, them, for him to say that, why don't they do it? Well, we're already doing it. That, that's, that's, 
so now if we want to do something different, then let's talk about what we need to do different. But this, the numbers Tommy, are pretty this much. This is something different. Can you talk about the, no, 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 but it's the apprentice numbers. Hey, 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 Council, we're like going all over the place but, right yeah. now. Council member Bredefeld has the floor. He invited Chuck up to speak and answer some questions. He has the floor right yeah, now. And, and I want to be respectful. Miguel wants to ask a question. And I, I still yeah. want the floor. Well, Council member Bredefeld, why don't you yeah. get done with your questions and then I can call on the council member so we're not talking over each other. One comment for Council member Bredefeld. Yeah, and, and then I'll give it back to you. Yes. I, I just want to point out Tommy's remark Based on his memo, 63% of the recharge Fresno workforce came from the county of Fresno or 25 miles of the city. 69% of public works came from the county of Fresno or within 25 miles of the city. 53% of the park structure, city of Fresno, a county of Fresno or within 25 mile radius. This proposal says the majority will come from the city of Fresno, not within 25 miles and not from the county. So just want to point out, what we've been doing has fed local in the definition of 25 miles from within the city of Fresno or the county. We're trying to do better. And, and we can and do focus better. focus more. That we can way. do better. We just, again, without the PLA, because the way we structured the bid documents before was local area, 25 mile. If council's expectation is, I want it in city limits, okay, we'll change the bid document and say, City of Fresno, city limits of city of Fresno, and we'll get the numbers. But we that wasn't the intent on recharge Fresno. If that's the intent, we just changed the front end bid documents. City of Fresno is where the numbers are now going to come from, and we'll get the numbers. I mean, it just it'll just happen. The market will react to that. What we're asked, what we're being told is, you can only do it with the by providing a monopoly to the building trades, so they can be the exclusive owner of all of the crafts trades. And we're saying. Not really. We could do it without it. Just change the bid documents. Okay. Uh, I appreciate it. Chuck, thank you for coming up and answering. And frankly, I don't think this would have been as helpful if Chuck wasn't here. And I really wish, frankly, we opened up the chamber and let people come <laughs> who have things to say to us. It's quite what? different than when they're standing at the mic and we're asking questions than being on Zoom. Well, so, council, well, well this is played, very Council Member Bredesel. <laughs> well played. Thank you. <laughs> On, on that, it, it just just you know, council could just hear me for a quick second, and and I appreciate the the, the conversation out here because I think some of us were not on the committee, Councilman Redford, you were not, I was not, I was on the first negotiation, but I I, I think at this point, just for the sake of the conversation, um, the folks that were on the committee, you're not going to convince our city manager otherwise. I think it, 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 that's a moot point by now, but I, I get it. I, I, I know we're going to go cross point by cross point and bringing up old projects and all that, but let's try to focus the conversation on this going forward because I think there's a lot of value in what Councilwoman Soria mentioned about the pipeline, the apprenticeship program, and the percentage of workforce that's going to be on, on this project. Uh, Councilmember Bredefoy, you were done with your questions, right? All right, uh, Councilmember Arias? I, I just want to point out a couple of things. Um, the word monopoly has been used a lot, so we're going to get a monopoly set for all of us. Uh, but just to clarify, you know, FPOA has a monopoly on representing officers for police. Fresno Fire Union has a monopoly on representing firefighters for the city, right? Um, that's basic labor 101. A union represents a group of employees. It's not a bad thing, you know. Uh, this agreement allows union and non-union companies to bid. It allows the union and non-union employees to work on it. And if they're non-union employees, they don't have to pay the union fees. But they do have to compensate, and a portion of their, of their compensation goes for is health and welfare benefits and a pension, which the pandemic, in my view, has demonstrated to all of us. Those are three key things that we all need. A good salary, good health benefits, and a good pension so that when we all get old, we can retire and not have to be stuck with, you know, um, whatever Social Security has left for us, which won't be much, and end up in the motel room because skyrocketing rent increases um, are growing faster the, than your, you know, uh, fixed income is. So I, I, I understand the city manager, and today gives you a preview of the robust conversations we've had for months, and I value his input and his perspective, um, but this is something that we've been intentional. We have studied it significantly, and this is our best foot forward. I do recognize, like Councilwoman Sorian and the mayor that we've had discussions with, 
we also have to do something that addresses the barriers for local businesses to do business with this building. We know that. We've agreed that the administration should spend some time um, assessing whether it's bonding you know, requirements, insurance requirements, how they bid projects to figure out how we give Fresno headquarter companies to employ Fresnans an opportunity to do business with the city more than historically has been. That's important work. Unfortunately, it'll take a few months of you know, um, problem solving to put together a, a draft policy. I'm willing to be completely open and supportive of that, um, but you know, this is a good step forward to increasing the highly skilled workforce. And just so people understand, apprentice, 800 hours of classroom time, 8,000 hours of work experience time. So when you're, a contractor is going to the hall, they're getting a highly skilled worker more than they would off the street um, if they're looking for a significant construction project. That's a value for me. I think it's a value for the city and somebody who represents a lot of working class neighborhoods, especially west of the 99. It's a good job for them to have, and um, you know, it's, it's it's not a bad thing that it, workers have unions to represent their interests and their needs. Thank you. All right, thank you, Council. I, I know that we really love listening to ourselves speak, but let's hear from the public. Uh, at this point, we got Mr. Juan Sandoval, uh, and we've got quite a bit of speakers. So we're going to do two minutes. I ask you to be respectful of the two minute uh, marker. Um, you get that bell. It's time to wrap it up. All right, Mr. Sandoval, you have two minutes, sir. Hi there, how are you guys doing today? You guys hear me? Hear yes, me? go ahead, sir. Okay, okay, good afternoon once again. Uh, my name is Juan Sandoval. I am a Fresno resident. This is my first year of apprenticeship with the uh, Metal Workforce in the local union at the 104. There's a lot of opportunities for a good middle-class job in Fresno if you don't have a four-year degree. Being an apprentice has given me that opportunity that you don't get that much from personal residents. It's helped me quite a bit. I'm a person that likes to work with my hands. And I do enjoy being able to uh, go to work and learn something new every day. With this, uh, I can't express how grateful I am for this career, this great opportunity to grow in front of me. Citywide labor work project agreement will help us shape the community for the better. Create a system within the construction industry here that the hardworking construction workers are important to be thriving in the community. I want to raise my children in a city that values myself and others of the hard work we put in. And being part of it, you know, it's not to be grateful where I can drive around the town and tell my kids, look, your dad had something to do with something in that building or in that school. And, you know, supporting this uh, PLA is gonna do that, just that. And um, I wanna thank you guys for taking the opportunity uh, to commit to our city and our time. And hopefully, you know, by supporting this PLA, you know, it'll give more people like myself a better chance for something better and something to be more proud of that you took part in something in the city. Thank you guys again. Thank you, Mr. Sandoval. Next is Ms. Nicole Gearing. Ms. Gearing, you'll have two minutes. Good afternoon, Mayor and President Chavez and members of the Fresno City Council. Nicole Gearing with the Associated Builders and Contractors Northern California Chapter. Been working with our uh, member contractors in Fresno for the past 15 years. Some who have been in business in the city of Fresno for over 60 years employing local Fresno residents who are now potentially not gonna be able to work on the PLA, the workers. It's an estimated 16,000 workers um, in the Fresno region will now be impacted and not be able to work. We absolutely support inclusive PLAs and all apprenticeship programs and all pipelines. We are in fact doing the same thing that the building trades are doing. So now you are in fact closing a pipeline uh, for the seventh year in a row, skilled trades remain the hardest jobs to fill with more than 500,000 skilled construction workers needed, according to Build Your Future. So closing up pipelines is not going to help the construction industry. In regards to the payments into the uh, 
the, the mandate for the payments into the union trust funds, there's a McGowan report out that came out actually in 2009. The report found that non-union employees lose an estimated 34% of their total compensation package when working on a construction project subject to a government mandated, mandated PLA. These lost wages and benefits to these workers should be considered wage theft as non-union employee, employees on PLA contracts are required to pay a portion of their paycheck to unions and union benefit plans as a condition of employment, yet they will not realize any benefit unless they join the union and or meet certain vesting requirements. I strongly urge you to support the staff's recommendation and include the exemption for the Fresno contractors so that they can continue to build their community. The, the prod, uh, Fresno contractors are currently working on the Fresno Animal Shelter Project, the Kingdoms of Asia, $26 million project, a Zuplex, $12.5 million project. You're not going to get these, these uh, contractors working on any, any of these projects. You're going to be subject to be getting one bid as they've been receiving. Uh, one example is the city of Watsonville. They put a project out to bid first time, 58% over the budget had to have a second bidder the second time, and so on and so on. And you heard that in Selma. You're, you're hearing it in Stockton. You're hearing it in Sacramento. There, you're just not going to get any bidders. It's going to impact the city's projects. I strongly urge you to reject the PLA and work for more inclusive language. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next up is Mr. Tim Bremer. Mr. Bremer, you'll have two minutes. Is he still queued up? Did he work? Did you unmute? Tim, you just need to unmute yourself. Okay. 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 Hey, I, I got that. Okay. My name is Tim Bremer, and I'm owner of Harris Electric because we have been in business and working in the city of Fresno for 58 years. I have 30 employees, approximately 30 employees, and four of those employees are apprentice, ABC apprentice. Um, we have we have worked on project uh, we have worked on city projects in the past, and we are working on city projects currently. We will not work or bid on a project labor agreement. In my opinion, if if you want to hire local people working on your jobs, you just need to exclude companies like mine from the PLA that would be able to bid on the projects. The um, and that's basically my, my point of view on that so. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, next up is Ms. Lisa Flores. Ms. Flores, you'll have two minutes. Ms. Flores? She uh, queued up. I don't know. Thank you, President Chavez. How can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go can ahead, Ms. Flores. Me? Can you hear me? Go ahead, Ms. Flores. You're on. Hello. Oh, okay. Thank you. As a uh, born and raised, okay, I'm trying to talk. Um, born and raised as a child of labor, um, being a former union president, um, my only question is, is the Central Labor Council behind this or do they need to go back to the table and renegotiate part of this? Um, because for, after hearing um, Tommy speak, he just seems so anti-labor, dude. You know, you're enjoying a vacation, you enjoy pensions, and you're gonna enjoy Labor Day. That's pretty clear. It was brought to you by labor unions. Um, I stand with my brothers and sisters in the trades. Um, you need to raise the standard of living in Fresno. Undercut wages. You undercut your society. You undercut the value of your workers. You know, we have so many big box stores in town. Why? Because of the cheap and skilled labor. You're trying now to improve the labor base in Fresno. You know, all you have to do is look out at the natural disasters that have hit um, in the last thing that's most needed. Electricians, welders, plumbers, people that get things done, people that make our lives good what the big fuss is about, but I would like to know if the Central Labor Council wants to go back to the table and re renegotiate any part of this. Um, you know, uh, I just look at, you know, you, it should never be looked upon 
in a negative light as to make sure that somebody has benefits as something as simple as insurance, as something as simple as a pension. And when you look down on that and you don't want workers to have that, shame on you, Tommy. Shame on you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Flores. Uh, next up is uh, Mr. Colton Worthington. Uh, Mr. Worthington, you will have two minutes. Uh, Mr. Worthington, is he, is he still queued up, Brianna? Mr. Worthington, you just have to unmute yourself. Sorry about that. I honestly lost my phone for a second. I was scurrying around to find it. Can you hear me? We can hear you, sir. Go ahead. All right. Um, I thank you guys for allowing me to talk. Um, as you said, my name is Colton Worthington. Um, I'm a worker for Value Unique Electric. Um, currently a, an apprentice, um, my fourth year. And, uh, you know, first off, I got to say, I wish uh, we could be more transparent in the council because when we hear you guys talk, it's easy to see that you guys are, are based on just you're focused on what's, what's good for you. And sometimes it's frustrating to try and get stuff that's better for the city when we're pushed behind people that are trying to, trying to push things for their benefit. And I'm not trying to come at you. It's just how it seems. And I wish we could be transparent about things. Secondly, um, for non-unions, this completely makes it non-competitive for them. The union, the, the reason they want this, like, it, like uh, I think his name was Thomas said, is that it, it's, it makes it so much easier for unions to get jobs and they're struggling right now and that's what they want. That's why they're pushing it. Why would they push something to be non-competitive? What we want in the business is to be competitive because what it does is it makes prices better. It makes it better for you guys because when you have non-competitive, what's gonna happen is now prices are gonna go up, the bids are gonna come in higher. You guys are gonna to have to cough up more money because you don't have competitive people bringing down the prices and trying to do the job the right way. I've worked on my company served for 25 years here and we've done a lot of work for Fresno and I've seen that they're bringing the, the, um, uh, the trade, like the trade schools back to high schools and it's becoming something that's, it's not that it's a union or a non-union thing, it's that we have gone away from the trade work and we need to bring that back to Fresno rather than try and fight each other about it. Union and non-union can work together and be able to, to coincide together. And the problem is that everybody's going at each other and trying to say that one's doing one thing and one's not doing the other. And what we need to do is be unity about this and actually serve Fresno the right way. I'm tired of people fighting about this and trying to say that it's not benefiting one or the other. I mean, of course, you guys want to come to the table and try and provide something that's better for them. But on the other hand, are we really trying to provide something that's better for Fresno? Why aren't we just pursuing going out home to home, going to schools, handing out pamphlets for all the companies out there and allowing them to choose themselves instead of trying to force them to choose? When you try and push PLAs and things like this, now you're forcing them to go to union because they know that's where the job's going to be at the moment. When you force the non-union to have to pay things or have to coincide to rules that they're not used to, people aren't gonna to wanna to work there or they're not gonna to wanna to bid the job because it's gonna cost them more money. It's gonna make it harder for them to get on the job. And with the four, like the, for example, the four by like four for thank four. Thank you, Mr. Worthington. All right, thank you. Thank you. Next up is Mr. Garrett Pizarnski. Mr. Pizarnski, you have two minutes, sir. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, sir, go ahead. Good afternoon. My name is Garrett Pizarnski. I work for West Tech Systems in Clovis. I'm enrolled as an apprentice electrician in WECA, uh, which is non-union. And what's concerning about this to me is this discriminates against me as a non-union apprentice. I should have the freedom to choose between union and a non-union apprenticeship program without being punished by the city rules or the city council I make a prevailing wage. I have benefits. I'm noticing a lot of people are, they're trying to make it seem like a non-union apprenticeship program. Doesn't provide insurance, doesn't provide benefits. I make much better uh, wages and I have much better insurance than I did before I was in an apprenticeship program. And another thing too, is it's very difficult. I worked for years to get where I'm at just to get accepted into an apprenticeship program and getting into a union apprenticeship program is much more difficult. It's nearly impossible, you know, from to get into one. But either way, whether how difficult it is or not, I should be able to choose over the apprenticeship program I want to go into without having, uh, without being punished by the city 
just because a union needs to destroy the free market in order to compete. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Mr. Jesse Salufo. Mr. Salufo, you have two minutes, sir. All right. Um, yeah, my name is Jesse Salufo. Uh, I was actually born here in Fresno, graduated from Clovis West, and I work for a non-union company, and I'm a second-year non-union apprentice here in Fresno also. Um, so like Colton Garrett said, um, especially Garrett, I feel like, yeah, uh, Miss Esmeralda, especially, I feel like uh, you think maybe only unions have apprenticeships, but I have full benefits. I have a five-year apprenticeship program that I'm going through. Um, so I don't see, kind of like they were saying, if it goes to a union company, it, it seems like it's, it's forcing unions to get all the, the jobs. And I have bills I have to pay and everything because um, I currently make prevailing wage. But, you know, if it goes that way, well, I don't know. Um, and Ms. Es Esmeralda, I graduate my apprenticeship in three years, I'd like to invite you. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Mr. Jeffrey Roberts. Uh, Mr. Roberts, you'll have two minutes, sir. If you could unmute yourself. Thank you, uh, President Chavez, for the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Jeff Roberts, <coughs> Regional Director with District Council 16, International Union of Painters and Allied Trades. And I'm also humbly and proud to serve as the Vice President of the Local Union, President of Madera Tulare County Building Trades and Secretary Treasurer of the Central Labor Council. I've heard a lot of uh, talking today about prevailing wage. <clears throat> I'm hoping that everybody understands that most counties in the state of California, the prevailing wage is set by the union's craft total package. The opposition to these PLAs, the non-union workers that are talking would not be making the prevailing, a prevailing wage without a union setting that wage. We do not hold them in all the counties. A classic example, and I'm embarrassed to tell you, my glazers who are architectural glass workers in Tulare and Kings County, we do not hold the prevailing wage there. The prevailing wage there is $14 an hour. $14 an hour, minimum wage. We were talking about apprenticeship and training. We have pre-apprenticeship programs that are coming through the building trades that are putting people to work in jobs that now that they're being able to provide for their families, they have health care not only for themselves, but for their entire family. And when they reach the age of 62, 63, 64, and they're tired, they're going to be able to retire with a pension. So I, I really get upset when I hear people talking about making the prevailing wage, and I don't think they really understand where it comes from. Without us, without the unions, there would be no prevailing wage, period. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. Hey, one, one, one more thing real quick, if, I, if my time's not up, Mr. President. It, it, it's been two minutes, Mr. Roberts, but go ahead, okay. wrap up. Okay. The underground economy. Every, every year, um, we... Uh, the school districts within this valley do, do repaints and we uh, as a union monitor those projects um, under prevailing wage laws in the state of california the contractors whether they're union or non-union are required to submit a certified payroll and certified payroll is great sure uh, but it doesn't necessarily keep the underground economy from coming forward a lot of times employers will falsify certified payroll, and there's really no way to prove it unless an individual steps forward. Classic example of that is with the repaints in school districts. Uh, but I got some stuff going on right now where the workers that are working for non-union contractors that were awarded these projects are coming forward and saying that, and showing, showing their pay stubs that they're not being paid the proper wages on these projects, that they're not um, allowed to have their lunches or their Thank you, Mr. Roberts. Great. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Garrett Fairbanks is our next speaker. Mr. Fairbanks, you'll have two minutes, sir. 
Uh, uh, good evening, council members. Um, my name is Gary Fairbanks. I was born and raised in Fresno. Um, graduated from Clovis High. I had just currently gone into the week apprenticeship program um, and started uh, started working for 3D TSI. Um, it's been an overall great experience for me. Um, my main concern is, um, as per the five, what was that, a five-person core workforce, if a private company is only allowed five people of their own company to work on said project, uh, why would why would they care to put me on the job? Why would they care to put a low-level apprentice on the job if it's not going to get the, if they're not going to perform as quickly as their journeyman, right? <clears throat> so it's, you, you say you want a pipeline for, for your apprenticeship uh, through the union, but you're cutting off any other apprenticeship from providing their apprentices with hours. And, um, and it's, it's just kind of concerning that you would, you would try to give such a monopoly to one uh, organization rather than put the hands of the economy into the people of Fresno. And I just, I think it should be, I agree, it should be kind of a base to base, um, like a project to project. It should not be a five-year contract. It should be, what is the best idea for this project and for the city at this moment? And that's really all I got to say. Thank you, sir. Next up is Mr. Eric Kristen. Mr. Kristen, you'll have two minutes, sir. Thank you for your time, council member of council. Eric Kristen, executive director of the Coalition for Fair Employment and Construction. The most frustrating thing about this being shoved through like this is the disingenuous nature of PLA proponents this entire time. And specifically, I'll address the four reasons why. First thing we say is, well, this is something that's taken six months to negotiate. Why did it take six months? Why didn't it take six hours? This is a PLA like every other PLA that I've read. And a PLA at the heart of a PLA is all about four provisions, which have hardly been talked about at all today. You're listed, you're limited to four or five workers if you're not local non-union employer employing local workers. Why would you do that? What does that have to do with building local at all? Why would you expect a contractor to employ people that he has no relationship with, isn't sure of their quality or capability? Section 8.3, I'm sorry, Section 10 deals with benefits. This hasn't been discussed at all today. Even the city manager and the council member Redifield couldn't even address this key point. When the contributions that are made to the union trust funds are made, they are lost to the workers unless they vest, which is five to 10 years for unions. Why is that in your PLA? You didn't negotiate that. It's like every other PLA that's been negotiated. What does that have to do with anything? That is wage theft. Is that a progressive value now? I wasn't aware of that one. You're stealing money from workers' paychecks, their prevailing wage. Councilmember Maxwell said unions are necessary in order to get good pay. Not under a PLA, he's voting to steal money from workers. Could we discuss that a little bit? The city manager didn't actually do a very good job of that. I think he should take that question up and have it addressed to him. If the non-union worker doesn't vest, does he lose that money? And lastly, Councilmember Arias skipped over apprentices. If they're non-union, they are explicitly forbidden. It's in there. Section 11, read it. That's explicit discrimination, also a progressive value I was unaware of. Please be open and honest about what this PLA is doing. Paying back donors and people who are ideologically in support of what you're doing, not about helping local workers. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Christian. Next up is Mr. Cody McDougall. Mr. McDougall, you'll have two minutes, sir. All right, good afternoon. My name is Cody McDougall. I went to Clovis West High School. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak today. Um, you know what, I have a, a list of things that I was gonna say, but this was a very uh, intense conversation and, and I, I'm a union local 104 sheet metal worker and I completely agree with council member Soria. Um, they, Man, I just can't say enough about what has what the union has done for my life personally. I was homeless. I was a, a drug addict for 10 years. I didn't know what to do. I had tried construction jobs before, uh, you know, non-union here, there, you know, doing framing, and I didn't have a pathway. I didn't have a catalyst. There was no um, draw for me to continue. But when I found out about unions, I found out there was a set um, – 
wage increase per period or year that I was included in, no matter what. I just showed up to work, I shut up, and I, and I just suited up, and put my boots on, and I went to work. So while, while I did that, I also had to go to school. And when I was going to school, I learned a lot of very valuable information. In fact, I've been accredited uh, as a welder through, the, uh, through my apprenticeship coordinator, who is a CWI, which stands for a Certified Welding Inspector, through the American Welding Society. And that is a society that uh, makes sure every structure is built according to specific, very specific guidelines. Um, and me personally, my union is sending me now, you know, hindsight's 2020. Now I'm going to Las Vegas in September to get my CWI through the American Welding Society. So when we talk about the quality of craftsmanship, I'm pretty sure it's pretty important that the hospital that's being built where you go to, that those welds are going to hold up. And th those are very accredited things that are only, well, I can't say only, are almost strictly done by unions. I'm not saying that there's no non-unions companies that have a American Welding Society and, and certified welders that have a CWI printed on, on a, a official piece of document. Um, but I would bet to say that the majority of unions do and the majority of non-unions don't. Um, Thank you, Mr. There, McDougal. Can I just say one more thing? Sure, let's wrap up. Very quickly. is um, You know, the way I see this PLA is is the people who are against it are, are really for the short-term financial gain. They want it to look good on the books. But like uh, Council Member Soria said, and I agree, this is a long-term catalyst to get people out of recidivism and to be a, a participating member of society in local Fresno. Short-term financial gain, long-term success for people. Thank you, sir. All right, next up is Mr. Chris Smith. Uh, Mr. Smith, you'll have two minutes. Oh, thank you, uh, uh, Council President uh, Chavez and, and members of the Council. Uh, my name is Chris Smith, and I'm here on behalf of the Associated General Contractors of California. We represent about 1,000 contractors across the state uh, and are heavily involved in policy discussions on project labor agreements and the negotiations of master labor agreements. And I'm here to speak in support of the city manager's recommendation to delay this project labor agreement as to allow for contractor feedback on several practical issues that uh, impact, impact both non-union and union contractors. Um, you know, we wanna help you put Fresno first. And unfortunately this project labor agreement as written does not work for the city of Fresno. We have submitted a letter to the city council and city manager's office outlining our concerns, but we joined the city manager uh, in his concerns on, you know, unlike the Fresno airport, this is a wraparound agreement. This covers all work over a million dollars uh, rather than project specific. Um, having this provision uh, uh, of, of a inclusive uh, project specific agreement would have made uh, given the city empowered to make sure that the agreement works for specific projects. There are also issues around immediate availability of desired workforce, both on the supplier side of offsite prefabrication, as well as the local workforce. Uh, this language also holds the city of Fresno contractors to the same standards as contractors in Los Angeles and the Bay Area without access to the resources of those same contractors. Uh, the core worker provisions don't incentivize local contractors or local workers, and there's a lack of a public uh, or a project offering. Public works and public infrastructure is directly related to public safety, and public owners need to move forward to continue to improve public infrastructure. Uh, and if you don't, you risk delaying or indefinitely postponing badly needed public infrastructure. So we acknowledge the city staff and the trades have worked to, on this agreement uh, to this point. Uh, we'd like to thank city manager Tommy Escueda and public works director Scott Mosier for their outreach on this effort. Um, and we'd like to highlight that the contractor is the one held to the terms of this agreement and it's the contractor who is responsible to deliver the projects. So on behalf of AGC and our contractor members, we thank the city for its time on working on this agreement, but we look forward to continuing this conversation uh, and getting this right. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Next up is Mr. Clint uh, Olivier. Mr. Olivier, you'll have two minutes. Thank you, Council President Chavez, members of the City Council. My name is Clint Olivier. I'm the CEO of the Business Federation of the Central Valley, a coalition of businesses and associations 
representing 30,000 separate businesses and 400,000 workers and their families here in the Central Valley. And back in January, I spoke to you to encourage council to work with the administration, as well as our partners in collective bargaining, non-represented contractors and unrepresented workers to find a compromise and allow Fresno to have a fair labor project, project labor agreement that would provide equal opportunity for unrepresented contractors and their workers, uh, and that it wouldn't be a one size fits all uh, for unrepresented workers and their apprentices and trainees uh, from being able to play a part in the building of our community. Uh, thank you for your continued openness to include them all in all projects and under all circumstances. However, members of the council, uh, BizFed Board of Directors respectfully asks that even at this late hour, some kind of more inclusive and less onerous way forward can be found from this dais. Without that inclusiveness, the Board of Directors is opposed to the item in its current form, and we urge a postponement on today's vote so everyone can get back to the table to work to make it better and make it work for all Fresnans. Thank you, President Chavez and members of the council. Thank you, Mr. Olivier. Next up is Mr. Nestor Cano. Uh, Mr. Cano, you'll have two minutes, sir. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, sir. Okay, uh, so my name is Nestor Cano. I'm a resident of the city of Fresno and a member of Local 246. I feel happy to mention that the institution has changed my life completely. The previous statement is proven by the multiple benefits I have acquired since I became a union member. For instance, the institution has allowed me to evolve as a plumber throughout my apprenticeship. I have participated in multiple projects of significant matter, which has gained me knowledge and experience. School is, is a vital aspect of life. Therefore, the union has also delivered outstanding semesters of school that without a doubt, is in, it has increased my awareness of functionalities of things. Likewise, the association has promoted high, higher wages and better benefits. This is crucial to me and my family's stability. The institution has also protected me against many threats that appear in the working environment, such as wrongful term terminations and discrimination. To mention a couple. Before the union, I used to work for a non-union employer, and it was real difficult for me to evolve as a worker and as a person. I had to work for two employers simultaneously in order to survive as an independent person. I was working seven days a week during the weekends. I only had about 3.5 hours of sleep. It was becoming a problem. The lack of sleep, limitation, and stress were my biggest challenges until I did some research and decided to join the local 246. When I was able to get in, my life changed completely. Personally, I was able to increase my knowledge, income, and stability. As a result, I'm completely in favor of the PLA because it supports the most valuable aspects of people like myself. Thanks. Thank you. Next up is Mr. John Henry Lopez. Uh, Mr. Lopez, you'll have two minutes. Sir. Hello, Council. Thank you, Council President. Uh, my name is John Henry Lopez. I'm a 32-year, uh, uh, I've been a resident of Fresno for 32 years. I've come through a union apprenticeship. I'm now a journeyman. Um, being in and still living in the city of Fresno, being a uh, graduate of a union apprenticeship has afforded me a great opportunities for me and my family. I've been able to afford to be able to buy a home here in the city of Fresno. I've also been able to put two kids through college. Um, without that, I don't think I would have been able to. I also been able to, you know, a, you know, provide for my family with a lot of good health care benefits and also have worked towards um, gaining a good pension for my retirement. Um, I am stand and rise in favor of this PLA. I think it's a good thing and I think it creates a great pipeline and creates more opportunities for more people that have come from the same background as me to get into, a, you know, a, a good apprenticeships and be able to provide for their families. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Lopez. Next up is Mr. Richard Markison. Mr. Markison, you'll have two minutes. Uh, good uh, afternoon, President Chavez and members of the council. Uh, Richard Markison for the Western Electrical Contractors Association. Uh, a, a couple of things uh, that uh, occurred to me uh, listening to some of the other testimony today was uh, Mr. Rojas asked, uh, where is the commitment of the uh, merit shop contractors 
uh, to the city of Fresno, and, and I wanted to explain what WECA's commitment was. Um, WECA recently opened a 12,000 square foot training facility, uh, facility in Northwest uh, Fresno in uh, council members Carbasi's district. Uh, and although the grand opening is not until October, uh, they already have 89 apprentices, uh, none of whom will be able to be employed on uh, city projects covered by the PLA. Uh, Mr. Arias, you did not uh, uh, answer that question, council member Arias. Uh, they will not be able to work on city projects because they are excluded. They cannot be included as a core workforce. Uh, they are an apprentice uh, indentured in a state approved program, uh, but it is a non-union program. And let me give you a little information about uh, who those uh, 89 apprentices are. 43% uh, of them live in the city of Fresno. 36% uh, of them are Hispanic. 17% of them are uh, API and 6% of them are um, African-American. 45% of them are in their first or second year of a five-year apprenticeship. All of these apprentices are being paid a prevailing wage. Uh, they receive medical benefits for themselves and their family, and they are receiving a pension contribution. Uh, the, the, one of the other uh, uh, speakers today uh, asked about, well, where is the uh, commitment that the merit shop uh, contractors and associations uh, were just making short-term considerations? Uh, WICA has been in uh, the state of California since 1939 and have been training apprentices uh, for over 20 years. Uh, the contractors uh, who decided to locate in uh, Council Member Carbasi's district uh, wanted to serve the contracting community and the apprentices in the Central Valley. Uh, so with their own money, uh, without a project labor agreement or any uh, guarantee from the city of Fresno, uh, located in the community are committed to workforce development and to training uh, the future electricians of the industry. This is a poke in the eye of uh, uh, groups like WICA who are investing in the community because you are discriminating against all of the apprentices uh, by the nature of adopting a project labor agreement that precludes them from working on city projects. Uh, and I'm really disappointed if this is going to be the outcome of the uh, vote today. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Mr. Marcus. And next up is Mr. Pablo Villagrana. Mr. Villagrana, you'll have two minutes, sir. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes, sir, go ahead. My name is Pablo Villagrana, born and raised in Fresno, California. For the first 20 years of my life, I lived with my mom and three brothers in one bedroom apartment on Poplar Street in between Divisadero and Belmont. I attended Low Elementary, Tapity Middle School and graduated from Fresno High. Living in that area in the 90s was a, ch a challenge trying to avoid using drugs, selling drugs, joining a gang, and trying not to get killed by the gang fights in our neighborhood was tough. I joined the Union Iron Workers Local 155 Apprenticeship Program when I was 20 years old, and it changed my life. The program trained me to tie rebar, weld, rig, communicate, be on time to work every day, and much more, but most importantly, to work safe so we can all come home safe to our family. I've been a union iron worker for 16 years, and in those 16 years, earning a livable wage and great benefits allowed me to help my mom buy her first home. Buy my first home in, in a better area in Fresno to raise my kids, so my kids don't have to go to, for my kids don't have to worry about things I did growing up. They can focus on school so they can get good grades and go to college or trade school. So today I hope the city council approves the citywide PLA so good paying jobs can be created and give people in our community the same opportunity to change their lives like I have. So thank you guys. Thank you, Mr. Villarana. Next up is Mr. Alfredo, uh, just J. Uh, Mr. Alfredo J, you'll have two minutes, sir. Yes, can you guys hear me? Yes, go ahead, sir. Okay. Um, my name is Alfredo Jimenez. Uh, I was born and raised here in Fresno, California. Um, through Growing up, uh, my mom worked a minimum wage job. She was a mother of nine kids. Um, I worked there while well, we lived in poverty, so I was bouncing you know, from house to house. I went to a lot of different schools. Um, so life growing up was kind of rough. Um, I graduated from Central High School. 
um, while I was in high school as a, as a senior, uh, I had to start working. I worked at McDonald's with my first paying job, $7 an hour. Uh, I had to help her pay rent, um, you know, stuff around the house. Uh, after I got out of uh, high school, I, I worked a non-union roofing company making $12 an hour. Not working here locally, uh, was going um, traveling. Um, in 2016 is when I joined the Iron Worker Local 155 Union. Uh, definitely changed um, my perspective on life. I was living comfortably. I, I got a livable wage. Um, I was able to move my mom out, help her get some furniture, help her get a car. Um, and not only that, I just didn't start a, a job, you know, from going job to job. I started a career and also not being in debt because, you know, my mom didn't have the money to put me through school. So um, with the apprenticeship, um, you know, you get paid as, as you get your hours and you develop your skills, the better you are, you know, the, the, this is a long-term success. It's not, um, money right then and there. It's money in the long run, great benefits, great pension. Um, I'm on track to buy a home. Uh, the PLA would also give, uh, the opportunity to others like myself, um, you know, that lived in that poverty line, uh, to make a livable wage and start a career, not just a job. Uh, I'll be turning out as a journeyman September 10th, uh, this month actually. And I hope the city approves of this PLA to help others uh, get the same opportunity that I was, that I was presented. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Alfredo. Next up is Mr. Joseph Garcia. Mr. Garcia, you'll have two minutes. Uh, thank you, council. Again, good afternoon. Uh, as you know, my name is Joe Garcia. Uh, I'm the president of J.I. Garcia Construction Incorporated, located here in Fresno, specifically within District 7. Uh, for many reasons, I have made a commitment to locate my business within an underserved area of Fresno. And I've also committed to employing 35% 35, 35 of my workforce uh, from underserved areas within our community. Uh, I have a comprehensive understanding of PLAs. I don't support them on any level. Uh, this PLA has been advertised as an avenue to assist employment opportunity to the underserved community of Fresno, yet it pretty much exempts uh, my people and me from participating uh, basically on principle. Uh, the prevailing wage allows me to pay my uh, employees. Uh, basically, as Mr. Rojas said, union scale. Um, I'm not going to argue as to why it's union scale, but it's union scale. And so therefore, what I can provide for my employees over and above the unions is that I have the flexibility of providing their benefits at a uh, very competitive cost. And the balance of the, the benefit portion of the prevailing wage goes into their pocket. And with this project labor agreement, what you're doing is you're asking me to bid your project, subject my employees to the terms of a project labor agreement, and then take the money that they've earned and send it to the union trust funds and uh, and not the and not the employees. And I just on matter of principle cannot subject my employees to that. Um, if it's the desire of the, of the council to support the union exclusive agreement, um, I ask that they add the language that exempts local contractors, city contractors, people that pay their taxes within the city of Fresno and their employees to uh, be exempt from this project labor agreement. and. Uh, sounds self-serving, uh, and it's unfortunate that I have to ask this way, but I'd prefer that you just don't uh, have a project labor agreement altogether. But if you're going to, it makes absolutely no sense to basically exclude those people that have their businesses that have committed time, energy, and money to this community that does serve the underserved of, of our community, and you basically exempt us from being able to partic participate. Uh, the other two issues I'd like to bring up is it's- You could it's, wrap up, Mr. Garcia. Okay, it's great that there's a lot of union people that are that are chiming in. I support them, absolutely no doubt, but they also have to understand without a project labor agreement, they can still work on city projects. With a project labor agreement, open shop really can't. And so I don't think that there's a fairness in that. Last comment, very last comment. When we're talking about one to five, never was it ever mentioned one time that when you get your one employee from the union, that they're going to be guaranteed to be a city resident. If this thing is all about employing city residents, where's the language and the penalties in the PLA if you do not adhere to the requirements of city residents? 
it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist because this is not for that purpose. It's for the purpose of basically giving exclusivity to the unions. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. Next up is Mr. Danny Wright. Uh, Mr. Wright, you'll have two minutes, sir. Good afternoon, Council. Uh, my name is Danny Wright. I'm a 34 year member uh, of Plumbers Union Local 246. Uh, currently, I am the business manager, but uh, I will always be a plumber. Um, Local 246 was established in 1901. We're 120 years old. We've built pretty much everything south of Ashland. Um, Local 246, we train in plumbing, fitting, welding, HVAC, and we invest in ourselves. The UA in a whole uh, invests approximately $200 million a year in training every hour that our members work our contractor invests back into our local training center which is right here in fresno we currently run about 110 apprentices um, the big the the big one is hvac apprentices those are very difficult uh, to change to train uh, we have approximately 40 hvac apprentices working for local contractors We've participated in pre-apprenticeship programs uh, with the Workforce Investment Board and Building Trades, brought those members into, or those uh, uh, applicants into our apprenticeship program, and it changes people's lives, giving them an opportunity that I was afforded 34 years ago when uh, one of my friend's dad told me about the Plumbers Union. I came out and I worked as a gopher, I dug ditches, I took the apprenticeship test, I got into the program. You no longer have to know somebody here. This is an open program, open to everybody. And I can tell you without a doubt, we are the best training that anybody will find when it comes to building trades. We train approximately 95% of net med gas installers in the Valley. So when you talk about, we have uh, four hospitals in our area all of those have strict certification. You don't want to be laying on a table and breathing in copper dust. Those are the, we train high quality people for high quality jobs. And um, I support this CWA. Um, also, I just forgot to mention that we offer continuing education for our journey. So unions aren't greedy. They provide a good living for the average Joe. And I was the average Joe. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wright. Next up is uh, Samuel. Uh, Samuel, you'll have two minutes. Hello, Fresno City Council Board. I've been married for 25 years and also am a uh, Clovis West graduate. I am blessed that my family was raised in Fresno. My son is just recently a Fresno State graduate. My daughter is following in his footsteps. That is what I call the positive Fresno way of life. In 2018, I also participated in a building trade pre-apprenticeship program. I was blessed and graduated with honors and was offered with passing the test to qualify as becoming a local 246 apprenticeship um, apprentice. I am currently trying to become a journeyman our union provides a great way of life, competitive wages for our craftsmanship, a pension program when we retire, a 401 program to provide wages for expenses after we leave our union, but our medical allowed my family to stay healthy. My wife is a leukemia survivor. Without this, I don't believe I would not be married at this time. I am a proud apprentice of our Fresno UA Local 246 Union. As I work to become a journeyman, I will enter a union with 120 years of plumbing craftsmanship. My fellow brothers and sisters of our unions have one thing in common. We strive to show our best workmanship daily so our family and friends prosper and live safely in our city of Fresno. Thank I you. understand that we 
do get prevailing wages from public and private jobs. That is why I support this P project labor agreement, and I hope that you will also. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Samuel. Our last speaker is uh, Ms. Jolene Kramer. Uh, Ms. Kramer, you'll have two minutes. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council President, and members of the City Council. My name is Jolene Kramer, and I represent the Building Trades Council and its affiliated local unions, which represent thousands of construction workers in the Fresno area. As you all know, so many workers in the Central Valley have commutes to jobs that are hours away, taking them far from their families and contributing to road congestion and air pollution, not to mention adding stress to their lives. One of our main priorities is to keep local construction workers close to home by providing opportunities to work on local prevailing wage projects. The community workforce agreement you are considering tonight is a tool to achieve that and so much more. And we appreciate the opportunity to partner with the city on such an important policy for working people in Fresno. This building trades council cares deeply about the residents of Fresno. They have an exemplary lo local construction readiness program that is singularly focused on providing opportunities to local residents who deserve a path to a secure and stable future with a family sustaining income, high quality health care, and dignity in retirement. This is what the union building trades stand for, and we are excited about working with the city to expand such opportunities and put more local residents to work on city construction projects. Community workforce agreements are also an efficiency tool for public projects. They promote the use of high quality contractors and highly skilled construction workers. They also promote the completion of public projects on time and under budget. We feel confident the city will see these outcomes as well. I wanna thank the city's negotiating team for its professionalism and candor. In particular, I'd like to thank the council members and members of the mayor's staff who participated in our discussions, the director of public works, Scott Mosier and his staff, and city attorney Brandon Collette, all of whom were very knowledgeable and professional. I'd also like to thank John Holtzman and Julian Gross from your outside council's office, with whom I have negotiated other agreements and who fostered a productive and smooth working relationship. I truly believe we reached a model agreement with give and take on both sides that prioritizes the best interests of working people in Fresno, particularly those who have historically faced barriers to full-time employment. Thank you again for your time and consideration of the Community Workforce Agreement, and I'll be available for the re remainder of this agenda item should you have any questions for me. Thank you. All right, C City Clerk, we have, we had, I had one last speaker, uh, Debbie Hunsaker. Is she on? Cue, cue her up. She's been waiting. Ms. Debbie? Uh, i here. <laughs> go ahead, ma'am. Thank you, Council President Chavez. Um, I was, I, this is my first Zoom talking, so I wasn't sure which way to do it. So I appreciate the time and I'll be brief. Um, I'd like to say thank you for allowing me to speak this afternoon on this issue. Um, and I, to the council members, the mayor, city manager, and all the others that worked so hard on this proposal. My name is Debbie Hunsaker and I'm a local business owner who just celebrated 50 years of business in the city of Fresno. And I'm also the current chair of the Fresno Chamber of Commerce Government Affairs Council. And um, I believe you received from our CEO, Scott Miller, a letter sharing um, our opposition to the, to the proposed policy. Uh, I agree with the others who support an exemption for the contractors who already do business in the city of Fresno, but I'm actually here to speak for the smaller contractors as in most of these projects, they would be, be considered a subcontractor, but will be held in the same to the same terms and conditions as the prime who qualifies for the 1 million or higher project value. In some cases, the portion of work that they would perform is less than $10,000. It's easy to see that these hours work would not be enough to qualify for the benefits that the agreement as written would require to be paid on the worker's behalf. The smaller contractors who won't have a dollar value high enough to warrant all the extra hoops, requirements, costs, liability, insurance, bonding, and more, that would make it, it would make it more cost effective to not continue to work on City of Fresno projects. I don't think that's what the intention is here. I think it's to help the City of Fresno and the businesses and the workers be better. Um, and so I think that's a piece that, that didn't get taken into consideration that really concerns me. As far as the apprentice uh, training, I get that, I'm all for that. 
We spend a lot of time and energy training our workers because safety is our business. And I truly believe 99.9% .9 of our local construction community feel the same way as I do. Uh, my concern is that the agreement should not be a one size fits all because we're not the same. And, and I'm concerned that that wasn't part of how this policy was put together. Uh, earlier, Tommy talked about where the money goes um, on the prevailing wage versus union wage. And that's another concern I have for, especially for the smaller uh, construction community. If the workers don't work enough hours, they don't get to take advantage of the benefits that are being paid on their behalf. So for a non-union contractor, they would, in good conscience anyway, continue paying their own private uh, benefit policy and retirement. So these these valuable people don't lose um, the coverage that everybody you know deserves to have. If you're a big enough contractor, it doesn't matter. A lot of them on the bigger projects work five days a week, eight hours a day. But in some trades, mine for instance, we may work a total of two, three hours a day. You can see already where there's no way my guys would qualify for, for the benefits. So I would continue to pay the private benefits, which now it throws me out of the being competitive market. So uh, that's why I respectfully request this at least be postponed till the next meeting, which I believe is September 16th, and that a community workshop be held to hear some of these things because I don't know that they were talked about in the conversations that you uh, had throughout the last six months. So I thank you for your time and consideration for allowing me to share my thoughts about this um, because they're real and they do affect businesses that are here now and have people employed here now. And um, I thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hansenker. All right, that concludes our public comment. I will now close that portion of the meeting and bring it back to the dais. Um, I think I have any, but oh, Councilmember Soria. Oh, you're speaking, right? Sec a second round. Go ahead. No, I'm just going to clarify the motion. Yeah, go ahead. So, um, just for the record, um, and you know, I know that it's been quite some time since we made the motion, but the motion is to approve um, the PLA, and there is a commitment that within 90 days. Um, a group of us from the council um, will be working with the administration to craft a complementary policy that puts specifically city of Fresno businesses um, first who are focused in really hiring Fresno residents and invest in them. And so that's the goal of the complementary policy that we will bring in the next 90 days. All right. Did we get that for the record, uh, city clerk and the city attorney? Councilwoman Soria. Can, right can we get clarification? Yep, Councilwoman Soria. Would would that incorporate our our hope that we the local contracts would be excluded from the PLA? Um, I can't commit to the specifics right now. I think that we have to figure out and craft a policy that will. Um, but you'd be open be, to having that discussion about. Well, I've been opening to hearing. I don't know if I will support a complete exemption. I think that there is an opportunity for us to strengthen our Fresno local hire policy, because right now it's 25 mile radius. So I think even if we Council shrink woman. it to the city of Fresno, then that's Hold what on, we Council should woman. do. I, if I may, I just wanted to just, in yesterday's meeting with the mayor, we made a, a commitment that we would work with him on a companion policy on local businesses, but that that policy would have to stand on its own and be considered on its own merits, because we can't commit to any details that we haven't even evaluated, but um, he committed to doing that work with your, your folks and investing that time. So we could get to a possibility of excluding local contractors from the PLA. I, I just, that. Yeah, that, that, that's a fair question. Yeah, City manager's I, asking a very direct question. I think the committee yeah. can answer that right now. I think that our response to the mayor has been, every, anything's on the table, um, but we can't commit to uh, a future vote. We need to see uh, um, the contents of what the staff proposes and what's jointly developed with the council and the administration. But could you clarify, uh, you're, you're making this a part so of- So my motion is just saying that there's going to be a commitment within 90 days. I'm working, even if the administration doesn't want to support the policy that I will bring forward, because I've been talking about this with Julian from um, 
our outside attorney, and then Brandon, our local preference policy right now says 25 mile radius. So someone could be from Visalia or Madera. I want to focus and make sure that city of Fresno businesses get local preference. We're, we're talking about there's beyond the PLA, there's still about 85% of projects that people can also get without a PLA. And so that's what I'm trying to do. Tell me. Do, so yeah, that, is, yeah. that is my goal. It may be differ from what, you're, what you want, so that's my intent, and that's what, I'm, that's what this motion is about. Yeah, well, when we started the initial discussions about the PLA, local hire, that's what I had mentioned to the group, was that my experience, both coasts, big cities, bigger than Fresno, when they want to go for a local hire initiative, uh, targeted hiring, local hiring, that's how they do it with what, my, with what Esmeralda is proposing, is that you do actually an intentional program for local business support, and you work with them to um, engage and be more involved in not a PLA. You can do it without a PLA, and that's what we were. That's what we had originally proposed when we started. But I'm doing it as far. a compliment. I'm not saying that it's not. It's going to exclude the PLA. The PLA is going to be voted on today. This is going to be a complementary policy, and that's that's so, what it is going to be. So, you, Councilman Bradfield, if I may, yes, go um, throughout the process of you know us deliberating this item, we identified that there was a gap in um, the fact that our local preference policy is dated. It currently says 25 miles within the city um, and that we wanted to revisit that and make sure that local businesses also have a much better local preference policy. But we acknowledge that that's a lot of work and we didn't have time to complete it all in this process. So we wanted to commit to the administration that we still want to pursue that and we want to do that. That will require a few months, I'm assuming, of work to, you know, to compile, and then we would bring that back within. Now, keep in mind, this PLA doesn't go into effect until 120 days, because that's how much time legal staff needs to develop the administrative regulations, the application documents, all the, you know, behind the scenes stuff that needs to be done. So 120 days before it goes into effect, within 90 days, our hope that was that we would have something ready for the council to consider around local preference for businesses. So. Just to summarize, so again, to Councilmember Soria's point, about 85% of the public works projects wouldn't even apply to a PLA. So someone like Debbie Hunsecker, who lives in District 2, uh, she's a local company, local employees. There will be a pathway for these local employers to be able to get plenty of, with this new policy, Correct. have an actual advantage because they are based in Fresno Correct. to get contracts. Assuming we create draft a policy, a policy and adopt, adopt a policy. A policy Got which it. Is, Thank you. Yeah. All right, does that answer your question, city manager? Yeah, I yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll, put, we'll prepare a policy. We will like craft it however we need. Penalizing local contractors is not what I intend to do. And, and if in any way I can help local contractors be involved in local projects and they hire local people, I would love to do that. So that would be working that, with her. That, that's what I heard. I mean, I heard that that's the consensus that I heard up here on the dial. Hire right? businesses versus contractors. I just want to just, there's a distinction between. Well, and, you, and, and if we can summarize, and I just want to make sure, because I think I'm on the same page as you, I just want to be clear on what we're, we're talking about. We're talking about, like my colleague just mentioned, right now the, the local definition is 25 miles out. We want to hone in on the city of Fresno around that umbrella and then look at how do we give a preference to a city of Fresno business contractor. That's what I'm hearing. Yep. Right? And We're Council all... President, it will also include addressing the issues that we've heard for years, the bonding requirements, insurance, insurance requirements, the liability. Essentially, we want you to go beyond a physical red carpet and actually figure out the you know, nuts and bolts on how to get local small businesses to do more business with the city of Fresno. Yeah, okay. City attorney, you were punched up. Did we, did we uh, stray, stray from the lanes? Are you trying well, to reroute us back? At minimum, we want to be clear since this is important. So the motion is to approve the resolution and the PLA as written with additional direction. Is that correct? That's correct. That, that, that's consensus, right? All right. Uh, Councilman Butterfield, did that answer your question on, on that? All right. Um, I, everybody spoke. I, I wanted to go last uh, just because I was hoping to get everything out in the open. Um, you know, and I, and I hate to go back to my uh, fallback line, but I, I've been in this building now 10 years. 
And I can tell you that having been on the Fresno Unified School Board uh, and in the city, uh, I've seen a lot of contracts uh, come and go. I've seen a lot of projects come and go. And I've heard all sides uh, when you talk about whether it's a PLA, it's a non-PLA. I can tell you when we were not doing PLAs, there was a slew of change orders. There were projects that were under bid that then came back for more money. Uh, so no system is perfect is the point that I'm, I'm, I'm making with this, right? We know that whatever the, the, the agreement is, the management of that agreement is going to be key, right? We got to hold, hold folks um, uh, accountable. Um, I, I read the agreement, and, and I can tell you, I just want to go through because I think we're talking about a lot of different moving parts here, right? Are, are we making the argument that if we do a PLA or a non-PLA, it's going to be cheaper, it's going to be, you know, best bang for the buck? That's one component. I heard you loud and clear, city manager, on, on that end. Um, I'm also looking at the workforce development piece of this, right? We want to have our folks that, that are going to work, that are actually having that certainty of having a job for three, five years, because I'm not interested in just creating jobs. I've said this before, I want to actually have a career path. Like we want those folks to learn the trades, whether it's you know electrical work, whether it's welding, uh, plumbing, carpentry, whatever that is. We know that that's going to benefit the city in the long term. And I think we have an opportunity with this tool, which is what I see this being. It's a tool, it's a workforce development tool that um, if we're being honest, yes, we are subsidizing this workforce development tool, right? We do that across the board. Uh, we have the Welfare to Work program. We have the program that the EDC runs that subsidizes, you know, 75 per, or 75 percent of the wage of, a, of an employee as they're getting on their feet and learning the, the training of that. So we have this model that we are now applying to the city of Fresno. But I think this is the, the, the big piece, and I think um, the representative, Mr. Rojas, spoke about this, where we're creating that, that pipeline. The, the part that I see here as very powerful and a powerful tool is that we're actually getting folks from Fresno Unified, from all the other school districts that can go directly from graduating from high school to an apprentice job. That to me is, is, is one of the big uh, you know, key concepts on really making me support this uh, item because I've seen what that does for the apprenticeship program, right? We want that. And I know you want that too, city manager. That's, that I, I know that you know, we're not talking about very different competing uh, you know, views. So it's a multi-prong uh, you know, uh, agreement that we're working through. And like my colleague said, we have 120 days to implement. It won't start till next year. So we have some opportunity to fine tune some language and get that. But I think what we wanted today is to get that certainty that the city of Fresno is committed to you know, implementing this workforce development tool, um, that we are gonna be you know, working with our partners, working with our school district, with State Center Community College, with all of our, our, our stakeholders and ensuring that the city of Fresno is driving this. My hope is that we can uh, have a model that can be replicated elsewhere, right? Whether that's in Fresno Unified, whether that's in the city of Madera or other places, because I think there's a lot of value in preparing folks for these jobs. Right now, what are we seeing? And you know, city manager Tom, we've had this conversation before. Everybody's busy. We're seeing projects come in, you know, 15, 20 percent uh, over the estimate because there's a lot of interest in folks wanting to get to work and, and building, you know, uh, the infrastructure bill that's coming. And, and you know, here at the city of Fresno, pretty soon, I think it's going to augment a lot of the work that we're doing. And so, to me, it's very simple. It's about putting people back to work. Um, does that come at a cost? Absolutely. Um, and I think for me, I I have that comfort level because of the dividends that it pays off. You train you know, an iron worker or a carpenter or an electrician, and they learned that trade, they now went from being a minimum wage earner to a six-figure earner, right, which helps them spend money in our city, buy a vehicle, buy a home, invest in our community, and quite frankly, return those coffer dollars to the city of Fresno. And so that's, I think that's what I'm rationalizing. We're investing, yes, we're, uh, you know, paying a little bit more, but to me, that is the value, and I think that language, um, and I think, what do we have, uh, Mr. Holtzman? I know you're uh, trying to stay awake uh, here, but just, just a couple more <laughs> just a couple more minutes. You've heard this before. Uh, what percentage did we have of the airport PLA that we had local folks working on that project? Do we know, was it 70, 80 percent, um, something like that? On the airport, actually, those numbers, I believe, uh, sorry. Mr. Riojas, do you have those numbers? Uh -huh. Okay. 
Um, as Is I it too far it, for you to I, walk I think, all the way? <laughs> I think the city manager has those numbers, actually. Uh, yeah, we put them in our we put them in our memo. You have the memo. They're in your memo. Yeah. It was it, it, it was it was seventy to eighty percent. I think is the number that I had heard uh, okay. from that. It was. Uh, let me give it to you here. It was. No, that's not it. Sorry. So the um, P airport PLA local area, fifty-two percent mm -hmm. within the city limits of the fifty-two fifty-two percent fifty-three percent thirty-one percent are from the city outside the local area forty-seven percent. And that's the 25 mile that we define as local. Currently, that's, we, the, that's how we kind of the, our standard is 25 mile. That's what Esmeralda that, that's Council what we're Member Soria. We got to dial that uh, on there. Dial okay. that back in. All right. So, so we're going through through those numbers, right? You got local folks that are working there. To me, that's the biggest uh, component of this. But the pipeline that we're working on, I think, will be a big uh, game changer uh, for this. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to support uh, this item today. I think it's the beginning of a conversation as we work through what the apprenticeship programs look like and how we augment that in the future because I think it has a lot of potential, uh, like I said, to be a workforce development tool. Um, just for clarification, I think it was Councilwoman Soria that made the motion and Vice President Esparza that seconded that. Uh, any opposition? Councilmember Luis. President, I just want to say for the record that we did agree to change. Councilmember Arias, I think a little while ago you said you just wanted to vote. Now you're punching back in? Change the name of the act. We did. We had to fight that in the, in the, in the record. All right. yeah. The act is the Randy Gann Project Labor Agreement. Okay. All right. Okay. So with that, any opposition? Who wants to register an opposition? I'm opposed. All right. One opposition. I'm sorry. Did you... Roll call? We, well, this, this is the roll call. The one lone vote is the, is the roll call. So for the record, it's a 6-1 so with Councilmember Bredefeld vote voting no. I don't think he had to do the roll call on that. All right, Council, that concludes our items for today. We still have closed session. Uh, closed session will be on Zoom. And City Attorney, if you could read that and then see if we'll have an announcement. Yeah, first of all, I would not expect any announcements afterwards. We have anticipated litigation Rios versus City. Also, potential litigation, City and Frank Water Authority, uh, existing litigation, Mahamadi and City of Fresno, uh, la all labor negotiation, including Unit 2, uh, public security, and then also real estate negotiation concerning the MLK Park. That's all.